Chapter One of the Ship of Ishtar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ship of Ishtar by Abraham Merritt. Chapter One The Block from Babylon. John Kenton stared down at the great block, vaguely puzzled, vaguely disturbed. Strange, he thought, yes, strange indeed, how all his unrest, his formless longings, his haunting unhappiness seemed to center upon it. It was as though the block drew them to it, like a magnet of stone. And was there subtle promise in that focusing? He stirred impatiently drew out again Forsyth's letter. It had come to him three days before, that message from the old archaeologist who, by means of Kenton's wealth, was sifting for its age-long lost secrets the dust of what had once been all-conquering Babylon. Eagerly had Kenton desired, eagerly had he planned, to go with that expedition. All his life the past had called to him. During all his years he had hearkened to its calling. He had wandered in the forgotten places, had slept upon the sites of forgotten civilizations, dead empires, vanished cities. In those years he had let love pass him by, had thrilled to ghostly romance rather than to living. Scholarly, half an ascetic, if he amassed no lore of the heart, he garnered another knowledge, vivid enough to make savants listen with respect when he spoke. But on the very eve of his sailing, America had entered into the World War, and Kenton had bade Forsyth go without him. He himself had gone into training for a commission. He had fought and been wounded in Belle Wood, had been invalided home. Hag-ridden by a great restlessness, thus he had returned. His attitude toward life, like thousands of others, profoundly changed. The world he knew had lost its zest. The one in which he could be happy he did not know where to find. He could not formulate even what it might be. The war had turned the present to quicksand beneath his feet. Worse, it had destroyed that bridge to the past over which his soul had been gay to tread. Yet something in Forsyth's letter had touched with life an interest he had believed dead, had evoked specter of that once familiar span between the then and the now. There was an echo within him as from some far, faint, summoning voice, bidding that old self of his to awaken to awaken and to beware. And with a certain grim wonder he had found himself awaiting with impatience the arrival of the thing the letter had promised. It had been cleared through the customs that afternoon, the block from Babylon. Alone, with an ever more eager curiosity, he had opened the crate that held it. Nested within that crate, among cotton strips and soft sheathings of reeds, had been the great stone block stone? Then why had it been so curiously light? Again that thought came to him as he stood there beside it. The long mirror at the end of the room reflected him as he mused. Slender, a little above the medium height, face dark and keen, suggestion of a hawk in it with a thin curved nose and clear blue eyes set widely apart, chin a bit pointed and cleft, and at the corners of the firm lips and deep within the clear eyes, a touch of bitterness and weary disillusionment, the hallmark of the war. Such was John Kenton as the long mirror showed him on the night dawn of his great adventure. He read once more the letter which Forsyth had written. I send you the block because it bears a record of Sargon of Akkad, one of the few ever discovered of that king. It is unusual in many ways. Frankly, I have not been able to discover its purpose. I send it to you to amuse you in your convalescence. With the leisure time at your disposal, you may be able to interpret what I, in the press of immediate work, cannot. In the inscriptions upon it, there is, over and over again, the name of Ishtar, Mother Goddess, Goddess of Love, Goddess of War and Wrath and Vengeance, as well. It is mostly in this last aspect of her that I read the symbols. The name of Nabu, the Babylonian god of wisdom, appears many times, 
but text and context are so mutilated that, beyond words that seem to carry a warning of some kind, the references to Nabu are undecipherable. The name of Nergal, god of the Assyrian underworld, appears frequently. But here, too, the text is too far gone to reconstruct, at least in the little time that I have. There are other names, Zarpanet, a woman's, Osolar, a man's. In the Babylonian pantheon, as you know, Zarpanet, or Sarpanet, was the wife of the god Bel Maradok, and a lesser form of Ishtar. But in the absence of certain characters, I believe that the Zarpanet referred to here was an actual woman, probably some priestess of the goddess. As the name of Asalar occurs always near the name of Nergal, he was probably a priest of that exceedingly grim deity. We found the block in the mound called Amran, just south of the Kwasar, or palace of Nebopolassar. There is evidence that the Armand Mound is the site of El Sagala, the ziggurat or terraced temple which was the home of the gods in Babylon. It must have been held in considerable reverence, for only so would it have been saved from the destruction of the city by Sennacherib and afterward have been placed in the rebuilt temple. Kenyon folded the letter, looked down again upon the block. Once more his eyes measured it, four feet long, and probably a trifle more, four feet high, and about three wide. A faded yellow, its centuries hung about it like a half-visible garment. Its surfaces were scarred and pitted. Originally they must have been smooth and polished as porcelain. Through the scratches and defacements the inscriptions ran, now submerged, now emerging, like bent straws in a frozen yellow pool. He ran a hand over it. The material mystified him. It was not stone, nor any of the baked clays of the age with which he was so familiar. It was some composite, unknown. Most was it like cement of ivory, sifted with dust of pearls, compact and finely grained, with tiny iridescent glints darting out of the wan yellows. Kenton began to study the inscriptions. Archaic cuneotic, these, most ancient. There were the symbols of Zarpanet and Alsalar. There were the arrowed symbols of Ishtar the Glorious, of the Dark Nagal, of Blue Nabu, the Giver of Wisdom. They were repeated many, many times, all of them. And always there was a persistent sign of warning, over and over again, and linked always with the name of Nabu. Curious, he thought, how baffling the inscriptions were. It was fanciful. Of course it was fanciful. Yet it was as though a veil lay between him and them, as though, just when he was on the brink of understanding, something reached out and muddied his mind. And now, Kenton became aware of a fragrance stealing about him, a fragrance vague and caressing, wistful and wandering, like entwined souls of flowers that had lost their way. Sweet was that fragrance, and alluring, wholly strange, and within it something that changed the rhythm of his life to its own alien pulse. He leaned over the block. The scented swirls drew round him, clinging like little hands, scented spirals of fragrance that supplicated, that pleaded, softly, passionately, pleaded for release. A wave of impatience swept him. He drew himself up. The fragrance was nothing but perfumes mixed with the substance of the block and now sending forth their breath through the heated room. What nonsense was this that he was dreaming? He struck the block sharply with a closed hand. The block answered the blow. It murmured. The murmuring grew louder. Louder still, with muffled bell tones like muted carillons of jade deep within. They grew stronger, more vibrant. The murmuring ceased. Now there were only the high, sweet chimings. Clearer and ever more clear they sounded, drawing closer, ringing up and on through endless tunnels of time. There was a sharp crackling. It splintered the chimings, shattered and stilled them. The block split. Pulsed from the break, a radiance as of rosy pearls, and throbbing in its wake came wave after wave of the fragrance, but no longer questing, no longer wistful nor supplicating, jubilant now, triumphant. Something was inside the block. 
something hidden there since Sargon of Akkad had reigned sixty centuries ago. Kenton started to ring for his servants, stopped jealously, for the radiance streaming from the block was more than that of Jewel. It was like the living breast of a goddess breaking through a shroud of stone. Let other than himself uncover what lay within? Behold it uncovered? No! He ran from the room, came swiftly back with tools to free whatever was that shining wonder which for sixty centuries had been entombed within the block. End of chapter 1 Recording by Todd Chapter 2 of the Ship of Ishtar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ship of Ishtar by Abraham Merritt. Chapter 2 The Freeing of the Ship. The substance of the block was singularly hard and dense. It resisted him. It seemed to fight against the steel. Bit by bit, he drilled and chiseled away the stubborn matrix, working along the edges of the crack through which streamed the prisoned radiance. Suddenly, the block shuddered like a living thing, rang out again that carillon of bells of jade. Sharply it pealed, then turned and fled back through the corridors of time. Fainter became the chiming, fainter still. It died and as it died, the block collapsed, disintegrated, became a swirling, slowly settling cloud of sparkling dust. Out of that cloud, the alien, unfamiliar fragrance swarmed, leaped on Kenton, clung to him. For another instant, the cloud swirled, a vortex of glittering mist. It vanished like a curtain plucked away. There, on the floor where the block had been, stood a ship, it was a jeweled craft of enchantment, such a bark as Jinn of Aladdin's day might have made for elfin princesses to sail in sorcelled seas. It floated high on a base of little lace-tipped waves, billowettes fragile and delicate, carved from turquoise, crested with milky rock crystals. Three feet in length from bow to stern, its hull, too, was of crystal, creamy and faintly luminous. Its prow was shaped like a slender scimitar, bent backwards. Under the incurved tip was a cabin whose seaward sides were formed, galleon fashion, by the upward thrust of port and starboard bows. Where the hull drew up to form this cabin, a faint flush warmed the cloudy crystal, deepened as the sides grew higher, gleamed at last with a rosy radiance that turned the cabin into a great jewel. In the center of the ship, taking up more than a third of its length, was a pit. Down to its rail edge from the bow sloped a deck of ivory, as fallow as the yellow of a rising moon upon a night in spring. But the deck that sloped from the stern was a jet black. Another cabin rested there, smaller than that on the bow, and squat and ebon. Both decks continued on each side of the pit in two wide platforms. At the exact center of the ship, and with an odd suggestion of contending force, the ivory and the black decks met. They did not fade into each other. They ended there abruptly, edge to edge, hostile. Up from the pit arose one tall mast, tapering, green as the carven core of some immense emerald. From its cross sticks, a wide sail of peacock irradiance stretched, ruffled as by a carbon breeze, shimmering like silk turned to opal. From mast and yards fell stays of twisted dull gold. Out of each side swept a single bank of seven great oars, their scarlet blades dipped deep within the white-crested azure of the waves. At the ship's bow hung golden chains, and at her stern swung chains of jet. And the jeweled craft was manned. Why, Kenton wondered, had he not seen the tiny figures before? It was as though they had arisen from the deck. One had just slipped out of the rosy cabin's door. An arm was still outstretched in its closing. It was a woman, and there were other woman shapes upon the ivory deck, three of them, crouching. Their heads were bent low. Two clasped harps, and a third held a double flute. Little figures, not more than two inches high. Toys. 
it was most odd that he could not distinguish their faces, nor the details of their dress. The toys were indistinct, blurred, as though a veil covered them, a veil like that which had so obscured the cuneiform inscription. He thought that the blurring might be the fault of his eyes. The freeing of the ship had not been easy, had demanded unwavering attention. His eyes might well be weary. Or perhaps it was that rose pearl radiance from the bow that dazzled him. Kenton looked down upon the clouded stern. His uneasy, groping perplexity deepened. The black deck had been empty. This he could have sworn. But now, four mannequins clustered there, close to the rail of the pit. He tried with all the strength in his fingers to lift one of them. He could not move it. It seemed part of the deck itself. Methodically, he tugged at each of the other toys, and with the same result. He stared into the pit. There were toys in there, too. Oarsmen, many of them. He counted two at each oar, one standing and one sitting, twenty-eight of them, and each in chains. A detail of the cabin to bow struck him. It was indeed astonishing, he thought again, how he kept missing these details, how, like the little figures, they seemed suddenly to strike into sight. There was a ledge halfway up the cabin. On it were dwarfed trees blossoming with hundreds of tiny jewels. Birds were nestling along the ledge, scores of them. There were other scores clustering in the gemmed branches. They were white birds with ruby bills and scarlet feet and shining ruby eyes. What were they? Why, they were doves, of course. The doves of Ishtar. And this? This? This was the ship of Ishtar. He caught himself up, wonder deepening. Whence had come that thought? What did he know of any ship of Ishtar? The haze around the toys was growing thicker. Certainly it must be that his eyes were tired. He would lie down a while and rest them. He walked to the door, assured himself that it was locked, turned. All the side of the room beyond the ship was hidden by swirling silver mists that, thickening swiftly, closed in even as he stared, unbelieving, upon the mystery he had freed. And as the mists touched it, enveloped it, the ship rocked and swayed, and swiftly as the thickening of those vapors began to grow, he glimpsed a movement upon the decks. The figures, the toys, were stirring. The oars were lifting, were sweeping through the waters. The gleaming hull shot up, carrying the moving shapes high above his vision. And now there was a shrilling as of armies of storm, a roaring as of myriads of tempests, a shrieking chaos as though down upon him swept the mighty torrent of the winds that raced between the stars. The room seemed to split into thousands of fragments, to dissolve. Kenton had one fleeting, incredible glimpse of the turreted skyline of New York, vanishing beneath the onrush of a vast blue rushing sea, whose gigantic foam-flecked combers were surging over it, were drowning it. For a heartbeat, towers and turrets stood sharp against the flood like a picture on a screen. Then they were gone. Down upon Kenton raced the azure, unbelievable ocean. Clear through the howling clamor came the chiming of a bell. One. Two. It was his clock ringing out the hour of six. The third note began, was stilled as though cut in twain. The solid floor on which he stood melted away. For an instant he felt himself suspended in space. In front of him loomed the bow of the ship. Its crescented prow leaped toward him, then dropped as though the ship slid down the valley of a wave. The shrieking, roaring voices of those tempests whose breath he heard but did not feel abruptly ceased to be. The crescented bow swept under him. A score of feet below him the ivory deck was flashing by. Kenton dropped. As though to meet him, the deck rose swiftly. He felt a numbing shock, a fierce pain through his head. Splintered lightnings veined a blackness that wiped out sight both of ship and sea. Then, only the blackness. End of chapter 2 Recording by Todd Chapter 3 of The Ship of Ishtar This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by David Nyhoff. 
The Ship of Ishtar by Abraham Merritt The First Adventure Kenton lay listening to a soft whispering, persistent, continuous. It was like the breaking crest of little waves. The sound was all about him, a rippling susurration growing steadily more insistent. A light beat through his closed lids. He felt motion beneath him, a gentle, cradling lift and fall. He opened his eyes. He was on a ship, on a narrow deck, his head against the bulwark. Before him was a mast, rising out of a pit. Inside the pit he caught a glimpse of men straining at great oars. The mast seemed to be of wood covered with translucent emerald lacquer. It stirred reluctant memories. Where had he seen such a mass before? His gaze crept up the shining shaft. There was a wide sail, a sail made of silk of opal and bellying in the breath of a scented breeze. Low overhead hung a sky that was all a soft mist of silver. Kenton heard a girl's voice, low and sweet. He sat up dizzily. At his right he saw a templed cabin nestling under the curved tip of a sickled prow. It gleamed rosily. A balcony ran all around it. Small trees blossomed on that balcony, while birds with feet and bills crimson as though dipped in wine of rubies flew and fluttered among the branches. And suddenly he remembered the block from Babylon, the ship of enchantment he had freed from it. Swift upon that memory came realization, staggering, incredible. He was on that ship, the ship of Istar. The girl's voice sounded again, was answered by a deep-toned golden other, in whose liquidity throaty notes was vibrant a debonair imperiousness. His gaze coursed along that trail of golden sound, leaped over the three women kneeling at its source. It fastened upon one face and hung there. Never had he beheld such a woman. Tall, with a lithe, flame slender she stood, staring beyond him. Her wide eyes beneath straight, daintily fine black brows were green as shoals of tropic seas, of depths of forest glens. Like sea and wood, they were filled with drifting, mysterious shadows. Her head was small, the features fine, the red mouth delicately amorous. In the hollow of her throat, a dimple lay, a chalice for kisses, empty of them and eager to be filled. Above her brows a silver crescent was set, slim as a newborn moon. Over each horn of the crescent poured a flood of red-gold hair, framing the lovely face, streaming down over high, bare breasts, falling in ringlets almost to sandaled feet. Pale pearls and rosy gems gleamed in those red-gold waves like jeweled drops of dew. Were she maid or woman, Kenton could not tell. As young as spring she seemed, yet wise as autumn, primavera of some archaic Botticelli, but Mona Lisa, too, if virginal in body, certainly not in soul. He followed her mocking gaze. It led him to the door of a black cabin where stood a man, taller by a head than Kenton, massively built. His pale gray eyes stared unweakingly upon the woman, somberly menacing impassively malignant. His face was beardless, pallid, heavy, and cruel. Despite his bulk, his pose was snake-like, and in the pale eyes serpent and wolf were mated. His huge and flattened head was shaven, his great nose vulture-beaked, and from his shoulders black robes fell, shrouding him to his feet. Behind him were three others with shaven heads. Two were as still as he and as deadly. Each of the twain held a brazen conch-shaped horn. On the third, Kenton's eyes lingered, fascinated. His pointed chin rested on a tall drum whose curved sides glistened with diamond skin of the royal python. He squatted, huge torso bare, knotted and gnarled, prodigiously powerful. His ape-like arms were wound around the barrel timbre, Spider-like were the long fingers standing on their tips on the drumhead, but it was the face that held Kenton. 
sardonic, malicious. There was in it none of that evil concentrate in the others. The wide slit of his mouth was frog-like. Humor was on the thin lips. His deep-set, twinkling black eyes dwelt upon the woman with frank admiration. From the lobes of his outstanding ears hung discs of jet. Kenton felt a quick glow of friendliness for the squatting incarnation of Sadar ugliness. The woman paced swiftly down toward Kenton. When she halted, he could have reached out a hand and touched her. Yet she did not seem to see him. Indeed, this was part of the strangeness of this first adventure upon the ship, that none heeded him, gave no hint of knowledge that he was there. Ho, Klaneth, she cried. Ho, worm of pestilence. I hear the voice of Ishtar. She is drawing near. Are you ready to do her homage, worm of Nurgle? A flicker of hate passed over the pallid face, like a little way from hell. The house of the goddess brims with light, Shireen. The man answered with a voice thick and dead, and in some way foul. But tell me, Temple Drab, does not my dread lord shadow thicken behind me? Now Kenton saw that from the rosy light a temple was pulsing, stronger and ever stronger like a waxing moon within a gigantic pearl, while down upon the black cabin gloom was gathering like a storm cloud. Yea, mocked the woman, the goddess comes, and your dark lord speeds to meet her. But why should that make you rejoice? For lo, she gives me clean strength ten thousandfold. And what are you, Claneth, but a drain through which pours that filth you worship as Nurgle? Now at this the two priests with the horns thrust themselves forward, gesturing, howling imprecations at the woman. The pale, cruel face of Claneth grew grayer still and writhed with hate. He raised clenched hands, and from his mouth, flecked with foam, came a dreadful hissing. A sudden wind smote the ship like an opened hand, healing it. From the doves burst a tumult of cries. They flew up like a little white cloud flecked with crimson. They fluttered around the woman. Three quick backward steps she took. The ape-like arms of the frog-mouthed drummer unwrapped, his spidery fingers poised over the head of the snake drum. The blackness deepened about him, hid him, cloaked all the ship's stern. Kenton felt vast presences seize the ship, felt the gathering of fearful, unknown forces. He slid down on his haunches, pressed himself against the bulwarks. From the ivory deck blared a golden trumpetine, defiant, inhuman. Kenton turned his head, and on it the hair lifted and prickled. Where the woman had been was now no woman. Resting on the rosy cabin was a great orb, an orb like the moon at full, but not like the moon, white and cold, an orb alive with pulsing rosetta cadences. Out over the ship it poured its living rosy rays, and, bathed in them, the woman loomed gigantic. The lids of the glorious eyes were closed, yet through those closed lids eyes glared. Plainly he saw them, Eyes hard as jade, white hot with wrath, glaring through the closed lids as though those lids had been gossamer. And the slender crescent upon the woman's brow was radiant now as the young moon itself, and all about it the masses of red-gold hair beat and tossed, streaming like rack of racing storms, swirling like silken pinions in whirlwind of war. Round and round the shining crescent whirled the cloud of the doves, Snowy wings beating, red beaks open, screaming. Out of the blackness roared the thunder of the serpent drum. Ai, ai, ai! From the moon-crowned shape came a cry like jubilant clamor of newly wakened winds of spring shouting over pine-crested billows of a thousand hills. Answering it, another roaring of the drum, sustained and menacing. The blackness thinned. A face stared out, half-failed, bodiless, floating in the shadow. It was the face of Claneth, 
and yet no more his face than that which challenged it was the woman, Shireen's. The pale eyes had become twin pools of white hell flames, pupilless. On his brow sat throned the ageless ultimate evil, for a heartbeat the face hovered, framed by darkness. Then the shadow dropped over it, hid it. Now Kenton saw that the shadow hung like a curtain at the line where the black deck met ivory deck, and that he lay upon the ladder hardly a yard distant from where that line cut the ship in twain. He saw, too, that the radiance from the orb struck against this curtain, and made upon it a great circle that was like a web of beams spun from the rays of a rosy moon, and that against the shining web the shadow pressed, striving to break through. And suddenly, from the black deck the thunder serpent drum redoubled. The brazen conchas shrieked. Drum thunder and shrieking horn blasts mingled and became one. The pulse of Abaddon, lair of the damned, throbbing in the voice of the abyss. They fed the shadow, strengthened it. They were the rhythm of its will. Blacker, denser now, the shadow thrust against the web of light. From Shireen's women, crouching low, shot storms of harpings, arpeggios, like gusts of tiny arrows, and with them pipings from the double flutes that flew like shrill, swift javelins. Arrows and javelins of sound cut through the thunder hammer of the drum, the bellow of the horns weakening them, beating them back. A movement began within the shadow. It seethed. It spawned. Over all the faces of the web-like disks of radiance, black shapes swarmed. Their bodies were like monstrous larvae, slug-shaped, faceless. They tore at the web with black talons, strove to thrust through it with hideous tentacles, flayed it with bat-like wings. The web gave. Its edge held firm, but slowly. Slowly the center was pushed back until the disk was like the half of a huge, hollow sphere. Within that hollow crawled and writhed and struck the monstrous shapes. From the hidden deck, drum and brazen horns roared triumph. Again rang the golden trumpet cry of the women. Out of the orb poised upon the cabin streamed an incandescence intolerable. The edges of the radiant web shot forward, curved, and closed upon the black spawn. Within it they milled and struggled like fish in a net. And like a net, lifted by some mighty hand, the closed web was swung up high above the ship with all its infernal burden. Its brightness grew to match that of the great orb, whose rays were now piercing the darkness at the stern, putting it to rout. Within it, the shapes of blackness squirmed, shrank, dissolved. From them came a faint, high-pitched, obscene wailing. They were gone. The globular net that had been the shining web opened. Out of it drifted a little cloud of ebon dust. The web hovered, streamed back to the orb that had sent it forth. Then, swiftly, the orb was gone. Gone, too, was the darkness that had shrouded the deck of Klanath. High above the ship, the doves of Ishtar wheeled in a vast ring, crying victory. A hand touched Kenton's shoulder. He looked up, straight into the shadowy eyes of the woman called Shireen. No goddess now, but only lovely, alluring woman, in whose eyes he read amazement, startled disbelief. He felt the delicious warmth of her, inhaled her fragrance. Kenton sprang to his feet. Too late he remembered the blow that had ended his fall upon the ship. A thrust of blinding pain shot through his head. The deck whirled around him. He tried to master the giddiness. He could not. Dizzily, the ship spun beneath his feet, and beyond, in wider arcs, spun turquoise sea and silver horizon. Now they formed a vortex, a maelstrom, down whose pit he was dropping, faster, ever faster. Around him was a formless blur. Again, he heard the tumult of the tempests, the shrillings of the winds of space. He abandoned himself to headlong, prodigious flight. The winds died away. He was standing, his flight over, on the solidity once more. He heard three clear bell notes. 
he opened tight closed eyes. Kenton stood within his own room. There, by the window, glimmered the jeweled ship. The bell he had heard had been his clock chiming the hour of six. Six o'clock. The last sound of his familiar world before the mystic sea had swept the world from under him and had been the third stroke of the same hour, clipped off in mid-note. Why then, all he had seen, all his adventure, must have happened in half a clock chime. Adventure? Had it been that, or only a dream? He lifted a hand and winced as it touched the throbbing bruise over his right temple. Well, that blow had been no dream. He stumbled over to the ship. He stared at it, incredulous. Then one by one he pulled at each of the mannequins, each toy, Immovable, gem hard, part of the deck itself, each seemed to be as each had been before. And yet, in half a clock chime, those toys had moved. New toys appeared. For now, the long armed beater of the serpent drum stood upright on the black deck, peering toward the platform at the right of the mast, one hand pointing, the other resting on the shoulder of a mannequin in glittering mail. Nor was there any woman at the rosy cabin's door, as there had been when he had loosed the mystery from the block. Clustered around the threshold were five slim girl toys with javelins in hand. And the woman was on the starboard platform, bent low beside the rail as though looking at someone lying there. Looking where he had crouched while over him had waged the battle between the radiant orb and the core of blackness and the ship's oars were no longer buried in the turquoise waves. They were lifted, poised for a downward stroke. End Chapter 3 Chapter 4 of The Ship of Ishtar This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ship of Ishtar by Abraham Merritt The Ship Returns Again, one by one, he went over them, each toy. His fingers lingered on the leaning woman, caressed her. No life was there, no warmth, no pulse. Gem hard, gem cold, exquisite. Only toys? Then why, as his hand rested on the silver crescent upon her brows, did some gladness well up from unknown depths within him, banishing his amaze? A hot new life swept like a roaring wave through every vein. What was it that shouted within him, exultant, telling him that his commerce with this ship of Ishtar had but begun? Abruptly he withdrew his hand, unhooked a silken hanging from the wall, and threw it over the shining bark. This done, he went to the bathroom and examined the bruise on his head. It was tender enough, but nothing serious. He might have fallen upon the floor of the room, he thought, as he touched it, overcome by those strange perfumes. But he knew he had not. An hour with cold compresses fairly removed all outward marks on it. At 7.30 he dined, and dined well. Wherever he was bound, he would be no worse for being well provisioned. That the ship would return for him, he never for an instant doubted. You needn't bother about me any more tonight, Jevons, he told his man. I've some writing to do. Some very important work. If anyone calls, tell them I'm away for the night. I'm going to lock myself in, and I don't want to be disturbed for anything less than Gabriel's trumpet. Jevons, a heritage from Kenton's father, smiled. All right, Master John, he answered. I'll not let anybody bother you. It's really important. Kenton rested a hand on the old man's shoulder. I think, probably, it will be, well, the most important work of my life. He ended whimsically. 
and with what spirit of prophecy he did not then dream. Trust me, Master John, said old Jevons. Kenton passed on to his bedroom entirely satisfied. He would have no interruptions now. Jevons would see to that. He caught a glimpse of himself in a mirror and paused. Hardly the costume this if he were going voyaging on the ship. He stripped, then rummaged among some costumes he had brought home with him years ago from Persia. He picked out a silken vest, a silken and embroidered tunic. He slipped his arms through them. A pair of wide pantaloons with a broad blue woven girdle. He put them on. He thrust his feet in a pair of curved Turkish slippers. His gaze fell upon an ancient cloak he had picked up in Mosul. It was very old, very beautiful. Untold centuries had softened its blue. Through its azure web and woof, great silvery serpents writhed, half-hidden, cabalistically entwined. He threw it over his shoulders, caught another glimpse of himself in the mirror, and stared, astonished. Could this be he? This youthful, adventurous sultan, whose keen dark face stared back at him? The blue and silver cloak made him seem taller than even his six feet warranted. There was a look of power about him, too. Curious how subtly it changed his face, his carriage. Could it be the cloak? The cloak. That reminded him there was a detail missing. The strange blade that had been wrapped in that same garment when he had bought it. He found the weapon, balanced it in his hand. An odd enough weapon this, in truth. Silvery serpents twined about its hilt. At the end of that hilt gleamed a single blue gem. Cabochon cut, not a sapphire, some jewel he did not know. Below the hilt was a strong rod of bronze, eight inches in length and round as a staff. This staff flattened out into a lean-shaped, razor-edged sword blade, two feet long and full six inches at its greatest width. A blade oddly like the asagays of the Zulus. He thrust it into his girdle, felt now that he was fully dressed for his part. He opened the bedroom door cautiously, listened, he slipped through and back to the room where the ship lay. Lifting its shroudings, he drew one deep breath of wonder at its beauty, then turned off the electrics. As his eyes accustomed themselves to the darkness, he caught a dim shimmering where the ship rested, faint reflections from the avenue's lights penetrating the window hangings. How silent the room had become. It was filling with silence as a vessel fills with water. Now a sound broke the stillness, the lapping of little waves, numerous, languorous caressing. He realized that his eyes were closed, strove with all his might to open them. The lapping of the waves came closer, by an effort, he half raised his lids. There was a wide mist opposite him, a globular mist of silver drifting down upon him, as though it were the curved breast of another world. An impacting world? No, an interpenetrating world. Fleeting, incredibly swift was that comprehension. In the infinitely small point of time it sparked through his mind, he knew it for revelation, explanation, the only key to the inexplicable. By light of that spark, Kenton saw the globe upon which he lived, 
not for what it seemed, but for what it is, an etheric vibration, an etheric vibration between the intervals of whose pulsing pulse the electrons of other interlaced worlds upon worlds, children of that primal force whose vibrations are matter in all the guises that we know and that we do not know. He visualized these worlds and his own conjuries of electrons, each in reality as wide apart as the planets from each other, as those same planets from the sun. He saw through the abysses of space between those specks myriads of similar conjuries grouped into unseen, unseeable worlds, each world spinning, whirling, yet untouching and untouched by any other. Interlaced, interlocked, interpenetrating, embracing worlds keyed to lower and to higher pitch than ours, and each in utter ignorance of the other embrace. Worlds moving through and about us, worlds registering no more upon each other than do the thousands of wireless messages upon the receiver untuned to receive them. Worlds interfering with each other no more than do the dozen messages that, freed from contact with each other by their varying scales of vibration, pass simultaneously over a single wire. On one of these interpenetrating worlds sailed this ship of Ishtar. The jeweled shape there was not the ship itself. It was the key that opened the door of Kenton's world into that of the ships the mechanism that attuned him to that other world's vibration. Swift came that revelation. Swiftly it fled. Through the silver mist the ship drifted upon him, its oars motionless, its sail but half-filled, wavelets crisped at its sickled bow, wavelets of palest blue with fine laced edges of white foam. Half his room was lost now in the ripples of that approaching sea. The part of his room on which he stood and watched seemed to be many feet above those waves. So far below were they that the deck of the ship was level with his feet. Closer drew the ship, and as it drifted lazily on, Kenton drew further back from the waves, rippling toward him as lazily. He wondered why he heard no rushing winds, nor clamoring tempests, no sound save the faint whispering of the lace-tipped waves. Now Kenton's back was against the wall of his room. Before him stretched the turquoise ocean, the ship seemingly not more than six feet away. Kenton leaped straight for the ship. Winds roared about him now, winds vast as those that swirl within the unfathomable abyss, the Norsemen called the Ganuga Gap, within whose wombs from mated fire and ice was born the giant whose skull was made the sky, and from whose flesh and bones were molded earth. The vast winds roared and howled about him, yet again he felt them not. Suddenly, the vast winds were still. His feet struck solid surface. Gasping, he opened his eyes. He stood upon the ivory deck, facing the rosy cabin with its blossoming little trees and its flocks of crimson-billed vermilion-footed doves. Between him and the cabin's door stood a girl, her soft brown eyes filled with awe and wonder and that same startled disbelief that he had seen in the shadow-filled eyes of Shireen when her gaze had fallen upon him at the foot of the emerald mast. Even through his whirling senses, he knew that this girl was lovely. Her red mouth was open like a surprised child. Her bluish-black hair hung in soft ringlets over her white shoulders. Silken folds of filmy green fluttered about her, revealing curves too full for maidenhood. 
yet her eyes were innocent and her voice almost childishly sweet as she spoke to him. Are you the Lord Nabu that you come thus out of the air, and in his cloak of wisdom, his serpents twining within it? she murmured. Nay, that cannot be, for Nabu is very old, and you are young. Are you his messenger? She dropped to her knees, crossed her hands, palms outward over her forehead. I am not the Lord Nabu, Kenton heard himself say, and vaguely he wondered how he could so clearly understand her speech, answer it so readily. Maybe I have been sent by him, I do not know. But the girl had leaped to her feet, sprung to the closed door of the rosy temple. Kadish too, she struck softly upon it. Holy One, my Lady Sharain, a message from our Lord Nabu. Kenton turned and looked behind him. His glance traveled over the pit of the oarsmen. They seemed asleep, bare bodies bent over their oars, their heads bowed. The golden bearded warrior had vanished from the black deck but the satyr priest of the serpent drum was there. Upon his ugly face was stamped stark and ludicrous amazement. The frog mouth lolled open. The little eyes protruded. One huge paw swung over the drum head, as though about to beat alarm. Kenton saw that the huge torso was balanced upon a pair of grotesquely bowed legs, short as the arms were long. Above the waist, the drummer was a giant. Below it, a dwarf. The black, deep-set eyes searched him. Then the corners of the slit mouth lifted. The face creased into a thousand wrinkles. The drummer had smiled at him. The hovering paw drew away from the drum head, waved a greeting, sardonic but reassuring, warning too for a long thumb thrust toward the black cabin. The door of the rosy cabin was flung open. On its lintel stood the crescented woman of the red-gold hair, the woman named Shireen. Her eyes were full of wonder and uncertain recognition within them, too. She looked beyond him to the drummer. He followed her glance. The drummer seemed to sleep. Watch, Satalu, she whispered to the girl. She caught Kenton's hand, drew him swiftly, softly within the rosy cabin, closed the door behind them. The cabin was surprisingly large, fragrant, filled with a rose-pearl light. Two girls were there who stared at him with eyes filled with wonder. One was fair-haired, blue-eyed, the second black-tressed, as the one without. The Lady Shireen dropped his hand, ran to them, thrust them toward the door. Out, she cried. Out, and watch with Sadalu, and gossip not together of this, lest Gigi awake and hear you, and the black worm be warned. The pair slipped from the cabin. Shireen flew to another door, opened it, Kenton caught a glimpse of another cabin, and in it other girls as lovely as those who had gone, and as startled as they. He saw javelins leaning against a wall, racks of arrows, great bows, short swords. Only a glimpse of these he had, for with one short whispered command, Shireen closed this door, locked it. She stood, regarding Kenton. She came close, looked deep into his eyes, measured his tall body. She stretched out slim fingers, with them touched his eyes, his mouth, his neck, as though to assure herself that he was real. At her touch, strange thrillings ran through him. Desire, swift and flaming, she cupped his hand in hers and bowed, and set her brows against his wrists. The waves of her hair bathed them. 
they were silken strands of nets to which his heart flew, like a bird eager to be trapped. He steadied himself. He drew his hands from hers roughly, braced himself against her lure. She lifted her head, regarded him. What has the Lord Nabu to say to me through his messenger? The mellow voice rocked Kenton with perilous sweetness, subtle provocations. Is the strife to end? What is your word to me, messenger? Surely will I listen, for in his wisdom has not the Lord of wisdom sent one to whom to listen is not difficult? There was a flash of coquetry in the misty eyes, turned for an instant to his, like the flirt of a roguish fan, still thrilling to her closeness, groping for some firm ground upon which to stand in this unfamiliar world, Kenton sought for words. Desperately, playing for time, he looked about the cabin space. End of Chapter 4 Read by Heather McKee Olympia September 16, 2022「It was sown with luminous gems, with pearls and pale moonstones, and curdled milky crystals. From seven crystal basins before it, seven little silver pale flames sprang. There was an alcove behind the altar, but the glare of the seven flames hid what might be within. Yet he had a swift sense of tenancy of that veiled alcove. Something dwelt within it, something living, but yes, that was it asleep. At the side was a low, wide divan of ivory inlaid with the milky crystals, patterned with golden arabesques. Silken tapestries fell from the walls, multicolored, flower-woven. Soft, deep silken rugs covered the cabin's floor, and piles of cushions. At right, at left, low windows opened. Through them streamed silver light. A bird flew upon the sill of one, a white bird with vermilion beak and feet and eyes of ruby. It scanned him. It preened itself. It cooed and flew away. A dove of Ishtar. Soft hands touched his. He gazed into the lovely face of the Lady Shireen, into eyes shadowed now with doubt. You are Naboo's messenger? she asked. In the hardened voice he read suspicion, a rising anger, no ghost of fear. Messenger, you must be. Her voice was very low, more as though her thought found tongue than that she spoke to him. Else, how could you board the ship? But messenger of Nabu, or messenger of... Her eyes suddenly blazed upon him. Nabu or Nergal. Lady of all loveliness, Kenton's tongue was loosed. It may be that I am a messenger. But how sent? By whom sent? It may be that I know no more than you. Except this, that it was never by command of the Lord of the Dead that I came. You do not know, she cried. And yet, if you came not from the Lord Nabu, why are you clad in his cloak? And why carry you his sword? Many, many times have I seen them both in his shrine at Uruk. I am weary of the ship, she whispered. I would see Uruk and Babylon again. Ah, dearly, dearly do I long for Babylon. Her voice deepened mournfully. A tiny chill ran through Kenton. 
Lady, he said, in one way at least I am a messenger of Nabu. As you say, he is the Lord of Truth. I will speak only truth to you. Yet before you learn more of me, this must you do. Tell me the story of the ship, how it came to sail upon this strange sea, and where have vanished the Lady Zarpanit and that Alusa whom she loved? She shrank to the edge of the divan, fear now in her eyes. All that you must know, she whispered. If you know of, of them, you must know all. I do not understand. Shireen, he said, it matters not at all whether you understand, nor whether your tale be twice told. I must hear it, and from you. After that, I will speak, and you shall listen. She looked at him doubtfully, searching the clear blue eyes bent steadily upon her. Then she sank back upon the divan and beckoned him beside her. She drew close, laid a hand lightly upon his breast. He felt his heart leap under the touch. She felt it too, and moved a little from him, smiling, watching him through downcast, curving lashes. She drew her slender, sandaled feet beneath her, sat musing for a space, white hands clasped between rounded knees, eyes filled with dream. When she spoke, her voice was low, her words half-intoned. The sin of Zarpanit, the tale of her sin against Ishtar, Ishtar the mighty, mother of the gods and of men, lady of the heavens and of earth, who loved her even as daughter. She paused, and Kenton had an eerie thought that what had lain sleeping behind the seven altar lights had wakened and was listening, was listening and watching him, weighing him, measuring him. He had a sense of peril, of trespass within forbidden places, of trembling balances in which rested his destiny. For a heartbeat, unearthly fear shook him. Shireen's soft shoulder touched him. Fear was forgotten in eyes' delight of her exquisiteness, the sweet sorceries of her. And as his fear fled, he knew that the beat of that pulse had swung the balance for him, that he had been measured. For good or for ill, he had been weighed by the hidden dweller in the candled shrine. High priestess of Ishtar, at her great house in Uruk, was Zarpanit. Shireen's eyes were veiled, her head bent. Kadishtu, holy one, was she, and I, Shireen, who came from Babylon, was next to her her priestess, loved by her as she was loved by Ishtar. Through Zarpanit, the goddess counseled and warned, rewarded and punished kings and men. In Zarpanit, the goddess became incorporate, dwelling in the house of her soul as in a temple, seeing through her eyes, speaking through her lips, so greatly did Ishtar love her. Now the temple in which we dwelt was named the House of the Seven Zones. In it was the Temple of Sin, God of Gods who dwells in the moon, of Shamash, his son, whose home is the sun, of Nabu, the Lord of Wisdom, of Ninib, the Lord of War, and of Nergal, the Dark One, the Hornless, ruler of the dead, and of Bel Marodach, the Mighty Lord. But most of all, it was the House of Ishtar, who, by her sufferance, let these others, all save Bel, who dwelt there of his own right, temple themselves within her holy home. From Kuthor in the north, from the temple there which dark Nergal ruled even as Ishtar ruled Uruk, came a priest to sit over the zone of Nergal in the house of the seven zones. His name was Alusar, and close as was Zarpanit to Ishtar, as close was he to the Lord of the Dead. Nergal made himself manifest through Alasar, spoke through him, and dwelt at times within him, even as did Ishtar within her priestess Zarpanit. With Alusar came a retinue of priests, and among them that black worm that spawned of Nergal's slime, Klaneth. And Klaneth was close to Alasar, as I to Zarpanit. She raised her head, and looked at him through narrowed eyes. 
I know you know, she cried. A little while ago you lay upon the ship and watched my strife with Claneth. Now I know you, although then you were not dressed as now, and you vanished as I looked upon you. Kenton smiled at her. You lay with frightened face, she said, and stared at me through fearful eyes, and fled. Renewed suspicion rippled through the words, but over Kenton a sudden hot anger swept. Your eyes lied to you then, he said. It was no fault of mine that I fled, I who returned as quickly as I could. Nor ever think again that my eyes will hold fear of you. He gripped her hand, drew her close. Look into them, he bade her. She looked, long, sighed and bent away, sighed once more and swayed towards him languorously. His arms flew around her. She thrust him away. Enough, she said. I read no hasty script in new eyes. Yet I retract. You were not fearful. You fled not. Let be. Wholly withdrawn, gaze turned from him. She brooded. Between Ishtar and Nergal, Shireen took up the interrupted tale, is and ever must be unending strife and hatred. For Ishtar is the bestower of life, and Nergal is the taker of life, the king of death. She is the lover of righteousness, and he is the father of evil. And how shall ever heaven and hell be linked, or life and death, or good and evil? Yet she, the voice deepened, Zarpanit, Kadishtu, the Holy One of Ishtar, her best beloved, did link all of these. Where she should have turned away, she looked with desire. Where she should have hated, she loved. Yea, the priestess of the Lady of the Heavens loved Alusar, priest of the Lord of Death. Her love was a strong flame in whose light she could see only him and him only. Had Zarpanit been the Lady Ishtar, she would have gone to the dwelling place of the lost for Alasar, even as did the goddess for her lover, Tammuz, to draw him forth or to dwell there with him. Yea, even to dwell with him there in the cold darkness where the dead creep feebly, calling with the weak voices of birds. In the cold of Nergal's abode, in the famine of Nergal's domain, in the blackness of his city where the deepest shade of earth would be a ray of sun, Zarpanit would have been happy, knowing that she was with Alasar. So greatly did she love. Was there a stirring behind the pale altar flames? He strove to see, turned his gaze back to the Lady Shireen. If there had been movement, she had not heeded it. I helped her in her love, for love of her, she whispered. But Claneth, the black worm, crawled ever behind Alusar, waiting for chance to betray and to creep into his place. Yet Alusar trusted him. There came a night. She paused. The eyes that had been soft, tear-filled, were shadowed with memoried fear. There came a night when Alusar had crept to Zarpanit within her chamber. His arms were about her, hers around his neck, their lips together. Claneth, I thought, watched at the outer door. I lay at the threshold of the inner, watching. Her eyes widened, her lips whitened, the whole lithe body quivered. And that night, down came the goddess Ishtar from her heavens to Zarpanit, entered and possessed her. And at that same instant, from his dark city, came Nergal and passed into Alasar. And in each other's arms, looking into each other's eyes, caught in the might of mortal love were heaven and hell, the soul of life and the soul of death. She shuddered and was silent, and long moments crept by before again she spoke. Straightway those two mortal lovers who clasped were torn from each other. We were buffeted as by hurricanes, blinded by lightnings, thrown broken to the walls. 
and when we knew consciousness once more, the priests and priestesses of the seven zones had us. All the sin was known. Yea, even though Ishtar and Nergal had not met that night, still would the sin of Zarpanit and Alusar have been known. For Claneth, whom we thought on guard, had betrayed them, and crawled away and had brought down upon us the pack. Let Claneth be cursed! Shireen raised arms high, and the pulse of her hate lifted Kenton's heart like a rushing wave. Let Claneth crawl, blind and undying, in the cold blackness of Nurgle's abode. But goddess Ishtar, wrathful Ishtar, give him to me first, that I may send him there as I would have him go. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of the Ship of Ishtar》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones.《The Ship of Ishtar》by Abraham Merritt. When the Gods Judged. Her tense arms dropped slowly. Her lovely face grew still. For a time, she said, we lay in darkness, Zarpanit and I together, and Alusar far away. Great had been the sin of those two, and in it I had shared. Not quickly was our punishment to be decided. I comforted her as best I might, loving her, caring naught for myself, for her heart was close to breaking knowing not what they were doing with him she loved. There fell another night when the priests came to us. They drew us from our cell and bore us in silence to the portal of the Du Azaga, the brilliant chamber, the council room of the gods. There stood other priests with Alusar. They opened the portal, fearfully, and they thrust us three in. Now indeed my spirit shrank and was afraid, wailing out within me, and beside me I felt the shuddering soul of Zarpanit. For the Du Azaga was filled with light, and in the places of the gods sat not their priests, but the gods themselves. Hidden each behind a sparkling cloud, the gods sat and watched us through their veils. In the place of Nergal was a fiery darkness. Through the blue shining mist before the shrine of Nabu came the voice of the Lord of Wisdom. So great is thy sin, O Zarpanit, and thine, O Alusar, it said, that it has troubled even us, the gods. Now what have ye to say before we punish? The voice of Nabu was cold and clear as the light of the far flung stars, passionless as the wind that streams between the worlds. Yet in it was understanding. And suddenly my love for Zarpanit soared up like a flame, and I held fast to it, and it gave me strength. And beside me I felt her soul stand erect, defiant, her love flinging itself around it like a flaming garment. She answered not, only held out her arms to Alisar. I looked at him, and his love too stood forth unafraid, even as hers. He sprang to her, clasped her in his arms. Their lips met, and the judging gods were forgotten. Then the god Nabu, peering out through his blue, shining mist, spoke again. These two bear a flame that even we may not destroy. At this the Lady Zarpanet drew from her lover's arms, came close to the pulsing glory that surrounded Ishtar, did homage, clear-eyed, unafraid, addressed her. You, O oh mother, are you not the mother of that fire we call love? Did you not create it and set it as a torch above chaos? And, having made it, did you not know how mighty was the thing you made? It was that love of which you are the mother, O holy Ishtar, that entered me, 
that came unsought into this temple of my body which was yours and still is yours, though you have abandoned it. Is it my sin that so strong was love that it opened the doors of your temple, that its light blinded me to all save him on whom it shone? You are the creator of love. Why made you it so mighty? And if love be grown stronger than you who made it, O Ishtar, can we, a woman and a man, be blamed that we could not conquer it? And if love be not stronger than you, still did you make it stronger than man. Therefore punish love, your child, O mother, not us. She ceased, and Alusar drew her to him, saying, Man may not accuse the gods who gave him being, yet the flame you made to forge on life's anvil gods and man is a strong flame, O mother Ishtar. Also, it comes to me who stands here to be judged that there is a justice which even the gods must heed, or in time cease to be. Now, in the name of that justice I speak, to that justice I appeal. I ask no mercy. If we have sinned, we must suffer. If you, O Ishtar, could destroy in Zarpanit that flame of love for me, wipe out all memory of me from her, I would pray that on me alone be set the burden of suffering. But that even you cannot do, and so each single arrow point of my agony would be ten score thrust in her. Nay, if we have sinned, we have sinned together, and together we must pay. And that, in the name of the eternal justice which rules even you, I demand, O Ishtar. It was the Lord Nabu who broke the silence of the gods. They who are to be judged, accuse, he said. And truth is in what they say. They carry a flame, I tell you, which even we may not destroy. The fire they bear is one whose ways, O Ishtar, you know better than do I. Also, it is you who are the accuser, and you who are the accused. Therefore, Ishtar, it is for you to speak. From the glory veiling the goddess a voice came, sweet but small with bitter anger. There is truth in what you say, Zarpanit, whom once I called daughter. Now, because of that truth, I will temper my anger. You have asked me whether love is stronger than Ishtar, its mother. We shall learn. This is your doom, that you and the man Alusar dwell in a certain place that shall be opened to you. Ever together shall you be, even as he has demanded. You shall look upon each other, yet never shall you touch hands or lips. You may speak each to the other, but not of this fire of love. For when that flame leaps and draws you together, then I, Ishtar, will come to you, Zarpanit, and fight with love. It will not be the Ishtar you have known who shall come, nay, that sister self of mine whom men call the destroyer, the wrathful, she shall possess you. And so it shall be until the flame within you conquers her, or that flame perishes for weariness. The voice of Ishtar was still, the gods were silent. Then, out of the blackness of the shrine of Nergal, bellowed the voice of the Lord of Death. So you say, Ishtar, then I, Nergal, tell you this. I stand with this man who is my priest, nor am I so much displeased with him since it was by him that I looked so closely into your eyes, O mother of the heavens. The dark cloud shook with a hideous laughter. I shall be with him, and I will meet you, Ishtar the destroyer, yea, with craft to match yours and might to grapple with you until I, not you, have destroyed this woman and the flame she boasts, as well as that within this priest of mine. For in my abode there are no such flames, and I would quench it in him that my darkness be not affrightened when my priest at last comes to me. 
And again the laughter shook the ebon cloud, while the glory that covered Ishtar quivered with wrath. But the three of us listened with despair, for ill as it was with us, far, far more ill was it to hear this jesting with the dark hornless one with the mother of the heavens. Came the goddess's voice, bitter, smaller still. Be it so, O Nergal. There was silence for a little time among the gods, and I thought that behind their veils they looked at each other askance. Came at last the passionless voice of Nabu. What of this woman, Sharain? The voice of Ishtar, impatient. Let her fate be bound with Zarpanit's. Let Zarpanit have her retinue in that place to which she goes. Then Nabu again. And the priest Claneth, is he to go free? What, shall not my priest have his retinue too? mocked Nergal. Set Claneth beside my priest Alusar with others to minister to him. Again, I thought that the gods looked askance at each other. Then Nabu asked, Shall it be so, queen of the heavens? And Ishtar answered, Let it be so. The Du Azaga faded. I was one with the nothingness. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Ship of Ishtar This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Paul Lawley Jones. The Ship of Ishtar by Abraham Merritt. The Flames Win Free. Again, Shireen was silent, brooding, he knew, over pictures of a world that lay six thousand years deep in the abyss of time, yet still fresh and living to her. Silent, too, sat Kenton fighting against belief in this strange tale of strife between angry god and goddess, made incarnate in priestess and priest. She stirred, laid hand on his. When we awoke, we were on this haunted ship, on this strange sea, in this strange world, messenger, she said. Yea, and all that the gods had promised and decreed in the Duazaga had come to pass. For with Zarpanit was I, and half a score of the temple girls she had loved. And with Aluzar was Claneth and a pack of his black acolytes. They had given us oarsmen, sturdy temple slaves, a twain for each oar. They had made the ship beautiful, and they had seen to it that we lacked for nothing. A green flame of anger pulsed for an instant through her eyes. Yea, she said. The kindly gods did all for our comfort, and then they launched the ship on this strange sea, in this strange world, as battleground for love and hate, arena for wrathful Ishtar and dark Nergal, torture chamber for their sinning priestess and priest. It was in this cabin that Zarpanit awakened, with the name of Alasar upon her lips, then straightway she ran out the door as though she knew where he were, and, as she sped out, from the black cabin came Alusar, calling her name. I saw her reach that line where black deck meets this, and lo, she was hurled back as though by thrust of strong arms. For there is a barrier there, messenger, a barrier built by the gods over which none of us upon the ship may pass. But then we knew nothing of that. And Alusar, striving to pass that unseen wall too, was hurled back from it. Then, as they arose, calling, stretching hands, striving to touch finger to finger, straightway into Zarpanit poured that sister self of Ishtar, the angry one, the destroyer. While around Alusar, black shadows deepened and hid him. At last they parted and what had been the face of Alasar was the face of Nergal, lord of the dead. Yea, so it was, 
even as the gods had decreed. And that immortal twain within the bodies of those mortal two who loved each other so, battled and flung their hates like brands against each other. While the slaves chained to their oars in the pit cowered and raved or fell senseless under the terrors loosed above them. And the temple girls with us cast themselves upon the deck, or ran screaming into the cabin that they might not see. Only I did not cry out or flee, I who, since I had faced the gods in the Du Azaga, could never again feel fear. And, she drew a deep breath, eyes misty with sorrow. So it fared. How long? How long I do not know in this place where time seems not to be, since there is neither night nor day as we knew them in Babylon. Yet ever the priest and priestess strove to meet, and ever wrathful Ishtar and dark Nergal thrust them apart. Many are the wiles of the Lord of the Shades, and countless are his weapons. And many are the arts of Ishtar, and is not her quiver always full? Messenger, how long the pair endured, I know not. Yet always strove they to break that barrier through, driven by their love. And always... She covered her face, her white shoulders shook with her weeping. The flames within them burned on, she whispered. Nergal nor Ishtar could dim them. Their love did but grow stronger. There came a day... For a little, she faltered, then went on. It was in mid-battle. Ishtar had taken possession of Zarpanit and stood where this deck touches the pit of the oarsmen. Nergal had poured himself into Alisar and hurled his evil spawn across the pit against the goddess's lightnings. And as I crouched, watching at this cabin's door, suddenly I saw the radiance that covered Ishtar tremble and dull. For an instant I thought I saw the face of Ishtar waver and fade, the face of Zarpanit look out from where the face of Ishtar had been. While the darkness that shrouded the Lord of the Dead lightened, as though a strong flame had shot up within it. Then Ishtar took one step, and another, and another, toward the barrier between Black Deck and this. But it came to me that not by her will did she so move, no, she went haltingly, reluctantly, as though something stronger than herself pushed her on. And as she moved, so moved Nergal within his shadows to meet her. Closer they came and closer, and ever the radiance of Ishtar would wax and wane, ever the shadows clothing Nergal would lighten, darken, lighten again, yet ever, slowly, unwillingly, but inexorably, they drew closer and closer to each other. Now I could see the face of Alasar, the priest, thrusting himself into sight, stripping itself of Nergal's mask. And suddenly, with fast-beating heart, it came to me that wrathful Ishtar and the Dark One were no longer striving against each other, but that she, the goddess, was at grips with the flame in Zarpanit, and that he, the Lord of the Dead, was battling with the flame within the priest, those flames that Nabu had said not even the gods could destroy. Slowly, slowly the white feet of Zarpanit carried Ishtar to the barrier, and slowly, slowly, ever matching her tread, came Alusar to meet her. And they met. They touched hands, touched lips, clasped, ere conquered god and goddess could withdraw from them. They kissed and clasped. They fell upon the deck, dead. Dead in each other's arms, they died, messenger, when their lips touched. There was a burst of light like the stroke of a thousand lightning bolts. The ship shook and shuddered. But before that burst of light came, I thought I saw two shining flames rise from their bodies, hover for a heartbeat, rush to each other, merge and vanish. 
nor Ishtar nor Nergal had conquered. Nay, love of man and love of woman, these had conquered. Victors over God and goddess, the flames were free. The priest had fallen on the hither side of the barrier. We did not unclasp their arms. We bound their bodies round with silken, perfumed coverings. We set them adrift, a lock, face to face, their bodies. Then ran I forth to slay Claneth, but I had forgotten that neither Ishtar nor Nergal had conquered one the other. Lo, into me as I ran poured the goddess, and into Claneth returned Nergal. As of old these two powers battled, and again the unseen barrier was strong as of old, holding back from each other those in ivory deck and black. Yet I was happy, for by this I knew that Zarpanit and Alisa had already been forgotten by them. It came to me that the strife had gone beyond those two who had escaped, that now it mattered not either to wrathful Ishtar or to Nergal that they had gone, since in my body and in Claneth's they could still strive against each other for possession of the ship. You see, messenger, her eyes searched him. Also, it came to me that so long as I might keep them at strife, that much longer might Zarpanit and Alisar have to find hiding place from them, find sanctuary in some far-flung world beyond the outermost strand of stars. And so I dared the black priest often, and often was I the file for Ishtar. And so we sail and fight, and sail and fight. How long? I do not know. Once I knew time. Here there is nothing of that time I knew in my own world. No time here, on these strange seas, in this strange world. Many, many years must have passed since we faced the gods at Uruk, but see, I am still as young as then and as fair. Or so my mirror tells me, she sighed. End of chapter 7「sat silent, unanswering, the depths of his soul troubled. Young and fair she was indeed, and Uruk and Babylon, mounds of time-worn sands these thousands of years. What could he say to her? What message could he have for her who, if her story were true, ought by every law of nature in which he believed, be but dust within the wind-driven dust of her crumpled temple? And yet she was not dust. She was here before him, living, palpitant, clothed in beauty. Tell me, Lord, her voice roused him. Her face was dreamy, the long lashes downcast. Tell me, my Lord, has the temple at Uruk great honour among the nations still? And is Babylon still proud in her supremacy? He did not speak. Belief that he had been thrust into some alien, incredible reality wrestling with outraged revolt at the modern, sceptic part of him. What? Believe this tale of an angry goddess and god? Creatures of human fancy, whose fanes were but mouldering ruins on the highway of the ages, whose very names were well-nigh forgotten. Give credence to this? Nevertheless, the woman was real, living. She must be answered. Against each other, strained, the opposing currents of his thought, and the Lady Charain, raising her eyes to his troubled face, stared at him with ever-growing doubt. Suddenly she leaped from beside him, stood quivering like a blade of wrath in a sweetly flowered sheath. "'Have you word for me?' she cried. "'Speak, and quickly!' What could he answer? Dream woman, 
or women in ancient sorceries there was but one answer for Sharain, the truth but you are from nabu she breathed you must be how else could you have come and wrapped in his blue cloak of wisdom and his serpents listen he answered listen until i am done and tell her the truth kenton did beginning from the arrival of the block from babylon into his house glossing no detail that might make all plain to her she listened her gaze steadfast upon him drinking in his words amazement alternating with stark disbelief and these in turn by horror by despair for even the sight of ancient uruk is well-nigh lost he ended the house of the seven zones is a windswept heap of desert sand and babylon mighty babylon has been level with the wastes these six thousand of years she leaped to her feet leaped and rushed upon him eyes blazing red gold hair streaming liar she shrieked liar now i know you you phantom of nergal a dagger flashed in her hand he caught the wrist just in time struggled with her bore her down upon the couch i tell you the truth he cried i know no nergal nor ishtar nor nabu i am a man and i have told you truth abruptly she relaxed hung half fainting in his arms uruk dust she whimpered the house of ishtar dust babylon a desert and sargon of akkad dead six thousand years ago you said six thousand years she shuddered sprang from his embrace but if that is so then what am i she whispered white-lipped what am i six thousand years and more gone since i was born and i alive then what am i panic overpowered her her eyes dulled she clutched at the cushions through kenton's mind flashed a cynic thought this woman who could talk so calmly of commerce with gods of their vengeance and their strife accepting what to him was the unbelievable this woman to be appalled by age overwhelmed by that purely natural fact of the passing of time it was this paradox that made her real he had known a woman who could look at hurricane and earthquake without a tremor but who cowered and wept at the approach of a birthday in uruk or babylon or new york the breed held true pity awoke within him he took a step toward her she looked up at him the pale lips still quivering the slim fingers twitching at the silken nets over her breast he bent over her she threw white arms around him i am alive she cried i am human i am woman her soft lips clung to his supplicating the perfumed tint of her hair covered him the fragrance of her body rocked him she held him her lithe body pressed tight imperatively desperate against his racing heart he felt the frightened pulse of hers beating through the rounded bosom and ever between her kisses she whispered am i not a woman and alive tell me am i not alive desire filled him he gave her kiss for kiss yet tempering the flame of his desire was clear recognition that neither swift love for him nor passion had swept her into his arms it was terror that lay behind her caresses she was afraid appalled by that six thousand year wide abyss between the life she had known and his clinging to him she fought for assurance of her own reality seeking such an assurance she had driven back to women's last entrenchment the primal assertion of the woman's self the certainty of her womanhood and its unconquerable lure no it was not to convince him that her kisses burned his lips it was to convince herself he did not care she was in his arms he gave her kiss for kiss she thrust him from her sprang to her feet faced him i am a woman then she cried triumphantly a woman and alive a woman 
he answered thickly, his whole body quivering toward her. Alive! God, yes! She closed her eyes. A great sigh shook her, a sigh that was almost a sob. And that is truth, she cried, the Lady Charaine. And it is the one truth you have spoken. Nay, be silent, she checked him. If I am woman and alive, it follows that all else you have told me are lies. Since I could be neither, were Babylon dust, and it's six thousand years since first I saw the ship. You lying dog! she shrilled, and with one ringed hand struck Kenton across the lips. The rings cut deep. As he fell back, dazed both by blow and sudden shift of fortune, she threw open the door of that other cabin in which he had glimpsed the clustered girls. Luarda, Athnal, all! Wrathfully she summoned them. Quick, bind me this dog! Bind him, but slay him not! Streamed from the cabin seven warrior maids, short-kirtled, bare to their waists, in their hands like javelins. They flung themselves upon him, and as they wound about him, Charain darted in, tore the sword of Nabu from his hand, and now young, fragrant bodies crushed him in rings of woman flesh, soft yet inexorable as steel. The blue cloak was thrown over his head, twisted around his neck. At the strangling grip, Kenton awoke from his stupor, awoke roaring with rage. Savagely he tore himself loose, hurled the cloak from him, leaped towards Charain. Quicker than he, the lithe bodies of the warrior maids screened her from his rush. They thrust him with their javelins, pricking him as do the matadors to turn a charging bull. Back and back they drove him, ripping his clothing, bringing blood now here, now there. Through his torment he heard the laughter of Charain. Liar! she mocked. Liar, coward, and fool! Tool of Nergal, sent to me with a lying tale to sap my courage. Well, witless one, I'll send you back to Nargal with another tale to tell him. Back and back he was driven. The warrior maids dropped their javelins, surged forward as one. They clung to him, twined legs and arms around him, dragged him down. Cursing, biting, flailing with his fists, kicking, caring no longer that they were women. Kenton fought them. Berserk, he staggered to his feet the girls clinging like hounds to a stag, seeking his throat, his eyes. His foot struck the lintel of the rosy cabin's door. Down he plunged, dragging his wildcat burden with him. Falling, they drove against the door. Open it flew, and out through it they rolled, writhing, battling down the ivory deck. There was a shouting close behind him, a shrill cry of warning from Charain, some urgent command, for grip of arms and legs relaxed. Clutching, clawing hands were withdrawn. Sobbing with rage, Kenton swung to his feet, and as he swung upright, he saw that he was almost astride the line that was the mysterious, deadly barrier between ivory deck and black. Dimly it came to him that this was why Charaine had whistled her furies from him, that he had dragged them too close to its menace. Again her laughter racked him, she stood upon the gallery of little blossoming trees, her doves winging about her. The sword of Nabu was in her hand. Derisively, she lifted it. Ho, lying messenger, mocked Charain. Ho, dog, beaten by women. Come, get your sword. I'll come, damn you, he shouted, and leaped forward. The ship pitched. Thrown off his balance, Kenton staggered back reeled to the line where black and ivory decks met, reeled over it, unhurt. Something far deeper than his consciousness registered that fact, registered it as of paramount importance. Whatever the power of the barrier, to it Kenton was immune. He poised himself to leap back to the ivory deck. Stop him, came the voice of Clanneth. In mid-spring, Long, sinewy fingers gripped his shoulder, swung him round. He looked into the face of the beater of the serpent drum, staring at him with amazement and a curious, awakening speculation in his beady black eyes. The drummer's talons lifted him and cast him like a puppy behind. 
and panting like some outraged puppy kenton swayed upon his feet and looked around him a ring of black-robed men was closing in upon him black-robed men whose faces were dead white impassive black-robed men closing in upon him with clutching hands beyond the ring stood the mailed warrior with the golden beard and the pale agate eyes and beside him claneth not cared kenton for any or all of them stop me hell he roared he rushed the black robes they curled over him overwhelmed him pinned him down again the ship lurched this time more violently kenton swept off his feet slid sideways a wave swished over him half strangling him the hands that clutched him were washed away by it choking he threshed hands and feet striving to stand another wave lifted him flung him up and out like a leaf over a cataract he felt himself falling into the sea deep he sank he fought his way upward thrust his head at last above the surface he dashed the water from his eyes looked for the ship a roaring wind had risen and under it the ship was scudding a hundred yards away he shouted swam toward her the wind roared louder down went the sail down dipped the oars straining to keep the ship before the wind faster and faster flew the ship before the blast was lost in the silvery mist kenton ceased his efforts floated abandoned in an unknown world a wave smote him he came up behind it choking the wind was shrieking roaring overhead the spindrift whipped him he heard the booming of surf the hiss of combers thrown back by ramparts of rock another wave caught him swept him forward struggling upon its crest he saw just ahead of him a pinnacle of yellow stone rising from a nest of immense boulders upon which the billows broke in fountains of spume again a wave seized him hurled him on he fought against it helplessly his strength left him he let himself go stopped fighting he felt himself lifted by a gigantic comber dashed straight against the yellow pillar the shock of his impact was no greater than that of breaking through thick cobweb for infinite distances it seemed he rushed on and on through a soft thick darkness with him went the sound of waves abruptly his motion ceased the sound of the waves fled he was gripping something something hard and smooth not rock no wood suddenly he knew he was within his own room he snapped on the electrics stood swaying shuddering what was that upon the floor at his feet stupidly he stared it was water water that was dripping from him forming a pool water water strangely coloured strangely coloured water crimsoned water he realised that he was wet to the skin drenched he licked lips gone abruptly dry there was salt upon them and the water that dripped from him was crimsoned 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 with his blood there was a long mirror in this room of his he stumbled to it stumbling to meet him came a drenched and ragged figure ripped and tattered was its clothing water dripped from it and from a score of wounds blood mixed with that water mingled and dripped it was himself he turned to where the ship gleamed bent over it on the black deck was a group of the little figures leaning looking over the rail upon the gallery of the rosy cabin one tiny figure stood charain he touched her jewel hard jewel cold a toy yet charain charain beautiful palpitant terrified wrathful vengeful mocking charain this toy was she like a returning wave his berserk rage against her swept him echoes of her laughter in his ears kenton cursing sought for something with which he could shatter that shining bark of beauty break the link it formed between charain's ensorcelled world and his own never again should she laugh at him mock him he caught a heavy chair by its legs swung it high overhead poised for an instant to send it crashing down upon the ship and suddenly 
beneath the salt upon his lips kenton tasted the honey musk of her kisses the kisses of Sharain. the chair dropped from his hands ishtar nabu he whispered arms held high in supplication i call upon you set me once more upon the ship whatever the price that price i will pay ishtar do with me as you will only set me again upon your ship swift was his answer he heard far off a bellowing roar as of countless combers battering against a rock-ribbed coast louder it grew then with a thunder of vast waters the outward wall of his room dissolved where wall had been was the crest of one tremendous wave and that wave curled down over kenton rolled him far under it shot him at last gasping for breath up and up through it he was afloat again upon the turquoise sea he thrust himself high above the waters the ship was close close its scimitared bow was striking down by his head was flying past him a golden chain hung from it skittering over the crests kenton clutched at it missed it back he fell swift raced the shining side of the ship past him again he threw himself high there was another chain a black one spattering over the wave tips and hanging from the stern he gripped it the sea tore at his thighs his legs his feet grimly he held fast hand over hand cautiously he drew himself up scaled the side of the ship now he was just below the rail slowly he raised his head to peer over long arms swept down upon him long hands gripped his shoulders lifted him hurled him down upon the deck pinned him there he felt a thong drawn round his ankles his arms pinioned to his sides he looked into the face of the frog-mouthed beater of the serpent drum and over one of the drummer's enormous shoulders stared the white face of clanith he heard his voice carry him in Gigi." and the answer of the drummer indifferent as you will it clanith he felt himself lifted by the drummer as easily as though he had been a babe and cradled in his huge hands he was carried through the black cabin's door End of chapter 8chapter 9 of the ship of ishtar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by gillian hendry the ship of ishtar by abraham merritt slave of the ship the drummer set kenton on his feet regarding him with curious half-amused eyes agate eyes of the red-bearded warrior and pale eyes of clanith dwelt upon him as curiously but in the last was no amusement no as curiously kenton took stock of the three first the black priest massive elephant thewed flesh sallow and dead as though the blood flowed through veins too deeply embedded to reveal the creep of its slow tide the vulture nose and merciless lips the feral phosphorescence glimmering behind the wan pupils the face of nero remodelled from cold clay by numbed hands of sluggish god within some frozen hell heavy plastic with evil but not that hot evil which often touching life is absorbed within and transformed by life's fire the evil in clanith's face was a cold evil and one with death and as unalterable as death then Gigi, the drummer his frog-like face with the pointed jet-hung ears his stunted and bowed legs his giant's body above the hips the gigantic shoulders whence swung the long and sinewy and apish arms whose strength kenton had felt the slit of a mouth in whose corners a malicious humour dwelt something of old earth gods about him a touch of pan more than a touch of satyr red beard a persian out of that time when persia's hordes were to the world what later the roman legions were to be or so kenton judged him by his tunic of linked light mail the silken sheathed legs the high buskins 
and the curved daggers and the scimitar in his jewelled belt and human as kenton himself about him was none of the charnel flavour of clanith nor the goat rankness of Gigi. the full red lips beneath the carefully trimmed beard were sensual life-loving the body burly and muscular the face whiter than kenton's own but it was sullen and stamped deep with a half-resigned half-desperate boredom that even his lively and frank curiosity about kenton lightened but little they said nothing only stood there measuring him and each so it seemed to kenton with different purpose he turned his eyes from them looked about him in front of him was a wide slab of bloodstone six priests knelt upon it worshipping something that stood within a niche just above the slab what it was he could not tell except that it breathed out evil a little larger than a man the thing within the niche was black and formless as though made of curdling shadows it quivered pulsated as though the shadows that were its substance thickened constantly about it passed within it were replaced swiftly by others dark was that cabin the walls sombre as dull black marble other shadows clung to those dark walls and clustered in the corners subtle sinister shadows that seemed only to await command to deepen into substance unholy shadows like those that clothed the evil thing within the niche beyond as in the cabin of charain was another chamber and crowding at the door between glaring out at him were a dozen or more of the black-robed white-faced priests go to your places claneth turned to them breaking the silence they slipped away the black priest closed the door upon them he touched the nearest of the kneeling priests with his foot our lord nargal has had enough of worship he said see he has swallowed your prayers kenton looked at the thing within the niche it was no longer misty shadowed it stood out clear-cut its body was that of a man and its face was that same awesome visage of evil into which he had seen the black priests turn on that first adventure of his upon the ship the face of nergal lord of the dead what had been the curdled quivering shades enveloping the statue what was it claneth had said that nergal had swallowed their prayers had the shadows really been that the prayers of the priests black prayers evil prayers streaming out of the minds of the priests like black mists shrouding the image passing into it swallowed by it he felt the eyes of claneth searching him covertly a trick a trick to frighten him he met the black priest's gaze squarely smiled the persian laughed hi claneth he said there was a bolt that fell far short mayhap the stranger has seen such things before mayhap he is a sorcerer himself and can do better things change your play claneth change your play he yawned and seated himself upon a low settle the black priest's face grew grimmer best be silent zubran he said else it may be that our lord nergal will change his play for you in a way to banish forever your disbelief. Disbelief? echoed the Persian. Oh, Nergal is real enough. It is not disbelief that irks me. It is the eternal monotony. Can you do nothing new, Claneth? Can Nergal do nothing new? Change his play for me, eh? By Ahriman, that is just what I wish he would do, if he can. He yawned again, ostentatiously. The black priest growled, turned to the six worshippers. Go, he ordered, and send Zakel to me. They filed through the outer door. The black priest dropped upon another settle, studying Kenton sombrely. The drummer squatted, also watching him. The Persian muttered to himself, playing with his dagger hilts. The door opened again, and into the cabin stepped a priest who held in one hand a long whip whose snaky lash, metal-tipped, was curled many times around his forearm. He bowed low before Claneth. "'The slaves sleep?' asked the black priest. 
They sleep, master, answered he called Zachel. And now Kenton recognized him. When he had lain on the deck close to the mast, he had seen this man sitting on a high platform at the foot of that mast. Overseer of the galley slaves, the oarsman, was Zachel, and that long lash measured to flick the furtherest of them if they lagged. Is this he whom you saw upon the deck some sleeps ago when our Lord Nergal poured into me? asked Clanith. He who lay there and, you say, vanished, even as that cursed drab of Ishtar yonder bent over to touch him? He is the same, master, answered the overseer, coming close to Kenton and scanning him. He was not dressed the same as now, but he is the same. Where went he then? asked Clanith, more to himself than to the other. To the drab's cabin? But if so, why did she drive him out, her cats clawing him? And whence came this garb he wears, and the sword she waved and bade him come retake? I know that sword. He went not into her cabin at that time, master, said Zachel. I saw her seek for him. She went back to her place alone. He had vanished. And his driving forth, mused Clenneth, that was two sleeps ago. And the ship has sailed far since then. We saw him struggling in the waves far behind us. Yet here he is upon the ship again, and with the wound those temple furies gave him still fresh, still bleeding, as though it had been but a moment gone. And how passed he the barrier? Yea, how passed he the barrier? Ah, at last you have stumbled on a real question, Clanneth, cried the Persian. Let him but tell me that, let him but teach me that, and by the nine hells, not long would I sit in this company. Kenton saw the drummer make a swift and warning gesture to Zubran, saw the black priest's eyes narrow menacingly, his face grow grim indeed. Ho, ho, laughed Gigi. Zubran but jests, Kenneth. Would he not find life there as tiresome as he pretends to find it with us? Is it not so, Zubran? Again he made the fleet warning sign, and the Persian heeded it. Yes, I suppose that is so, he answered grudgingly. At any rate, am I not sworn to Nergal? Nevertheless, he muttered, the gods gave women one art that has not grown tiresome since first they made the world. They lose that art in Nergal's abode, said the black priest grimly. There is no loving there, Zubran. Best remember that, and curb that tongue of yours, lest you find yourself in a worse place than here, where at least you have your body. May I speak, master? asked Saka, and Kenton felt malignancy, threat, in the glance the overseer shot at him. The black priest nodded. I think he passed the barrier because he knows not of our lord, said Zachel. Indeed, maybe an enemy of our lord. If not, why was he able to shake off the hands of your priests, vanish in the sea, and return? Enemy of Nergal? Clanneth started. That it does not follow that he is friend of Ishtar, put in the drummer smoothly. True, if he were sworn to the Dark One, he could not pass the barrier. But true it is also that were he sworn to Ishtar, equally would that have been impossible. True. Clanneth's face cleared. And I know that sword, Nabu's own blade. He was silent for a moment, thoughtful. When he spoke, there was courtesy in the thick voice. Stranger, he said, if we have used you roughly, forgive us. Visitors are rare upon this ship. You, let me say, startled us out of our manners. Zachel, loose his bonds. The overseer bent and sullenly set Kenton free of his thongs. If, as I think, you came from Nabu, went on the black priest, I tell you that I have no quarrel with the wise one or his people, nor is my master, the Lord of Death, ever at odds with the Lord of Wisdom. How could he be? 
when one carries the key of knowledge of this life and the other the key that unlocks the door of the ultimate knowledge nay there is no quarrel there are you a favoured one of nabu did he set you on the ship and why silent was kenton searching desperately for some way to answer the black priest temporise with him as he had with Charain, he knew he could not nor he knew was it of any use to tell him the truth as he had to her and been driven out like a hunted rat for it here was danger peril greater than he had faced in the rosy cabin Clannis' voice cut in but favoured of nabu as you may be that could not save you from losing your sword nor from the javelin of the women and if that is so can it save you from my whips my chains and worse and as kenton stood still silent the wolf light flared in the dead pupils and the black priest leaped to his feet crying answer me answer the lord Kenneth, roared gigi has fear of him killed your tongue under the apparent anger of the drummer's voice kenton sensed a warning friendliness and gigi had not told of his second appearance on the ivory deck his entering of Charain's cabin. Why? If that favour could have saved me, at least it did not, he said. The black priest dropped back upon the settle, chuckling. Nor, I think, could it save you if I decreed your death, he said. Death, if he decrees it, croaked Gigi. Whoever you are, went on the black priest, whence you come or how, one thing is sure. You have power to break a chain that irks me. Nay, Zachel, stay, he spoke to the overseer, who had made a move to go. Your counsel is also good. Stay. There is a slave dead at the oars, said the overseer. I would loose his chains and cast him over. Dead? There was new interest in Clanneth's voice. Which was he? How died he? Who knows? Zachel shrugged his shoulders of weariness maybe he was one of those who first set sail with us he who sat beside the yellow-haired slave from the north that we bought at imachtala well he has served long said the black priest nergal hath him let his body bear his chains a little longer stay with me he spoke again to kenton deliberately finally bearer of nabu's sword he said I offer you freedom. I offer you riches and power. I will give you honours and wealth in Imachtala, whence we shall sail as soon as you have done my bidding. There you shall have priesthood and a temple, if you so desire, gold and women and rank, if you will do what I desire. And if you will not, then torture such as few men have known. And long, oh, very long after that, death what is your desire that will win me all this asked kenton the black priest arose and bent his head so that his eyes looked straight into kenton's own slay charain he said slay charain slay charain and despite her wrath her kisses still sweet on his lips the thought shook him to the depths of his being he steadied cast about for something that would let him play for time. "'Little meat in that plan, Planeth. the Persian spoke mockingly. "'Did you not see her girls beat him? "'As well send to conquer a lioness, "'a man who has already been conquered by her cubs.' "'Nay,' said Planeth. "'I meant not for him to pass over the open deck "'where surely her watchers would see him.' He can clamber round the ship's hull from chain to chain, ledge to ledge, or we can steal the oars, drop the sail, becalm the ship. Then he can slip down into the water, swim silently to the bow. There is a window behind the cabin wherein she sleeps. Up to it and through it he can creep. Best swear him to Nergal before he takes that road, master, Zachel interrupted else we may never have him back again fool gigi spoke if he makes his vows to nergal perhaps he cannot go at all for how know we that then 
the barrier will not be closed to him as it is to us who are sworn to the dark one, even as it is to those who are sworn to Ishtar. True, nodded the black priest. We dare not risk that. Well spoken, Gigi. In Kenton's mind, a plan had begun to form. Why should she be slain? he asked. Let me take her for slave, that I may repay her for her mockery and her blows. Give her to me, and you may keep all the riches and honours you have offered. So greatly do I hate her. No, the black priest leaned closer, searching more intently the eyes of Kenton. She must be slain. While she lives, the goddess has a vial into which to pour herself. Sharain dead. Ishtar has none on this ship through whom she may make herself manifest. This I, Claneth, know. Sharain dead. Nergal rules. Through me. Nergal wins. Through me. In Kenton's mind, the plan had formed. He would promise to do this, to slay Sharain. He would creep into her cabin, tell her of the plot. Some way, somehow, make her believe him. And then he would take the sword, creep back the same way he had come, and slay Claneth. But could he do this? A sudden doubt touched him as he looked at the bulk of the black priest, the three others. And then there were the black-robed pack. Could he alone meet all these? Slay Claneth? The doubt fled. Something whispered that neither Gigi nor the Persian would fight against him, that there was some secret understanding between those two, some deep hatred of the black priest, else why the drummer's covert warning to Zubran, and why the peculiar protection for himself that he had sensed in Gigi during all this encounter. Why, again, Gigi's silence to Claneth on Kenton's second sailing on the ship. Was the beater of the serpent drum tired as Zubran of life on the black deck, eager to see Claneth overcome, yet by vows, the strength of which he could not understand, made powerless to harm the black priest. Too late he saw by the black priest's face that something of all this had been revealed in his own, that Claneth had caught his thought. Too late remembered that the sharp, malignant eyes of the overseer had been watching him, losing no fleeting change of expression, interpreting. Look, master, Zachil snarled, look, can you not read his thought, even as I? See what it is he plans? You have held me here for counsel, and have called my counsel good. Then let me speak what is in my mind. I thought that he had vanished from beside the mast, even as I told you. But did he? The gods come and go upon the ship as they will, but no man does. We thought we saw him struggling in the waves far behind the ship, but did we? By sorcery, he may have made us see that which in reality was not. Upon the ship, he must have lain all this while, hid in Sharain's cabin. Out of her cabin, we saw him come. But driven forth by her women, Zachel, broke in the drummer, cast out, beaten. Remember that. There was no friendship there, Claneth. They were at his throat like hounds tearing down a deer. A play, cried Zachel, a play to trick you, master. They could have killed him. Why did they not? Why, his wounds are but pinpricks. They drove him, yes, but o'er to us. Sherry knew he could cross the barrier, even as now do you. Would she have made gift to us of new strength, unless she had a purpose? And what could that purpose have been, master? Only one, to place him here to slay you, even as you now plan to send him to slay her. He is a strong man, and lets himself be beaten by girls. He had a sword, a sharp blade, and a holy one, and he lets a woman take it. Ho, ho, laughed Zaphel. Do you believe all this, master? Well, I do not. By Nergal, Clanus swore, dead face livid, eyes aflame with witch light. Now, by Nergal! Suddenly he gripped Kenton by the shoulders, hurled him through the cabin door and out upon the deck. Swiftly he followed him, set heavy foot upon Kenton's breast. Sharain, he howled, 
Sharain! Kenton raised his head dizzily, saw her standing beside the cabin door, arms around the slim waists of two of her damsels. Well, Toad? she called. Nergal and Ishtar are busy elsewhere, he mocked. Life on the ship grows dull. There is a slave under my feet, a lying slave. Do you know him, Sharain? He bent and lifted Kenton high, as a man a child. Her face, cold, contemptuous, did not change. He is nothing to me. Worm, she answered. I drove him forth, to you where he belongs. Do as you will with your own. It is nothing to me. Beneath her stillness, the black priest must have seen something hidden to Kenton, for the dead eyes brightened, the lips curled with cruel delight. He dropped Kenton roughly to the deck. Nothing to you, eh? roared Clanith. Yet it was by your will that he came to me. Well, he has a lying tongue, Sharain. By the old law of the slaves shall he be punished for it. I will pit four of my men against him. If he master them, I shall keep him for a while, to amuse us further. But if they master him, then shall his lying tongue be torn from him, and I will give it to you as a token of my love, O sacred vessel of Ishtar. Ho, ho, laughed the black priest, as Sharain shrank, paling. A test for your sorceries, Sharain, to make that tongue speak. Make it, the thick voice purred, make it whisper of love to you. Tell you how beautiful you are, Sharain. How wonderful. Ah, sweet Sharain, reproach you a little too, perhaps, for sending it to me to be torn out. Ho, ho, laughed Clanith. Then, as though he spat the words, you temple slut. He thrust a light whip in Kenton's hands. Now fight, slave, he snarled. Fight for your lying tongue. Four of the priests leaped forward, drawing from beneath their robes thongs tipped with metal. They circled, and before Kenton could gather his strength, could realize how menaced they were upon him. They darted about him like four lank wolves slashing at him with their whips. Blows flailed upon his head, his naked shoulders. Awkwardly he tried to parry, to return them. The metal tips bit deep. From shoulders, chest, back, a slow rain of blood began to drip. A thong caught him across the face, half blinding him. Far away he heard the golden voice of Sharain, shrill with scorn. Slave, can you not even fight? Cursing, he dropped his useless whip. Close before him was the grinning face of the priest who had struck him. Ere his lash could be raised again, the fist of Kenton had smashed squarely upon the leering mouth. He felt beneath his knuckles the bones of the nose crumble, the teeth shatter. The priest crashed back, went rolling to the rail. Instantly the other three were upon him, tearing at his throat, clawing him, striving to drag him down. He broke loose. The three held back for an instant, then rushed. One there was, a little in front of the others. Kenton caught him by an arm, twisted that arm over his shoulder, set hip to prisoned flank, heaved and hurled the priest through air against the pair poised to strike. Out flung the body, fell short. The head crashed against the deck. There was a sharp snap, like a breaking faggot. For a moment the body stood, shoulders touching deck, legs writhing as though in grotesque mid-somersault, then crumpled and lay still. Well thrown, he heard the Persian shout. There is one who will never use lash again. Long fingers clutched his ankles. His feet flew from beneath him. As he fell, he caught a glimpse of a face staring up at him, a face that was but one red smear, the face of the first priest he had battered down and who, recovering, had crept along the deck and thrown him. Falling, Kenton swept out his arms. They clutched one of the two against whom he had hurled that priest who now lay dead, neck broken. They dragged him down. He whom Kenton had caught writhed, twisted, and clutched his throat. 
with the strangling grip there flashed into his mind a dreadful thing he had seen done in another unequal combat upon a battlefield in france up swept his right hand the first two fingers extended they found place in the eye sockets of the throttler pressed there cruelly pressed there relentlessly he heard a howl of agony tears of blood spurted over his hands the choking fingers dropped from his throat where eyes had been were now two raw red sockets with dreadful pendants hanging glaring down beneath each kenton leaped to his feet he stamped upon the crimson smeared face looking up at him stamped once twice thrice and the grip about his ankles was gone he caught a glimpse of charaine white-faced wide-eyed realized that the laughter of the black priest was stilled at him rushed the fourth acolyte a broad-leafed knife gleaming in his grip kenton bent his head rushed to meet him he caught the hand that held the blade bent the arm back heard the bone snap the fourth priest shrieked and fell he saw clanith mouth loose staring at him straight for the black priest's throat he leaped right fist swinging upward to the jaw as he sprang but the black priest thrust out his arms caught him in mid-leap then lifted him high over his head balanced him there to dash him down upon the deck kenton closed his eyes this then was the end came the voice of the persian urgent agonized hi clanith hi kill him not it is long since i have seen such a fight by ishak of the hollow hell kill him not clanith save him to fight again then the drummer nay clanith nay he felt the talons of Gigi catch him, hold him tight in double grasp. Nay, Clanith, he fought fairly and well. He would be a rare one to have with us. Mayhap he will change his mind with discipline. Remember, Clanith, he is the only one of us who can pass the barrier. The great bulk of the black priest trembled. Slowly his hands began to lower Kenton. Discipline? Huh. It was the snarling voice of the overseer. Give him to me, master, in the place of the slave who died at the oar. I will teach him discipline. The black priest dropped Kenton on the deck, stood over him for a moment. Then he nodded, turned abruptly, and stalked into his cabin. Kenton, reaction seizing him, huddled, hands clasping knees. Unchain the dead slave and cast him over, Zachel, he heard Gigi say. I will watch this man till you return. Kenton heard the overseer patter away. The drummer bent over him. Well fought, wolf cub, he whispered. Well fought. Now to your cabin, now to your chains. Obey, your chance shall come. Do as I say, wolf cub, and I will do what I may. He walked away. Kenton, wondering, raised his head. He saw the drummer stoop lift the body of the priest with the broken neck, and with one sweep of his long arm send it whirling over the ship's rail. Bending again, he sent after it the body of him upon whose face Kenton had stamped. He paused speculatively before the wailing, empty, socketed horror stumbling and falling about the deck. Then, grinning cheerfully, he lifted it by the knees and tossed it overboard. Three less to worry about hereafter, muttered Gigi. A tremor shook Kenton. His teeth chattered. He sobbed. The drummer looked down on him with amused wonder. You fought well, wolf cub, he said. Then why do you now quiver like a whipped hound whose half-chewed bone has been cast away? He laid both hands on Kenton's bleeding shoulders. Under their touch, he steadied. It was as though, through Gigi's hand, flowed some current of cold strength, of which his soul drank, as though he had tapped some ancient spring, some still pool of archaic indifference both to life and death. The cold current ran through him. And never again, although then he knew it not, was Kenton to feel for either life or death, that respect or fear which, in his own world, were their legitimate shadows. All that he then realised was that whatever weakness of spirit within him there had been was gone. Gone too 
all remorse, all shrinking from his brutalities. In its place welled reckless will to conquer this ship, become its master, conquer Clanath and his dark god, conquer Charain. Good, said Gigi, and stood up. Forget not. Now Zaphil comes for you. The overseer was beside him, touched his shoulder, pointed down a short flight of steps that led from the black deck to the galley pit. Zachil behind him, he groped down those steps into the half-darkness of the pit. He stumbled along a narrow passageway, was brought to halt at a great oar, over whose shank bent from white muscle-gnarled shoulders a head, golden-haired, long-haired as any woman's. This golden-haired oarsman slept. Around his waist was a thick bronze ring. From this ring a strong chain swung, its end fastened to a staple sunk deep in the back of the bench on which he sat. His wrists were manacled. The oar on which his head rested was manacled too. Between manacled wrists and manacled oar two other strong chains stretched. There was an empty chained circlet at the sleeper's left side. On the oar at his left, two empty manacles hung from chains. Zaphil pushed Kenton down on the bench beside the sleeping golden-haired oarsman, swiftly and deftly girdled his waist with the empty bronze circlet, snapped it close, locked it. He thrust Kenton's unresisting hands through the manacles dangling from the oar, closed them on him, locked them. The golden-haired giant never moved, slept on upon his hands, head bent over the oar. And suddenly, Kenton felt warmth of eyes upon him, looked behind him, saw, leaning over the rail, the face of Charain. There was pity in her face, wonder too, and dawning of something that set his heart to beating wildly. "'I'll discipline you, never fear,' said Zachel. Kenton looked behind him again. Charain was gone. He bent over his oar beside the sleeping giant bent over his oar, chained to it, slave of the ship. End of chapter 9。Chapter 10 of The Ship of Ishtar。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ben Stewart. The Ship of Ishtar by Abraham Merritt. Chapter 10 Under the Lash of Zakel. Kenton awakened to the shrilling of a whistle. Something flicked his shoulder like the touch of a hot iron. He jerked his head up from the bed of his arms, looked stupidly at the chained wrists. Again the flick upon the shoulder, biting hotly into the flesh. Up, slave, he heard a snarling voice say a voice he knew and struggled with deep-jugged mind to place. Up! Stand your oar! Then another voice, close behind him, whispering, hoarse, but with warmth of comradeship in it. On your feet, ere his whip covers your back with the blood runes. He struggled upright, hands falling mechanically into two smooth, worn hollows in the wooden shaft to which he was chained. Standing thus upon the bench, his eyes looked out upon a tranquil, turquoise ocean, waveless, within a huge, inverted bowl of silver mists. In front of him were four men, two standing, two sitting, at shanks of great oars which, like the he clutched, thrust through the side of a ship. Beyond them sloped a black deck. Memory rushed upon him, banishing the last of sleep. The first voice had been that of Zakel and the hot touches on his skin, the bite of his whip. He turned his head. A score of other men, black and brown, sat and stood at other great sweeps, bending and rising, sending the ship of Ishtar cutting through the still blue sea. And there, on a platform at the mast step, was Zakel, grinning evilly. Out at Kinton flicked the long lash once more, this time drawing blood. Look not back! Row! snarled Zakel. I will row, whispered the second voice. Stand and sway with the oar till strength comes back to you. He looked down on a head fair-haired, long-haired as any woman's, 
but there was nothing womanish in the face that was lifted for an instant to his. Ice cold and ice blue were the eyes in it, though thawed now by a rough kindliness. The skin was storm-beaten, tempest-tanned. From left temple to point of chin ran a deep red scar written there by a sword. Nor was there aught womanish in the muscles that swelled on shoulders, back, and arms as he swung the great sweep, handling it as easily as a woman a broom. Norseman from tip to toe, a Viking straight out of some ancient saga, and like Kenton, a slave to the ship. The giant, who had bent to sleep over the oar when Kenton's own chains had been locked upon him before that heavy slumber, whose coming he could not even now remember, had submerged him. Sigurd, Trig's son I, muttered the Norseman. What norn of ill luck set you upon the ship of warlocks? Speak low, bend to your oar. The devil with a long lash has sharp ears. To the motion of the oar, Kenton bent and rose, standing there on the bench, his chains rustling. The odd benumbment that had held his mind was passing, passed ever more swiftly as his tightened grip on the oar began to send the blood more swiftly through his veins. The rower beside him grunted approval. No weakling you, he whispered. The oar wearies, yet up it flows strength from the sea. But sip that strength slowly, grow strong slowly, that it may be that you and I together. He paused, shot a weary side glance at Kenton, as though the thought had come to him that he were going too fast. By your looks you are a man of the Airn, the southern isles, he whispered. No grudge bear I against them. Viking, they met us always sword to sword and breast to breast. Many the blows we have struck between us, and the Valkyries hovering never went empty-handed back to Valhalla when we met the men of the Airn. Brave men, strong men, men who died shouting, kissing sword blade and spear point as gaily as a bride. Are you one of these? Kenton thought swiftly. Cunningly must he shape his answer to bind this comradeship so plainly offered him neither bewildered by whole truth, nor be so vague as to rouse suspicion. Kenton, my name, he answered softly. My fathers were of the Yern. Well knew they the Vikings and their ships, nor have they handed down to me any grudge against them. I would be friend of yours, Sigurd, Trig's son, since for how long neither of us know I must labor here beside you. And since you and I together... He paused meaningly, as had the Viking. The Norseman nodded, and then shot the keen side glance at him. Not yet, man whose fathers were of the Airn, have you told me how this bane fell upon you, he muttered. Since they drove me aboard this ship at Isles of Sorcerers, no harbor have we entered. You were not here when they chained me to the oar, yet here are you. How? Sigurd, by Odin all father I do not know. The Norseman's hand quivered at the name of his god. An eye that I could not see looked upon me. A hand that I could not see plucked me out of my own land and set me here. That son of Hela who rules the black deck offered me freedom if I would do a thing of shame. I would not. I battled with his men. Three I slew. And then they chained me to this oar. You slew three. The Viking looked up at Kenton, eyes blazing, teeth bared. You slew three. Skull, comrade, skull, he shouted. Something like a flying serpent hissed by Kenton, hissed and struck the Norseman's back. It withdrew, blood spurting from where it had bitten. It struck and struck again. The whip of Zakel, the overseer. His voice snarled through the hissing of the lash. Dog, sow spittle, have you gone mad? Shall I flay you then? Under the lash, the body of Sigurd, Trig's son, shuddered. From deep in his throat came a low, sobbing moaning. He looked up at Kenton, bloody froth on his lips. Suddenly Kenton knew that it was not from the pain of the blows that the Viking shuddered and sobbed, that it was from the shame of them, and from rage. That whiplash was drawing redder drops from the heart and the courage of him, threatening to break both. And Kenton, leaning over, thrust his own bare back between that lash and the bloody shoulders, took the blows himself. Ha! snarled Zakel. You want them, do you? 
Jealous of my whip's kiss, are you? Well then, take your fill of them. Mercilessly, the lash hissed and struck, hissed and struck. Kenton endured its bite stoically, never shifting the shield of his body from the Norseman, meeting each sharp agony by thought of what he would do to repay them when his time had come, when he had mastered the ship. Abruptly, the hailing blows ceased. Stop! Through pain-misted eyes, he saw the drummer leaning over the pit. Would you kill the slave, Zakel? By Nurgle, if you do, I shall ask Clineth as a gift to me to chain you to that oar for a while. Then Zakel sullenly. Row, slave. Silently, half-fainting, Kenton bent over the oar. The Norseman caught a hand, held it in iron grip. Sigurd, Trig's son am I. Jarl's grandson, master of dragons. His voice was low, yet in it was a clanging-like echo of distant, smiting swords. He spoke with eyes closed, as though he stood before some altar. Blood brotherhood is there now between us, Kenton of the Airn. Blood brothers, you and I. By the red runes upon your back, written there when you thrust it between me and the whip. By every drop of that blood are we brothers and I shall be your shield as you have been mine. Our swords shall be as one sword. Your friend shall be my friend, and your enemy my enemy. And my life for yours when need be. This by Odin Allfather, and by all the Aesir I swear. I, Sigurd the Viking, and if ever I break faith with you, then may I lie under the poison of Hela's snakes until Yggdrasil the Tree of Life withers, and Ragnarok, the night of the gods has come. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of The Ship of Ishtar This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ship of Ishtar by Abraham Merritt The Horn of Sleep The heart of Kenton swelled, grew warm. His scourged back was forgotten in the glow that followed the Viking's vow. Chained to his oar, Sigurd might be even as he, and as helpless under the lash, but still a friend here in the galley pit. And once the two were loosed, a mighty friend indeed, a blood brother worth the having. This master of dragons, as he had called himself, and by that phrase Kenton knew he meant captain of war fleets of the old Norse galleys, should command the ship of Ishtar, under him, of course. Thus Kenton decided, letting no doubt of future victory assail him. Now he was but a slave with whip torn back and chained to an oar, that did not matter, he would conquer. Against him were the black priest, the dread power he served, and his score of acolytes. Nor knew he, actually, when it came to grips with Clineth, whether the drummer Gigi, for all his apparent friendliness, and the Persian Zubran, would not, bound by vows, give their strength to his enemies. Still, it did not matter, he would conquer. And Shirani and her fighting woman, them, too, would he conquer. What mattered the odds against him of men and women with their Nurgle and their Ishtar? Burned steady within him unquenchable conviction that one day he would conquer the ship. Master Sharane. The Viking's hand still gripped his. He placed his other hand upon it. Sigurd, he said. Blood brothers, you and I from now on. Glad is my heart because of it. In ill luck and fair luck, in peace and in war, my fortune shall be your fortune and your bane my bane until the Norn, who cuts the thread of life, severs mine. Skoal, blood brother, skoal. And may Odin or Father give us strength to take this ship and sail it as we will. The grip of the Viking tightened, who threw his hand and bent once more to the oar. Nothing said he, but Kenton knew the vow was sealed. The whip of the overseer cracked, a shrill whistle sounded. Four rowers in front lifted high their oars, shunted them into a niche. The Viking raised his sweep, set it in a similar rest. Sit, he said. They wash us now and feed. A cascade of water fell over Kenton and another, the salt of it stung his wounds, brought tears to his eyes. Quiet, one sigurned. Soon the pain passes, and the salt will heal. Then down over him too swished the water. Two brown men, naked to the waists, back scarred, went by. In each hand they held buckets, raised them, and poured the water over two of the men at the stroke oars. They turned and went back along the narrow way between the benches. Powerful were their bodies. Their faces were those of men come to life out of some ancient Assyrian fries, narrow, hook-nosed, full-lipped. No mind dwelt behind those faces. Their eyes were staring, empty. They moved like automatons. 
An irrepressible tremor shook Kenton. The Viking noted it. Their souls are gone, he whispered. They have long been gone. They are like the slave who died beside me. They have been so long upon this ship that it has sucked their souls from them. They are all like that, save two black men behind us. By the Aesir, he swore. It was what I feared for myself until you came. Back the pair came with other buckets, which they dashed over the other two oarsmen. Bucket after bucket they emptied over the floor of the pit, washing it clean. When this was done, two other slaves set upon the bench between Kenton and the Norsemen a rough platter and a bowl. On the platter were a dozen long pods and a heap of round cakes resembling the cassava bread the tropical folk press out and bake in the sun. Bowls filled with a dark, thick liquid, purplish-red. He munched the pods. They were fleshy, with a curious meaty flavour. The round cakes tasted exactly like what they resembled, cassava bread. The liquid was strong, pungent, a trace of fermentation in it. There was strength in that food and drink. As he ate, Kenton felt strength rising in him, and the dousing had done him good. His back had ceased to smart, the wounds no longer throbbed. He relaxed. Norseman smiled at him. No lash now, so we speak not too loudly, he said. It is the rule. It's while we eat and drink, ask what you will of me without fear, blood brother. Two things I'd first know of many, said Kenton. How came you on the ship, Sir Gerd? And how comes this food here? From here and there comes the food, answered the Viking. It is a ship of warlocks and a cursed one. Not long may it stop at any place, nor at any place is it welcome. Nay, not even at Amachtila, which is full of warlocks, where it harbours they bring food and gear quickly and with fear. Quickly do they give to speed it quickly away, lest the demons who possess it grow angry and destroy. They have strong magic, that pale son of Hela and the woman on the white deck. Sometimes I think her a daughter of Loki, whom Odin chained for her wickedness. And sometimes I think her a daughter of Freya, the mother of gods. But whatever she be, she is very fair and has a great soul. I have no hatred toward her. He lifted the bowl to his lips. And as for how I came here, he went on, that is a short tale enough. Southward I had sailed with the ships of Hagnor and Red Spear. Twelve great dragons had we when we set forth. Southward sailed we through many seas, raiding as we went. Then after long, with six of our twelve dragons left us, we came to the land of the Egyptians, to a city named Alexandria. It was a very great city and full of temples to all the gods in the world, except our gods. It irked us that among all these temples Odin or father had none. It irked us, and we grew wroth. So one night, when we had drunk over deep of the Egyptian wine, six of us set forth to take a temple, cast out its god, and give it to Odin for a home. We came to a temple and entered. It was a dark temple and full of black robes like these on board the ship. When we told them what we meant to do, they buzzed like bees and rushed us like a wolf pack. Many then we slew, shouting, and we would have won that temple for Odin, the six of us fighting in a ring, but a horn blew. Something too many for you? asked Kenton. Not at all, blood brother, said Sigurd. It was a warlock horn, a horn of sleep. It blew sleep through us as the storm wind blows the spray through a sail. It turned our bones to water, and our red swords dropped from hands that could no longer feel their hilts, and down we all dropped, sodden with sleep among the slain. When we awoke, we were in a temple. We thought at the same temple, for it was as dark, and the same black-robed priests filled it. We were in chains, and they whipped us and made us slaves. Then we found we were no longer in the land of the Egyptians, but in a city named Emachtila, on an isle of warlocks set in the sea of what I think a warlock world. Long I slayed for the black robes, I and my comrades, till they dragged me to the ship that had dropped anchor in Emachtila harbour, and here ever since I have bent over my oar, watching their wizardries and fighting to keep my soul from being sucked from me. A horn that poured out sleep, said Kenton, puzzled. But that I do not understand, Sigurd. You will, comrade. Sigurd said grimly. Soon enough you will. Setchel plays it well. Listen, it begins. From behind them a deep, droning, mellow horn note sounded. Low-pitched, vibrant, continuous. It crept into the ears, and seemed to pour through them along every nerve, touching them, caressing them with the soft fingers of the very soul of poppied sleep. The note droned on, dripping sleep. The Viking's eyes were fierce and strained with struggle against slumber. Slowly, slowly the lids closed over them. His hands relaxed, the fingers opened, his body swayed, his head dropped upon his chest, Then, like a man from whom all life is suddenly withdrawn, every muscle flaccid, he slumped down upon the bench. The note droned on. The four slaves at the stroke oar lay with heads on outstretched arms. Fight as hard as Kent and might, he could not thrust away that soft, clinging slumber that pressed inexorably in on him from every side. A numbness crept through his body. Sleep. Sleep. 
Swarms of infinite particles of sleep were drifting through him, drifting with his blood through every vein, along every nerve, clogging his brain. Lower and lower dropped his own lids, and suddenly he could no longer fight. Chains rattling, down against the gird he fell, wrapped in that same impenetrable web of sleep. End of chapter 11, read by Inkel. Chapter 12 of The Ship of Ishtar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Josh J. Barker. The Ship of Ishtar by Abraham Merritt. The Mockery of Shireen. Something deep within Kenton whispered to him to awaken. Something reached down into the abysses of his charmed slumber and drew up to its surface his drugged consciousness. Slowly, his heavy lids began to rise, then stopped, obeying some subtle warning. He looked out through narrowest slits. The chains that bound his wrists to the riveted manacles of the oar were long. He had moved in his sleep, and now lay with head on arm stretched along the back of the low bench. He faced the ivory deck. There, at its edge, looking down upon him, was Shireen. Veils of palest blue, through which the hands of Assyrian maids long dust had woven golden lotuses, draped her breast, coiled round her slender waist, and fell to the delicate sandaled feet. Her black-haired maiden Satalu beside her, she leaned over, scanning him. The wide, clear eyes were shadowed by a pity that held within it half-scornful wonder. His heart leaped to her loveliness. Here was his mate. In this world or any other, this was his woman. And not by any of the standards of his own lost world could she be won. Mistress, he heard Satalu say, he cannot be man of Nurgle, since Nurgle's men have chained him there. No, knew Shireen. No, in that I was wrong. And had he been of Nurgle, never could he have crossed the barrier, nor would Clenef have taunted me, as he did. He is very handsome and young, sighed Satalu, and strong. He fought the priests like a lion lord. Even a cornered rat will fight, answered Shireen, scornful. He let himself be led to his chains like a whipped dog, and he lied to me. He came to me and borrowed plumes, wearing a sword he could not use. Her clenched hands trembled. She beat with them upon her breast. Oh, cried the Lady Shireen, and half of that cry was a sob. Oh, Satalu, I am shamed, liar and coward and slave. Still, he stirs something in my heart that never yet has stirred for man. Oh, I am shamed, I am shamed, Satalu. Lady Shireen, do not weep, Satalu caught the fluttering hands. He may be none of these, how do you know? Perhaps he did speak the truth. How know we what has happened in that world of ours so long lost to us? And he is very handsome, and young. At least, said Shireen, and bitterly, he is a slave. Shush, warned Satalu. Zakel comes. They turned, walking towards Shireen's cabin, out of Kenton's vision. He heard soft steps nearing him, closed his eyes. The overseer paused beside him, evidently scanning him closely, suspiciously. He put his hand on Kenton's head and pushed it from the pillow of his arm. Kenton let it fall, limply, dragging the arm down with it. Satisfied that the spell of the horn still held him, Sakel passed on. The wakening whistle shrilled. There was a stir among the slaves, and Kenton groaned, raised himself, rubbed eyes, and gripped the oar. Exultation was in his heart. There could be no mistaking Shireen's words. He held her. By a slender thread it might be, but still, he held her. And if he was not a slave, when slave he ceased to be. What then? By no slender thread, then, would he hold her. He laughed, but softly, lest Sakel hear. Sigurd looked at him curiously. The sleep horn must have brought you gay dream, Kenton, he murmured. Gay indeed, Sigurd, he answered. The kind of dream that will thin our chains until we can snap them. Odin sent more dreams like it, grunted the Norseman. When Sakel blew the horn again, Kenton had no need of it to send him to sleep for the sharp eyes of the overseer had seen through Sigurd's self-sacrificing stratagem, and he had watched Kenton continually, lashing him when he faltered, or let the whole burden of the oar fall upon the Norseman. His hands were blistered, every bone and muscle ached, 
and his mind lay dulled in his weary body, and thus it was between the next five sleeps. Once he roused himself enough to ask of Sigurd a question that had been going round and round in his brain. Half the rowers in the pit were behind the line that separated Black Deck from Ivory Deck, the line which neither Clanef and his crew nor Shireen and her woman would cross. Yet Sakel roamed at will from one end of that pit to the other, other priests too, for he had seen them. And although he had not seen Clanef or Gigi or the Persian there, he did not doubt that they could come and go if they so wished. Why then did not the black robes swarm up to the farther side and overwhelm the rosy cabin? Why did not Shireen and her woman drop into the pit and lay siege to the ebon cabin? Why did they not launch their javelins, their arrows over the pit of their rowers into the wolf pack of the black priest? It was a warlock ship, the Viking had repeated, and the spell upon it no simple one. The slave who had died had told him that he had been on the ship since the gods had launched her, and that the same unseen mysterious barrier shut off the side of the rowers that rimmed Shireen's deck. Nor could javelin or arrow or other missile other than those hurled by god and goddess penetrate it. Humanly, each opposing camp was helpless against the other. There were other rules too, the slaver told him. For instance, neither Shireen nor Clanef could leave the ship when it hove to in harbour. Shireen's women could. The black priest's men, yes, but not for long. Soon they must return. The ship drew them back. What would happen to them if they did not? The slave had not known, had said that such thing was impossible, that the ship would draw them back. Kenton pondered over all this, as with aching back he pushed and pulled at the oar. Decidedly, these were practical, efficient deities who had doomed the ship, overlooking no detail, he thought, half amused. Well, they had created the game, and certainly they had the right to make that game's rules. He wondered whether Shireen could roam at will from stem to stern when he had conquered the ship. Wondering still, he heard the drone of Sakel's horn begin, and pitched, content, into the bottomless oubliette of sleep it opened. He awoke from the sixth sleep with mind crystal clear, an astonishing sense of well-being, and a body once more free from pain and flexible and vigorous. He pulled at his oar strongly and easily. Strength flows up to you from the sea through blade, even as I foretold, blood brother, grunted Sigurd. Kenton nobbed absently his sharpened mind grappling with the problem of escape from his chains. What went on in the pit and on the ship while the rowers were asleep? What chance would offer then to free himself in the Viking if he could stay awake? If he could stay awake. But how could he close his ears to that horn which poured sleep into them, as the sirens of old poured with their song's fatal fascination into the ears of sailors strayed within their ken? The sirens! The story of crafty Ulysses' adventure with those lethal sea women flashed into his memory. How desire had come upon that wanderer to hear the siren's song, yet no desire to let it draw him to them. How he had sailed into their domain, had filled his oarsman's ears with melted wax, had made them bind him to the mast with open ears, and then, cursing, straining at his bonds, mad with desire to leap into their white arms, had heard their enchanted measures and sailed safe away. That was it. Some way he must shut his ears to the horn. But how? A wind arose. A steady wind that filled the sail and drove the ship through gently cresting waves. Came command to rest oars. Kenton slouched down upon the bench. Sigurd was in one of his silent moods, face brooding, gaze far away, filled with dreams of other days when his dragons cleft the northern ocean, side shields draped and eager for the sword smiting. Kenton dropped his hands upon the silken rags upon his legs. His fingers began, seemingly idly, to unravel their threads, twist and knot them into little silken cylinders. He worked on, the Viking unheeding. Now, two were finished. He palmed one, rubbed as idly the side of his face, and so rubbing slipped the little silken cylinder into an ear. He waited for a time, slipped in the other ear the second plug, the roaring of the wind sank to a loud whispering. Carefully and hurrying, he drew them out, twisted more threads about them. Again he set them in place. Now the wind's roar was only a murmuring, faint and far away. Satisfied, he slipped the silken cylinders under his torn girdle. On sped the ship, 
and after a while the slaves came and dashed their buckets over him and the Viking, brought them food and drink. On the very edge of the sleep horn, Drone Kenton slumped down upon the bench, face on forearms, the silking cylinders hidden under thumbs. Swiftly, he slipped them in his ears. Then he let every muscle go limp. The droning diminished to a faint, hardly heard humming. Even so, a languor crept through him. He fought it. In it was none of that inexorable, slumberous command that saturated the horn's full note. He beat the languor back. The humming ceased. He heard the overseer go by him, looked after him through half-raised lids, saw him ascend the pit steps and pass over the deck to Clemeth's cabin. The black deck was empty. As though shifting in slumber, Kenton rolled over, threw an arm across the back of the bench, rested his head upon it, and through lowered lashes took stock of what lay behind him. The slaves at oars lay sprawled asleep. His gaze rested on the two blacks among the ancient brown-skinned men. Could he trust them to fight with him in the Viking, he wondered. He heard laughter, golden, chiming. To the edge of her deck, black-haired Tatalu beside her, walked Shireen. She seated herself there, unbound her hair, shook the flaming red-gold cloud of it over face and shoulders, sat within it as though within a perfumed silken red-gold tent. Tatalu raised the shining tress, began to comb it. Through that web of loveliness, he felt Shireen's eyes upon him. Involuntarily, his own opened wide, clung to her hidden ones. She gasped, half rose, parted the curtains of her hair, stared at him in wonder. He is awake, she whispered. An equal wonder filled the face of Satalu. Shireen, he breathed. He watched shame creep again into her eyes. Her face grew cold. She raised her head, sniffed daintily. Satalu, she said. Is there not a stronger taint from the pit? Again she tilted her nose. Yes, I am sure there is. Like the old slave market at Uruk, where they brought the new slaves in. I, I notice it not, mistress, faltered Tatalu, pity for him in her look. Why, yes, of course. Shireen's voice was merciless. See, there he sits. A new slave. A strange slave who sleeps with open eyes. Yet he... He looks not like a slave, again faltered her handmaiden. No, questioned Shireen sweetly. What has happened to your memory, girl? What is the badge of a slave? Once more the pitiful glance of the black-haired girl. She did not answer, bent low over the locks of her mistress. A chain and the brand of whips, mocked Shireen. These are the slave's badge, and the new slave has both, in plenty. Still, Kenton was silent beneath her mockery, made no movement, indeed scarce heard her, his burning eyes drinking in her beauty. Ah, but I dreamed one came to me of great words, a bearer of promises, fanning hope in my heart, sighed Shireen. I opened my heart to him in that dream, Satalu, all my heart, and he repaid me with his lies, and his promises were empty, and he was a weakling, and my girls beat him. And now it seems to me that there sits that liar and weakling of my dream with brand of whip upon his back, and weak hands chained. A slave. Mistress, oh mistress, whispered Satalu. But Kenton kept silence, although now her mockery began to sting. And suddenly she arose, thrust hands through shining locks. Satalu, she murmured, would you not think that sight of me would awaken even a slave? That any slave, so he were young and strong, would break his chains? For me? She swayed, turned. Through her thin robes gleamed exquisite, rosy curves of breast and thigh, life, loveliness. She spread wide the nets of her hair, peered through them at him with wanton eyes, preened herself, thrust out a tiny, rosy foot, a dimpled knee. He raised his head recklessly, the hot blood rushing through him. The chains will break, Shireen, he called. I will break them, never fear. And then? And then my girls will beat you as before, she cried, and sped away. He watched her go, pulse beating like drums. He saw her halt, whisper to Satalu. 
The black-haired girl turned, made him a warning gesture. He closed his eyes, dropped head on arm, and soon he heard the feet of Zakel striding down the steps go by him. The waking whistle shrills. Why, if her mockery had been real, had she warned him? End of chapter 12 Read by Josh J. Barker Bristol 7th of September 2022「Chapter 13 of The Ship of Ishtar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Marie Christian. The Ship of Ishtar by Abraham Merritt. Gigi Makes a Vow. Sharain looked down upon him again from her deck. Time had gone by since she had stood there mocking him. Time had gone, but how measured in his own lost world, Kenton had no means of telling, meshed as he was in the ship's timeless web. Sleep after sleep he had lain on his bench, watching for her. She had kept to her cabin, or if she had not, she had kept herself from his sight. Nor had he told the Viking that he had broken the spell of the sleep horn, Segured he trusted heart and soul, yet he was not sure of the Norseman's subtlety, certain that he could feign the charmed slumber as Kenton could. Trust Segured as he did, he could not take that risk. And now again Shireen stood and looked down upon him from the platform close to the emerald mast. The slave slept. There was none at watch on the black deck. There was no mockery now in Shireen's face and when she spoke she struck straight home to the heart of her purpose. "'Whoever you are, whatever you may be,' she said, two things can you do. Cross the barrier, remain awake when the other, slaves, must sleep. You have told me that you can break your chains. Since those two things you can do, I find belief within me that of the third you speak the truth. Unless—' She paused. He read her thought. Unless I lied to you about that as I lied to you before, he said levelly. Well, those were no lies I told you. But go on. If you break your chains, she said, I will give you your sword if with it you will slay Claneth. If you can break your chains, something tells me you can slay Claneth with that sword which certainly is Naboo's own. If you will. Again she paused, searching him with wide eyes. "'Will you?' she asked. He feigned to consider. "'Why should I kill Claneth? he asked at last. "'Why? Why?' scorn tinged her voice. "'Has he not set his chains upon you? Had you whipped? Made you slave? "'Did not Shireen drive me forth with javelins?' he asked. Did not Shireen pour salt in my wounds with her mockery, her laughter? But you lied to me, she cried. Again he feigned consideration. What will this liar, weakling, and slave gain if he kills the black priest for you? He asked bluntly. Gain? She repeated blankly. What will you pay me for it? He said. Pay you? Pay you? Oh! The scorn in her eyes scorched him. You shall be paid. You shall have freedom, the pick of my jewels, all of them. Freedom I shall have when I have slain Claneth, he answered. And of what use to me are your jewels on this cursed ship? You do not understand, she said. The black priest slain, I can set you on any land you wish in this world. In all of them jewels have value. She paused then. And have they no worth in that land from whence you come, and to which unchained it seems you can return whenever danger threatens? Her voice was honeyed poison, but Kenton only laughed. What more do you want? she asked. If they be not enough, what more? You, he said. Me, she gasped incredulously. I give myself to any man, 
For a price? I give myself to you? You whipped dog, she stormed. Never. Now, up to this, Kenton's play with her had been calculated, matchery of her mockery with his own, to dissolve in the acid of her rage that film of contempt for him, which, well he knew, still dwelt within her mind. But now he spoke with wrath as real and hot as hers. No, cried Kenton, no, you'll not give yourself to me. For by God, Charain, I'll take you. He thrust a clenched, chained hand out to her. Master of this ship I'll be, and with no help from you, you who have called me liar and slave, and now would throw me butcher's pay. No, when I master this ship it will be by my own hand, and that same hand shall master you. You threaten me? Her face flamed wrath. You? You dare threaten me? She thrust a hand into her breast, drew out a slender knife, hurled it at him. As though it had struck some adamantine wall, invisible, it clanged, fell to her feet, blade snapped from hilt. She paled, shrank back. One look of hate she threw him, then fled to her cabin. Hate me, jeered Kenton as she ran. Hate me, Shireen. For what is hate but the flame that cleanseth the cup for wine of love? With no soft closing of her door did she go within the rosy cabin. And Kenton, laughing grimly, bent his head over his oar, was soon as sound asleep as the Norseman snoring beside him. There came another time when, as he lay luxuriating in the full new tides of life within him, listening to the rush of waves past the ship, the hum of a warm and scented wind playing through the stays. He heard a stir upon Shireen's balcony, a cooing welcome from her doves. Out upon it she stepped, the handmaiden Satalu at her side. His eyes dwelt upon her sweetly amorous scarlet mouth, the tiny chalice for kisses at her throat. She paid no heed to him, gaze far away upon the mist-girdled waters. She leaned far out over the balcony on white and rounded arms, softly began to sing, and this was Shireen's song. In Babylon red roses blow, all who list may kiss and wear them, wide to all their hearts they throw, every vagrant wind may share them. King or slave may be their lover, any bee above them hover, Sipping from their lips the dew. Roses, roses, wanton roses. I am not like you. The golden voice ceased, and Kenton, sensing well the hidden meaning of her song, reddened with mingled shame and remorse. Again she sang, Honey sweet with heart of fire, Hides a white rose in a bower. Tis the rose of heart's desire. Only one may pluck its flower. Bold and strong must be the lover, Who its wonder may uncover. Pass the wanton roses by, Rose, rose, hidden rose, Rose like you am I. Echoes of her song still sighing she turned, Still with no glance for him Swept back into her cabin. And Kenton was filled with such longing for her That for the first time black despair touched him, after all, could he break his chains? Would ever again he find himself plucked from the ship, spun through the interlaced atoms of these two worlds, and come to rest upon his own? Free, and with power to summon the ship, board it once more. And now he knew what he would do to safeguard himself against chains and black priest, if that chance would but return. But would it return? It must. Resolutely he shook off the despair. Other sleeps went by, and stronger and stronger grew Kenton, with a body like tempered steel and arms and broad shoulders, that now could swing the oar as easily and tirelessly as Sigurd himself. Again he awakened to a stirring and humming through all the ship. On ivory deck and black, 
the ship's folk stood, pointing, talking, gesticulating. A flock of birds, the first he had seen in this strange world, hovered above him. Their wings were shaped like those of great butterflies. Their plumage shone as though lacquered in glowing vermilions and pale golds. From their open beaks came a shining tumult, as of little tinkling bells. Land, the Viking exclaimed. We run into harbor, Kenton. Food and water must be low. There was a brisk wind blowing in the oars at rest. Careless of Zakel's lash, Kenton leaped up on the bench, looked over the bow. The overseer gave no heed, his own eyes intent upon what lay before. It was a sun-yellow isle, high and rounded, and splashed with craters of color like nests of rainbows. Save for these pansy dapplings, the island curved all glowing topaz, from its base in the opalescent shallows of the azure sea to its crest, where feathered trees drop branches like immense panaches of ostrich plumes dyed golden amber. Over and about that golden isle shot flashes of iridescences, from what seemed luminous flying flowers. Closer drew the ship. At the bow the damsels of Charain clustered, laughing and chattering. And upon her balcony was Charain, watching the isle with wistful eyes. Now it was close indeed. Down ran the peacock sail. The ship rolled slowly and more slowly to the shore. Not until the curved prow had almost touched that shore did the steersman shift the rudder and bring the ship sharply about. As they drifted, the plumes of the strange trees swept the deck with long leaves, delicately feathered as those the frost etches on the winter pane. Topaz yellow and sun amber were those leaves. The branches from which they hung glistened as though cut from yellow chrysolite. Immense clusters of flowers dropped from them, lily-shaped, flame scarlet. Slowly, ever more slowly, drifted the ship. It crept by a wide cleft that cut into the heart of the isle. The sides of this veil were harlequined with the cratered colors, and Kenton saw that these were fields of flowers, clustered as though they filled deep circular amphitheaters. The flashing iridescences were birds, birds of every size from smallest dragonflies to those whose wing spread was that of condors in the high Andes. Large and small, on each glittered the lacquered butterfly wings. The isle breathed fragrance. Of green upon it there was none, save for the emerald glintings of the birds. The valley slid behind them, Ever more slowly the feathered trees brushed the deck. The ship slipped into the mouth of a glen, at whose end a cataract dropped rain of pearl into a golden fern pool. There was the rattling of a chain. An anchor splashed. The bow of the ship swung in, nose through the foliage, touched the bank. Over the rail climbed the women of Sharain, upon their heads great baskets, from her balcony, Charain looked after them with deeper wistfulness. The women melted within the flower-spangled boscage. Fainter and fainter came their voices, died away. Charain, chin cupped in white hands, drank in the land with wide and longing eyes. Above her red-gold hair streaming through the silver crescent, a bird hovered. A bird all gleaming emeralds and flashing blues chiming peals of fairy bells. Kenton saw tears upon her cheeks. She caught his gaze, dashed them away angrily. She half turned as though to go, then slipped down woefully behind one of her balcony's tiny blossoming trees, where he could no longer see her weeping. Now her women filed back along the bank, their baskets filled with plunder. Fruits, gourds purple and white, and great clusters of those pods he had eaten when first he had broken fast upon the ship. Into the cabin they trooped, and out again with baskets empty. Time upon time they came and went. At last they bore away skins instead of the woven hampers, water bags which they filled from the pool of the cataract. Time upon time they brought them back, swollen full, upon their shoulders. 
they trooped out once more, burdenless, darted joyously over the rail, doffed their scanty enough robes and plunged into the pool. Like water nymphs they swam and played, the pearly flow caressing, streaming from delicately delicious curves, pale ivory, warm rose, soft olive. They sprang from the pool, wove flower crowns, and with sprays of the fragrant lily blooms in arms, clambered, reluctant, over the side and into the rosy cabin. Now crawled over the rail the men of Claneth. They slipped on and off the ship with their burdens, poured the last water skins into the casks. Again there was stir upon the ship. The chains rattled, the anchor lifted. Up and down flashed the oars, drawing the ship from the bank. Up rose the peacock's sail. The ship veered, caught the wind, swam slowly through the amethystine shallows. Faster swung the sweeps. The golden isle diminished, was a saffron shadow in the mists, vanished. On sailed the ship, and on and on. By what signs or reckonings or to what port, Kenton could not know. Sleep after sleep it sailed. The huge bowl of silver mist whose edge was the horizon contracted or expanded as those mists thickened or thinned. Storms they met and weathered, roaring storms that changed the silver of the mist to lurid copper, amber jet, darkness deeper than night. Sudden storms threaded with lightnings weird and beautiful, lightnings that were like the shatterings of immense prisms, the breakings of rainbows of jewels. Storms that trod on feet of thunder, thunder that was metallic, tintinnabulatory, hurricanes of clashing cymbals following showers of multicolored flame. Steadily strength of the sea poured into Kenton up his oar blade, even as Sigurd had promised, remaking him, hardening him, turning all his body into a machine as finely tempered as a rapier and as flexible. Often he wondered what was happening in that room of his where rested the jeweled bark, the mysterious symbol of this ship on which he sailed, the enigmatic fairy between two worlds. How long had he been away from that room by his own world's time? Between sleep, Sigurd whispered to him Viking tales, sagas unsung, epics of the Norse heroic and forgotten. Steadily their friendship, their brotherhood, grew. Twice the black priest sent for him, questioned him, threatened him, cajoled him, vainly, and each time with blacker, more venomous face had sent him back to his chains. Strife of God and goddess there was none, and Shireen, during the sleep time of the slaves, kept to her cabin. Awake, he could not turn his head to seek her without inviting the bite of Zakel's lash. So often he let the horn of sleep have its way. What used to keep awake while Shireen hid? There came a time when, lying awake, he heard steps coming down the pit's stair. He turned, face against the back of his bench, as though in troubled slumber. The steps paused beside him. Zubran! It was the voice of Gigi. This man has become a young lion. Strong enough! grunted the Persian. It is a pity that his strength be wasted here. Driving this ship from one place of weariness to another is bad. I think as you, said Gigi. Strength he now has. Also he has courage. You remember how he slew the priests. Remember? There was no boredom in Zubran's voice now. Can I forget? By the heart of Rustum, could I forget? It was the first draft of life given me, it seemed, for centuries. I owe him something for that. Also, went on Gigi, he has loyalty where his heart turns. I told you how he shielded with his own back the man who sleeps beside him. I liked him well for that, Zubran. As a gesture, said the Persian, it was magnificent. A trifle floored, perhaps, for perfect taste, but still magnificent. Courage, loyalty, strength, mused the drummer. Then, slowly, a hint of mirth in his voice. And wit, unusual wit, Zubran. 
since he has found a way to shut his ears to the sleep horn, and lies here now wide awake, pretending to us that he is asleep. Kenton's heart stopped, began to beat furiously. How did the drummer know? Did he know? Was it only a guess? Desperately, he strove against quivering nerves, forced his body to remain inert. What? exclaimed the Persian incredulously. Awake? Gigi, you dream. Nay, said Gigi quietly. I have watched him when he saw me not. He is awake, Zubron, listening. Suddenly Kenton felt his paw upon his breast, pressing upon his pounding heart. The drummer chuckled, withdrew the hand. Also, he said approvingly, he has caution. A little he trusts me, but not too much. Nor does he know you well enough as yet, Zubron, to give you any trust at all. Therefore he lies quiet, saying to himself, Gigi cannot really know. He cannot be sure as long as I open not my eyes. Yes, he has caution. But see, Zubron, he cannot keep the blood from stealing up into his face, nor slow his heart to the calm rhythm of sleep. Again he chuckled half maliciously. And there is other proof of this caution, in that he has not told his comrade that the horn has no power over him. Hear him snore. No mistaking that for wakefulness. I like that too. He knows that a secret shared by two runs constant risk of remaining no secret at all. He seems sound asleep to me. Kenton felt the Persian bend down over him doubtfully. His eyelids fought to rise. By sheer will he kept them down, breathing regularly, motionless. How long would they stand there looking at him? How long could he keep up this semblance of sleep under their gaze? At last Gigi broke the silence. Zubron, he said quietly, like you I tire of the black priest and this fruitless strife between Ishtar and Nergal. Yet bound by our vows neither you nor I may come to grips with Claneth, nor may we harm his men. It matters not that by trickery were these vows gotten from us. We made them, and they bind. As long as Nergal's priest rules Nergal's deck, we may not give him battle. But suppose Claneth no longer ruled, that another hand thrust him to his dark master. A mighty hand at that. Where on these seas could we find such a hand? And if found, how persuade it to close on Claneth? jeered the Persian. I think it is here. Kenton felt again the drummer's touch. Courage and loyalty and strength quick wit and caution. He has all these. Besides, he can pass the barrier. By Eremon, that is so, whispered the Persian. Now I would make another vow, said Gigi, a vow in which you would join. If this man's chains were broken, easily then he could pass to Sharain's cabin. Easily now, I think, regain his sword. Well, what then? asked Zubran. He would still have Claneth to meet in all his pack, and we could not help him. No, answered the drummer, but neither would we hinder him. Our vows bind us not to fight for the black priest Zubran. Were I this man, with chains broken and sword regained, I would find way to release this comrade sleeping beside him. He, I think, could keep off the pack while this wolf cub, who is now no longer cub but grown, could match himself against the priest. Well, the Persian began doubtfully, then changed to cheerfulness. I would see him loose, Gigi. At the least, it would give break to this cursed monotony. But you spoke of a vow. A vow for a vow, answered Gigi. If broken were his chains, if he regained his sword, if he met Claneth and we fought not against him at Claneth's side, and if he slew Claneth, would he vow comradeship with you and me, Zubron? I wonder. Why should he make that vow to us? asked Zubron. Unless we also loosed his chains. Exactly, whispered Gigi. For if he made that vow, I would loose them. Hope sprang flaming up in Kenton. 
Cold doubt followed. Was this all a trap? A trick to torment him? He would take no chance. And yet, freedom. Gigi again bent over him. Trust me, wolf, he said low. Vow for vow, if you accept. Look at me. Suddenly doubt fled. The dice were offered him. Were they straight or weighted, he would cast them. He opened his eyes, stared straight for an instant into the twinkling beads of jet so close. Then he closed them tight, resumed his slow breathing, his semblance of deepest slumber. And Gigi rose from him, laughing. He heard the two move away up the pit's steps. Freedom again. Could it be true? And when would Gigi, were it true and no trap, when would Gigi lose his chains? Long he lay between fiery hope and chilling doubt. Could it be true? Freedom and Sharain. End of chapter 13. Chapter 14 of The Ship of Ishtar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ship of Ishtar by Abraham Merritt. The chains are loosed. Not long did Kenton have to wait. Hardly had the faint hum of the sleep horn died than he felt a touch on his shoulder. He thought it was the kell and lay limp. Long fingers twitched his ears, raised his eyelids. He looked into the face of Gigi. He pulled out the little silken cylinders that shut off the compelling slumber of the horn. So that is how you did it. Gigi examined them with interest. He squatted down beside Kenton. Wolf, he said, I have come to have a talk with you, so that you may know Zubrin and me a little better. Perhaps see more clearly the road on which soon your feet may be set. I would sit here beside you, but some of those cursed priests may come prowling around. Therefore, in a moment, I shall seat myself on Zakel's stool. When I have done so, turn you around facing me, taking that highly deceptive attitude I have so often watched you assume. He stepped up on the bench, scanning both decks. We will have plenty of time. He squatted again on the bench. Zubran is with Clanath, arguing about the gods. Zubran, although sworn to Nergal, thinks him a rather inferior copy of Ahriman, the Persian god of darkness. He's also convinced that this whole matter of warfare between Nergal and Ishtar for the ship lacks not only originality and ingenuity, but taste. Something, indeed, that his own gods and goddesses would not do. If they did, would do much better. This angers Clanath, which greatly rejoices Zubran. Once more he arose and looked about him. However, he went on, this time he is doing it to keep Clanath and especially Zakel away while we talk, since Clanath leans a great deal upon Zakel in these arguments. I have told them that I cannot bear their talk, and that I will watch on Zakel's seat until it is finished. And it will not be finished until I return. For Zubran is clever, oh, very clever, and he expects our talk to lead, ultimately, to permanent relief of his boredom. He glanced slightly at the ivory deck. So do not fear, wolf. He swayed up on his dwarfed legs. Only as I go, slip sideways and keep your eyes on me. I will give you warning if warning is needed. He waddled away, climbed into the overseer's seat. Kenton, obeying him, turned sleepily, rested arm on bench and head on arm. Wolf, said Gigi suddenly, is there a shrub called the Chilkor in the place from whence you came? Kenton stared at him, struck dumb by such a question. 
yet Gigi must have some reason for asking it. Had he ever heard of such a shrub? He searched his memory. Its leaves are about so large. Gigi parted fingertips for inches three. It grows only upon the edge of the desert, and it is rare, sorrowfully rare. Look you, perhaps you know it by another name. Perhaps this will enlighten you. You bruise the buds just before they open. Then you mix them with sesame oil and honey and a little burned ivory and spread it like paste over your head. Then you rub and rub and rub, so and so and so, he illustrated vigorously upon his bald and shining pate. And after a while, he said, the hair begins to sprout, like grain under the rains of spring it grows, until soon, lo, naked dome is covered. Instead of the light flying off affrighted from shining dome, it plays within new hair. And once more the man who was bald is beautiful in the eyes of woman. By Nadak of the goats, by Tanis, the dispenser of delights, cried Gigi with enthusiasm. That paste grows hair. How it does grow hair. Upon a melon it would grow it. Yes, even those planks rightly rubbed by it would sprout hair like grass. You are sure you do not know it. Struggling with his stark amaze, Kenton shook his head. Well, said Gigi sorrowfully, all this the chokor buds can do, and so I search for them. Here he sighed mightily. Who would once more be beautiful in woman's eyes? He sighed again. Then one by one he flecked the backs of the sleeping slaves with Zakel's whip, even the back of Sigurd. Yes, he said, yes, they sleep. His black eyes twinkled on Kenton, the slit mouth grinned. You wonder, he said, why I talk of such trivial matters as shrubs and hair and bald pates while you lie chained. Well, Wolf, these matters are far from trivial. They brought me here. And were I not here, would you have the hope of freedom, think you? Ah, no, said Gigi. Life is a serious matter. Therefore all parts of it must be serious, and therefore no part of it can be trivial. Let us rest for a moment, Wolf, while you absorb that great truth. Again, one by one, he flecked the backs of the sleeping slaves. Well, Wolf, he went on. Now I shall tell you how I came aboard this ship because of the Chilkor, its effects on hair, and because of my bald pate. And you shall see how your fortune rests upon them. Wolf, when I was but a child in Nineveh, girls found me singularly attractive. Gigi, they would cry as I passed by them. Gigi, little love, little darling, kiss me, Gigi. Gigi's voice was ludicrously languishing. Kenton, forgetting his plight, could not restrain laughter. You laugh, Wolf, observed the drummer. Well, that makes us understand each other better. His eyes twinkled impishly. Yes, he said. Kiss me, they cried. And I would kiss them, because I found them all as singularly attractive as each found me. And as I grew, this mutual attraction increased. You have no doubt noticed, said Gigi complacently that I am an unusual figure of a man, but as I grew out of adolescence, my greatest beauty was, perhaps, my hair. It was long and black and ringleted, and it fell far over my shoulders. I perfumed it and cared for it, and the tender little vessels of joy who loved me would twine their fingers in it when I lifted them upon my head or when my head was on their knees. They joyed in it even as I. And then I had a fever. When I recovered, all my beautiful hair was gone. He paused to sigh again. There was a woman of Nineveh who pitied me. She it was who anointed my head with the chilcor paste, told me how to make it, showed me the growing shrubs. After years of uh, mutual attraction, I had fever again, and again my hair vanished. I was in Tyre, then, Wolf, and made what haste I could to return to Nineveh. 
When I did return, the kindly woman was dead, and a sandstorm had covered the spot where she had pointed out to me the Chilcor shrubs. He sighed prodigiously. Kenton, amused and fascinated by his tale as he was, could not forbear a suspicious glance after that melancholy exhalation. It seemed overdone. Then, before I could search further, went on Gigi hurriedly, word came to me that one who loved me, a princess wolf, was on her way to Nineveh to see me. Shame was mine and anguish. I could not meet her with a bald pate, wolf, for no one loves a bald man. Nobody loves a fat man, grinned Kenton. He had spoken, it seems, in his own tongue, for the drummer apparently had not understood. What did you say? he asked. I said, answered Kenton gravely, that for one whose excellencies are as great as yours, the loss of your hair should have been of no more consequence to a woman than the falling of one feather from a pet bird. That is a fine tongue of yours, remarked Gigi stolidly. It can say so much in so few words. Well, he continued, I was distressed indeed. I could have hidden, but I feared my will would not be strong enough to keep me hid. She was a very lovely princess, Wolf. Besides, I knew that if she found out I was in Nineveh, as find out she surely would, she would rout me out. She was a fair woman, Wolf. And this is the one difference between the fair woman and the dark, that the latter wait for you to come to them, but the former search for you. And I could go to no other city to hide, for in each of them there were other women who admired me. What was I to do? Why didn't you get a wig? asked Kenton, interested now in Gigi's tale to the extent of forgetting entirely where he was. I told you, Wolf, that they loved to thread their fingers through my locks, answered Gigi severely. Could any wig stay in place under such treatment? Not when the women were such as loved me. No, no. I will tell you what I did. And here is where you will see how my lost hair and you are entangled. The high priest of Nergal in Nineveh was a friend of mine. I went to him and asked him first to work a magic that would plant my head afresh with hair. He was indignant, said that his art was not to be debased for such a common purpose. It was then, Wolf, that I began to have my suspicions of the real power of these sorcerers. I had seen this priest perform great magic. He had raised phantoms that had raised my hair when I had it. How much easier, then, ought it to have been for him to have raised my hair without the trouble of raising the phantoms, too? I suggested this. He grew more indignant, said that he dealt with gods, not barbers. But now I know better. He could not do it. I made the best of the matter, however, and asked him to put me for a while where my princess could not find me and where, weak-willed, I could not go to her. He smiled, Wolf, and said he knew just the place. He inducted me as an acolyte to Nergal and gave me a token that he said would ensure me recognition and goodwill from the one he named Claneth. Also, he sealed me with certain vows not to be broken. I took them cheerfully, thinking them but temporary, and his friend Claneth, the high priest of some hidden temple where I would be safe. I went to sleep that night trustfully, happy as a child. I awakened Wolf here. It was a sorry jest, muttered Gigi angrily, and a sorry jest would it be for that Ninevite priest if I knew the way back to him. And here I have been ever since, he added briskly, barred by my acolytage to Nergal from crossing to that other deck where there is a little vessel of joy named Satalu that I would fain take within my hands, barred by my vows from slaying Clanath barred by other vows from leaving the ship wherever it may touch for food and gear, since it was sanctuary I asked from which I could not go, nor my princess come to me. By Tiamat of the Abyss, I got the sanctuary I asked, he exclaimed ruefully enough, and by Bel, who conquered Tiamat, as wary of the ship and its fruitless strife as Zubran himself. 
But were I not here, he added, as by afterthought, who could loose you from your chains? By shrub and lack of hair, an amorous princess and my vanity, these brought me on the ship to set you free when you came. Of such threads do the gods weave our destinies. He leaned forward, all malice gone from twinkling eyes, a grotesque tenderness on the frog-like mouth. I like you, wolf, he said simply. And do you like Gigi a little better now? There was wistfulness in the question, wistfulness and utter sincerity. Kenton's heart went out to him without reserve. I like you, Gigi. There were tears in his eyes. Greatly, indeed, do I like you, and trustfully, but Zubrin. Have no doubts about Zubrin, snapped Gigi. He, too, was tricked upon this ship and is even more eager than I to be free. Some day he will tell you his story as I have mine. Ho ho, laughed the drummer. Ever seeking the new, ever tiring of the known, is Zubrin. And this was his fate, to be shot into a whole new world and find it worse than his old. Nay, wolf, fear not Zubrin. With shield and sword will he stand beside you, until he tires even of you. But even then he will be loyal. Suddenly he grew solemn, kept unwinking gaze on Kenton, searching, it seemed, his soul. Consider well, wolf, he whispered. The odds are all against you. We too may not help you as long as Clanath is lord of his deck. It may be that you cannot free the long-haired one beside you. You have Clanath to face and twenty of his men, and it may be Nergal. And if you lose, death for you, wolf, and only after long, long torture. Here, chained to your oar, you are at least alive. Consider well. And Kenton, without hesitation, answered him, held out his prisoned wrists. When will you loose my chains, Gigi? was all he said. Gigi's face lighted, his black eyes blazed, he sprang upright, the jet loops on his pointed ears dancing. Now, he shouted, by Sin, the father of gods, by Shamash, his son, and by Bel, the smiter, now. He thrust his hands between Kenton's wrists and the great circlet of bronze that bound it, pulled it apart as though it had been made of putty. With those same prodigiously long fingers, he broke the locks of the manacles on Kenton's wrists. Run free, wolf, he whispered. Run free, but craftily. And when you bite, bite deep. With never a look behind him, he waddled slowly to the pit's steps and up them. Slowly, Kenton stood upon his feet. His chains dropped from him. He looked down at the sleeping Viking. How could he unfasten his links? How, if he could unfasten, awaken him before Zakel came running down among the slaves? Swiftly, he thought, a plan formed. If he could pick the locks that held Sigurd, he could put back his own broken chains upon himself. Whisper to the Viking, after the waking whistle shrilled what he had done, what had been done for him. Then, at the right moment, the pair of them could rise, rush the overseer, slay him and leap for Shireen's deck. For it came to him that Sigurd, vowed as little either to Nergal or Ishtar as himself, could pass as easily as he the barrier that held all others back. Again he looked around him. At the foot of the overseer's high stool lay a shining knife, long-bladed, thin-bladed. Dropped there by Gigi for him? He did not know. But he did know that with it he might pick the Viking's locks. He took a step toward it. How long he was taking the second step. And there was a mist before his eyes. Through that mist, the sleeping forms of the oarsmen wavered, were like phantoms, and now he could no longer see the knife. He rubbed his eyes, looked down on Sigurd, 
He was a wraith, his outlines nebulous, fog-like. He looked at the sides of the ship. They melted away even as he sought them. He had a glimpse of sparkling turquoise sea. And then it became vaporous, was not, ceased to be. And now Kenton floated for an instant in thick mist shot through with silvery light. The light snapped out. He hurtled through a black void, filled with a tumult of vast winds that shrieked and roared but never touched him. On and on, like a meteor, he flew through that black void. The blackness snapped out. Through his closed lids he saw light, and he was no longer falling. He stood, rocking upon his feet. He opened his eyes. Once more he was within his own room. Outside hummed the traffic of the avenue, punctuated by blasts of auto horns. Kenton rushed over to the jeweled ship. Except for the slaves, on it was but one little figure, one toy. A mannequin who stood halfway down the pit steps, mouth open, whip at feet, stark astonishment in every rigid line. Zakel, the overseer. Kenton poked him with a contemptuous figure a toy. He looked down into the slave pit. They lay asleep, oars in rests. He touched the bent head of Sigurd lovingly. With fingertips tried to move the chains on the empty seat on the bench beside the Norseman. The empty chains that fell from the oar. They were immovable, all, all immovable. Toy chains, toy oars, Sigurd a toy, Zakel a toy, his adventures a dream. So his mind, back in its own familiar environment, told him. That other part of him, which accepted the ship as reality, lying dazed with swift flight within him. And suddenly he caught sight of himself in the long mirror, stood wondering before it. For what he saw was no more the Kenton who had been born out of the room upon the breast of the inrushing mystic sea. Mouth had hardened, eyes grown fearless, falcon bright. Over all his broadened chest the muscles ran, not bulging, bound, but graceful, flexible, and steel hard. He flexed his arms, and the muscles ran rippling along them. He turned, scanned his back in the mirror. Scars covered it, healed teeth marks of the lash, the lash of Zakel. Zakel, the toy. No toy had made those scars. No oars of toy had brought into being those muscles. And suddenly all of Kenton's mind awoke. Awoke and was filled with shame, with burning longing, with seething despair. What would Sigurd think of him when he awakened and found him gone? Sigurd, with whom he had sworn blood brothership. What would Gigi think? Gigi, who had made vow for vow with him and, trusting him, had broken his chains. And... Shireen. Fresh food for her mockery, her contempt, this. A frenzy shook him. God, he must get back. Get back before Sigurd or Gigi or Shireen knew that he was no longer on the ship. Had fled again to that place. What was it, Shireen had said, the place he fled when peril threatened. How long had he been away? As though in answer, a clock began chiming. He counted. Eight strokes. Two hours of his own time had passed while he was on the ship. Two hours only? And in those two hours, all these things had happened? His body changed to this? Then, in the two minutes he had been in the room, what had happened on the ship? Did they now not know that he was gone? Shireen and Sigurd, Gigi and the Persian, were holding him, liar, coward, traitor. He must get back. He must. Stop. What had Gigi said? Go craftily. He thought of the battle before him. Could he take his automatics with him when he went back, if he could go back? With them he could match any sorceries of the Black Priest but they were in another room, in another part of the house. Again, he looked at himself in the glass. 
If his servants saw him thus, they would not know him. How could he explain? Who would believe him? And they might tear him away, away from this room where the ship lay, this room that held his only doorway back into Shireen's world. He dared not risk it. Then, swift into his brain, sprang the plan. He threw himself upon the floor, grasped the golden chains that hung from the ship's bow. So thin they were, so thin, on this the ship of jeweled toys. He clenched them tight, then threw his whole will upon the ship, summoning it, commanding it. And suddenly the golden chains stirred within his grasp. They swelled. He felt a tearing wrench that wrung from him a groan of agony. Thicker grew the chains. They were lifting him, lifting him, again the dreadful wrenching, tearing at every muscle, nerve, and bone. His feet swung free. The vast winds howled around him for a heartbeat only. They were gone. In their place was the rushing of wind-driven waves. He felt the kisses of their spray. Kenton opened his eyes. Beneath him was a racing azure sea. High above him curved the scimitared prow of the ship of Ishtar. But not the ship of jeweled toys, no, the ensorcelled ship that sailed the strange world, the ship on which blows were real and death lurked, death that even now might be watching him poised to grapple. The living ship that had held the promise of Shireen. The chain he clutched passed up the side of the bow into a hawser port painted like a great eye between the bowward wall of her cabin and the curved prow. Behind him the great oars rose and fell. He could not be seen from them. The oarsmen's backs were toward him, and the oar ports were besides covered with strong leather, through which the shanks slipped. Shields to protect the rowers from waves dashing past these ports. Nor, under the hang of the hull, as he was, could he be seen from the black deck. Slowly, silently, hand over hand, pressing his body as close to the hull as he could, he began to creep up the chain up to Shireen's cabin, up to that little window that opened into her cabin from the closed bit of deck beneath the great scimitar. Slowly, more slowly, he crept, pausing every few links to listen, reached at last the hawser port, threw a leg over the bulwark, and dropped upon the little deck. He rolled beneath the window, flattened himself against the cabin wall, hidden now from every eye upon the ship, hidden even from Shireen, should she peer through that window, crouched there, waiting. End of chapter 14「The chains up which he had climbed passed through a hawser port, wound around a crude windlass, and were fastened to a thin double hook that was more like a grappling iron than anchor. Near it lay a similar hook, and on the starboard bow was another windlass with chains running from it through another port. On each bulwark were deep metal-lined grooves over which the lowering link slid. Evidently, Although control of steering gear, mast, and rower's pit was in the hands of the black priest, the women of Shireen looked after Anchorage. He noted with some anxiety a door leading out of the cabin's farther side, the portion that housed her warrior maids. But it was not likely, he thought, that any would come out as long as the ship was under sail and oar. At any rate, he would have to take that risk. Through the open window above him he could hear the hum of voices. Then that of Shireen came to him, pitched high and clear, and bitter. He broke his chains, even as he had promised, and then fled. But, mistress, it was Satalu. 
Where could he go? He came not here. How know you that Claneth did not take him, that he is not even now feeding his deviltries? No mistaking Claneth's wrath, answered Charain. No mistaking the scourging he gave Zakel. Both were real, Satalu. So the black priest had scourged Zakel, had he? Well, that at any rate was good news. But what puzzles them most is that he fled while the horn of sleep still held the slaves in thrall, mused Satalu. We know it held him not in thrall, answered Shirain sharply. Nay, Satalu, why argue? He had grown strong, he broke his chains, he fled, and thereby proved himself the coward I called him, and hoped he was not, she added softly. Did I not promise him his sword if he broke chains and came to me? But he did not promise to come and ask you for it, said Satalu slyly. I think he said he would come and take it, and... Be silent, girl. Shireen's voice was wrathful. Remind me not of that, if you would not be whipped. There was silence in the cabin. Then Shireen spoke again, softly, sorrowfully. Forgive me, Satalu. You know I would not whip you. But he will not come again, either to ask or to take. Then, after another silence, I am weary. Luarda, watch outside the door. You others to your cabin to sleep, or what you will. Satalu, brush my hair a little and then leave me. Another silence, a longer one. Then Satalu's voice. Mistress, you are half asleep. I go. Kenton waited, but not long. The sill of the window was about as high above the anchor deck as his chin. He raised himself gently, peered within. His gaze rested first on the shrine of the luminous gems, the pearls and pale moonstones, the milky curdled crystals. He had the feeling that it was empty, tenantless, there were no flames in the seven little crystal basins. He heard a woman sobbing. He looked down. The head of the wide divan of ivory with its golden arabesques was almost beneath him. Upon it lay Charain, face down upon its cushions, clothed only in one thin silken veil and the floods of her red-gold hair, and weeping, weeping bitterly, broken-heartedly weeping like any woman with bruised heart, white shoulders heaving with the deep sobbing she sought to stifle in her cushions. Weeping for him? He hardened his heart against her, fought down fierce desire to go to her and take her in his arms, comfort her. A gleam of sapphire, a glint of steel caught his eyes. It was his sword, the sword of Nabu the sword he had vowed he would not take from her hands, would take unaided with his own. It hung upon a low rack on the wall just above her head, so close that she need but reach up a hand to grasp it. He drew back, waited impatiently for her weeping to cease. Love for her, or passion, he had in full. But search his heart now as he might. No pity. And soon her sobbing lessened, died away, and after another while of waiting he slowly thrust his head again through the window, looked down upon her. She lay asleep, face turned toward the cabin door, tears still on the long lashes, but the fair breast rising and falling softly in the measured respiration of slumber. The window was about three feet square, its casement opening inward. Kenton gripped the sill, drew himself softly up until shoulders and breast were within. Then he bent over until his waist rested on the ledge. Now his hands touched the softnesses of one of the rugs upon the floor. Lithely, noiselessly as a serpent, he slid down, gripping the sill with his insteps. Slowly, like a tumbler, he brought his legs down, lay prone full length at the head of Charain's bed. Again he waited. Her measured breathing did not change. He drew himself up on his feet, 
Cat-like, he slipped to the door that lay between this cabin and that of the warrior maids. There was a low murmuring of voices there. He saw a bar that, lowered, slipped into a metal clutch on the other side, securing it. Noiselessly, he dropped it, fastened it. Those cats were caged, he thought, grinning. He glanced over the cabin. Upon a low stool lay a small piece of silk. Over a settle, a long one, scarf-like. He picked up the small piece and rolled it deftly into a serviceable gag. He took the long piece and tested it. It was heavy and strong, just what he needed, he reflected, but not enough. He slipped to a wall, unhooked a similar hanging. He tiptoed over to Shireen's bed, stood there for a moment, shaken by her loveliness. She stirred uneasily, as though she felt his eyes on her, as though she were awakening. Kenton acted. Before she could raise her lids, he had opened her mouth, thrust the silken gag within. Then throwing himself over her, holding her down by sheer weight, he jerked up her head, wound the scarf tightly around her mouth, tied it. As swiftly, he raised her from the hips and wound the balance of the scarf round her arms, pinioning them to her sides. Eyes blazing with wrathful recognition, outrage, desperation, she tried to roll from beneath him, struck up at him with her knees. He shifted his weight, lay across her thighs, dexterously bound knees and ankles with the second scarf that he had torn from the wall. Now she lay motionless, glaring at him, hate devils in her gaze. He sent her a kiss, mockingly. She turned, tried to throw herself upon the floor. Noiselessly still, he took other hangings, wrapped her round and round with them, and finally he passed a pair of heavy ones under and over the bed, bound her fast with them to the divan. Heedless of her now, he walked to the outer door. In some way he must get the handmaiden she called Luarda within the cabin, make her as helpless as her mistress, and as silent. He opened the door, the merest slit, peered through it. She sat close beside it, back turned to him, gaze upon the black deck. How could he lure her in? He tiptoed away, found another small piece of silk, snatched from the wall another hanging. The small piece he fashioned into another gag. Then he opened the door as before, placed his lips to the crack, pitched his voice high and softly, as femininely as possible, called to her. Luarda! The mistress wants you, quick! She leaped to her feet. He shrank back, pressing himself against the wall close beside the door frame. Unsuspiciously, she opened the door, stepped within it, and paused for an instant, open-mouthed, at the sight of the Lady Charain, bound and helpless. That instant was all Kenton needed. One arm was round her neck, throttling her. With his free hand, he thrust the gag into her mouth, in the same moment closed the door with his foot. The girl in his arms struggled like a young panther. He managed to keep her mouth closed until he had wound the lower part of her face and her neck with the hanging. Her hand swept up, clawing him. She strove to wind her legs around his, throwing him. He drew the silk tighter around her neck, strangling her. When her struggles grew feeble, he swiftly bound her arms to her side. He laid her on the floor and pinioned, as he had Charain's, her ankles and knees. Helpless as her own mistress now she lay. He picked her up, carried her over to the divan, rolled her under it. Not till then did he reach up and take down his sword, and as before he felt strength flow through it into him. He stood before Charain, poising it, handling it, thrusting and cutting with it. There was no fear in the burning eyes that stared up at him. Rage enough and to spare was there, but no fear. And with an oddly satisfying glow he realized it, neither contempt nor shame. No, wrath-filled as were her eyes, he seemed to see in them wonder, hope. And Kenton laughed low, bent over her and pressed his lips to her own gagged and bound ones. He kissed each wrathful eye. And now, Shireen, he laughed, I go to take the ship, without your help. 
And when I have taken it, I will come back and cut your bonds and take you. Yes, Lady Honeysweet, with or without your help. Take you. He walked to the door, opened it softly, swept gaze over the ship. End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of the Ship of Ishtar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Michael Broomhill. The Ship of Ishtar by Abraham Merritt. Master of the Ship. Upon the black deck squatted Gigi, forehead resting on the edge of the serpent drum, long arms trailing disconsolately down its sides. There was a forlornness about the drummer that made Kenton want to shout out to him. It was an impulse to which the sight of Zakel's head put speedy check. He could see just the top of it over the low rail between Charain's deck and the rower's pit. But he could hear the vicious crack of the lash as it struck now here, now there. He crouched low, until the head was out of sight, knowing that in that position Zakel could not see him. He knotted the sword in his girdle. On hands and knees he crept out of the cabin door, closed it softly behind him. Suddenly he saw that there was a window in the place where her women slept. He had not remembered that, but there was no door. They must pass through Charain's cabin to gain the deck, unless they slipped through the window. If they suspected something amiss with their mistress, found the door barred, undoubtedly they would come through the window. Well, he would have to take his chances on that, only hope that he could get most of the work ahead of him done before they were aroused. And if he could surprise the black priest in his den, strike swiftly and silently, then he and the Viking could make short work of the rest, and the women do what they pleased. They could neither help nor hinder. It would be too late. He flattened himself to the deck, wriggled beneath the window, listened. There was no sound of voices now. Slowly raising himself, he saw that from this point the overseer was hidden from him by the mast. Keeping a cautious eye on the disconsolate Gigi, he stood up and peered within. There were eight girls there, lying asleep, some pillowed on each other's breasts, some curled up on the silken cushions. He reached in a hand, closed the window noiselessly. Any sounds from without would be at least a little more deadened. Again he lay flat and squirmed along the side of the cabin to the starboard rail. He slipped over it. He hung for a moment, fingers gripping the rail top feet feeling for the chain that stretched below. Only half the distance he must travel to put the mass between himself and Zakel did that chain go. For that distance he swung along it, fingers having released rail to clutch links. When he came to its end, he raised himself, caught the rail again, and swung along it swiftly hand over hand. Now the mast was directly in front of him. He had reached the spot from which he had planned to strike his first blow. He chinned himself, and even as he had entered Shireen's cabin, he streamed over the rail like a snake and lay flat against the bulwarks until breath came once more easily. He was in plain sight of Gigi, and as he lay, Gigi's head came up with a jerk from his drum. His eyes stared straight into Kenton's own. The ugly face broke into a thousand wrinkles of amazement, then instantly became indifferent, immobile. He yawned, got upon his feet, then, hand over eyes, peered intently over to the port side, as though he had sighted something far away upon the sea. By Nergal, but Clanath must know of this, he said distinctly, then waddled quickly as dwarfed legs would let him over to the black cabin. Kenton wriggled over to the edge of the pit. He had glimpse of Zakel standing upon his platform stool, peering as intently as had Gigi over the sea, searching for whatever it was that seemingly had so aroused the drummer's interest. 
he realized Gigi's stratagem took instantly the move he had opened for him. Kenton dropped into the pit. One leap he took and was beside the mast. The overseer turned sharply. With instant recognition of his danger, Zakel opened mouth to yell and swept hand down to belt where Long Ponyard was sheltered. But the sword of Kenton hissed through the air and through his neck. The sheared head of Zakel leaped from his shoulders, mouth stretched open, eyes glaring. For three heartbeats, the body of Zakel stood upright, blood spouting from the severed arteries, hand still gripping at the dagger. The body of Zakel fell, splashing Kitten with its life streams as it dropped. From the benches of the oarsmen came no sound, no outcry. They sat, blades drooped, staring. He groped in Zakel's belt for the overseer's keys, the keys that would unlock the manacles from Sigurd's wrists, unloose the metal belt from around his waist. He found them, snatched them loose, tore the dagger from Zakel's stiffening fingers, and raced down the narrow passageway to the Viking. Brother, babbled the Norseman, half incoherent. I thought you gone, blood brotherhood forgotten, and by Odin what a blow! The dog's head leaped from his shoulders as though Thor had struck it with his hammer. Quiet, Sigurd, quiet, Kenton was working with desperate haste among the keys, trying to find those which would fit Sigurd's fetters. No questioning now. Now we stand together, you and I, fight for the ship, hell damn these keys. If we can reach Claneth's den before alarm is raised, stand between me and the priests. Leave the black priest to me. Touch not Gigi the drummer, nor Zubran the redbeard. They cannot help us, but they have given vow not to fight against us. Remember that, Sigurd. Ah, the manacles at the Viking's wrist clicked and opened. The lock on the metal belt clicked open too. He shook his hands free of the chains, reached down and wrenched away the cincture. Sigurd stood upright, flaxen mane streaming in the wind, clenched hands lifted high. Free, he shouted, free! Sigurd, breathed Kenton, and thrust his hands against the shouting mouth. Be silent, Sigurd. Do you want the pack down on us before we have a chance to move? He pressed the dagger of Zakel into his hand. Use that, he said. It is all you have until you win some better weapon. That, laughed the Viking. A woman's toy. Nay, blood brother, Sigurd can do better than that. He dropped the dagger. He gripped the oar, lifted it out of the thole pins from which it swung, he bent forward sharply, bringing its shaft with terrific force against the side of the port. There was a sharp crackling, a rending of wood. He drew himself back, bringing the oar with the same force against the opposite side of the port. There was another crackling. Then Sakur drew it in, broken squarely in the middle, a gigantic club all of ten feet long. He gripped it by the splintered end, whirled it round his head, the chains and the dangling manacles, spinning like weighted chains of some ancient battle mace. Come, barked Kenton, and stooped to pick up the dagger. And now from all the pit came clamor, the slaves straining at their bonds and crying to be freed. Free us, they shrieked. Loose our chains. We will fight with you. And from Shireen's deck came the shrilling of women. Out of the window poured their warrior maids. No chance now to surprise the black priest. No chance but a battle, fang and claw, his sword and the great club of Sigurd against Klanath and his pack, and against what else he did not know. Quick, Sigurd, he shouted. To the deck. I first, blood brother, grunted Sigurd. Shield to you. He pushed Kenton aside, rushed past him. Before he could reach the foot of the stairway, its top was filled with priests, white-faced, snarling, swords in their hands and short-stabbing spears. Kenton's foot fell on something that rolled away from beneath it, sending him to his knees. He looked straight down into the grinning face of Zakel. His severed head it was that had tripped him. He lifted it by the hair, swung it round and hurled it straight at the face of the foremost priest at the stairway top. It caught that priest a glancing blow, fell among them, then rolled and bounced away. They cried out, they shrank back from it. Before they could muster again, the Viking was up the stairs and charging them, oar club flinging like a flail. And at his heels came Kenton, making for the black cabin's door. 
There were eight of the black robes facing them. They realized the meaning of Kenton's move, streamed forward to block it. The Norseman's oar struck, shattering the skull of one like an eggshell. Before he could raise it again, two of the priests had darted in upon him, stabbing, thrusting with their spears. Kenton's sword swept down, bit deep into the bone of an arm whose point was touching Sigurd's breast. With quick upward thrust, he ripped the same priest open from navel to chin. The Viking, swift as thought, dropped one hand from the oar, caught the half of the second spear, twisted it out of the black robe's grip, and ran it through his heart. Down went another under bite of Kenton's blade. But now other priests came streaming from every passageway and corner of the black deck, armed with swords and spears and bearing shields. Out they streamed, screaming to their master, and out of the black deck rushed Claneth, roaring, a great sword in hand. Behind him were Gigi and the Persian. The black priest came straight on, charging like a bull through the half-ring of his servitors. But Gigi and the Persian slipped over to the serpent drum, stood there watching. Yet even in that short glimpse, Kenton saw that the Persian's eyes were blazing with battle light, his hands running over the daggers at his belt, sheathing and unsheathing his scimitar. Out of the pit was coming one long, sustained shrieking of the slaves. For an instant, the black priest stood towering over Kenton, the phosphorescence in his pale eyes turned now to leaping hell flames. Then he struck downward, a lightning blow designed to cleave Kenton from shoulder to hip. But Kenton was not there when the blow fell. Swifter than the sword of Claneth, he had leaped aside, thrust out his own blade, felt it bite deep into the black priest's side. Claneth howled and fell back. Instantly, his acolytes streamed in between him and the besieged pair. They circled them. Back to back, brother, shouted the Viking. Kenton heard the great club hum, saw three of the black robes mowed down by it as by some giant flail. With sweep and thrust, he cleared away the priest, ravening at him. Now the fighting had carried them close to the drum. He saw the Persian, scimitar unsheathed and held by rigid arm, and he was cursing sobbing, quivering like a hound held in leash and held back from his quarry. While Gigi, froth upon the corners of wide open mouth, face contorted, stood with long arms outstretched, hands trembling, shaking with that same eagerness. Desire, Kenton knew, to join with him and Sigurd in that battle, held back by mysterious vows not to be broken. And suddenly Gigi pointed downward. Kenton followed the gesture, saw a priest crawling, sword in hand, and almost within reach of the Viking's feet. One sweep of that sword against Sigurd's legs, and he was done for, hamstrung. Forgetting his own defense, he leaned forward, cut downward. The head of the creeping priest jumped from his shoulders, rolled away. But as he straightened, he saw Claneth again above him, poised to strike. The end, thought Kenton. With one last instinctive movement, he dropped flat, rolled away from the falling edge. He had not counted on the Viking. Sigurd had seen all that swift byplay. He swept his oar, held horizontally, in a gigantic punch. It crashed into Claneth's chest. The sword stroke fell short. The black priest was hurled backward, half falling for all his strength and massive bulk. Gigi, Zabran, to me, he howled. Before Kenton could rise, two priests were on him, clawing him, stabbing at him. He released his grip on his sword, drew the poniard of Zakel. He thrust upward, felt a body upon him stiffen, then collapsed like a pricked balloon. Felt, too, the edge of a sword slice into his shoulder. He struck again, blindly, was drenched with sudden flood of blood. He heard a bubbling whispering, and the second weight was gone. He gripped his sword, staggered upright. In one swift glance, he saw that of all Claneth's wolf pack, not more than half a dozen were on their feet, and Claneth himself was one of these. They had drawn back, out of reach of the Viking's oar. Sigurd stood, drawing in great breaths, and the black priest was gasping too, holding his broad chest where the oar of Sigurd had struck. At his feet was a little pool of blood, dripping from where the sword of Naboo had pierced him. Gigi, Zupran, he panted. Take those dogs, or Nergal sees you. The drummer leered at him. 
Nay, Claneth, he answered, my vow in Zebron's was that we would not molest you nor your priests as long as you were master of this deck. There was no vow to aid you, and it comes to me that your mastership is ending, and therefore... He bent over the tall drum, with heave of broad shoulders, hurled it over the side, and therefore, he grinned, you will no longer need the summoner of Nergal. From the priest arose a groan. Cleneth stood, silent, struck dumb, it seemed, by Gigi's act, his words. And as they stood there came from the waves, touching the ship a sound, sonorous and sinister, a thunderous drumming, menacing, malignant, summoning. Barum, barum, boom. The great drum swinging against the side of the ship, lifted by the waves, and by the arms beaten against the ship. The summoner, the summoner of Nergal, Barum. The ship trembled. A shadow fell upon the sea. Around Cleneth, a darkness began to gather. More angrily, more evilly, thundered the wave-beaten drum of Nergal. The mists around the black priest thickened, writhed, beginning that hellish transmutation of Nergal's priest into his own dread self. Out of them came Klanath's voice. Not master, eh, Gigi? He mocked. Now wait and see, and see what happens to you and that sow's spittle of a Persian. Strike! Gigi's hand fell on Kenton's shoulder. Quick, bite deep, while there is yet time. I go to silence the summoner. He ran to the rail, dropped over it and Kenton rushed straight upon that cloudy horror within which the black priest still moved. His sword swept into it, struck. He heard a howl, agonizing, unbelieving. The voice of Claneth, he struck again, and striking realized that the drumming had ceased, that the voice of the summoner was stilled. He heard Gigi shout, Bite again, wolf! Bite deep! Abruptly, the dark mist around Claneth cleared. He stood there, dead eyes closed, hand holding an arm from which dark blood welled through the clasping fingers. And as Kenton raised his sword to strike again, to strike this time a blow that would need no other to follow it, the black priest opened eyes that were twin pyres of infernal flame. Into Kenton's eyes he dashed the blood from the hand that had held the wounded arm. Blinded, Kenton held his sword at mid-stroke. The black priest rushed upon him, Mechanically, through dimmed sight, he raised blade to meet that rush, saw Sigurd driving down upon the remaining priests, heard the crack of bone as red-stained mace met their bodies even as they fled. His sword was caught in Clonath's hand. Swiftly he drew it back. As it slid out of the black priest's grip, severed fingers dropped. Again he howled. Kenton's foot slipped on a gout of blood. He fell. The black priest crashed down on him. The mighty arms encircled him. Over and over they rolled. He saw Sigurd whimpering with eagerness, striving to strike down, to smash out Clanath's life, and finding no opening. Suddenly, Clanath rolled over, Kenton on top of him. His crushed grip relaxed. He grew limp, lay inert. Kenton knelt upon him, looked up at the Viking. Not yours, he gasped. Mine. He sought for the dagger at his belt. The body of the black priest stiffened. Then, like a released spring, he leaped upon his feet, throwing Kenton yards away. And before the Viking could raise the club to strike, Claneth was at the rail. He hurled himself over it, into the sea. They hung over the ship's side, Kenton poised to leap upon the black priest. He was not there. They searched with their gaze the waters. Twice, perhaps, a hundred feet away, the serpent drum floated, his top slit across by Gigi's knife, and now as they watched, the head of Claneth arose beside it, a hand gripped it. Under the touch, the huge cylinder dipped to him with grotesque genuflection. From it came a dismal sound like a lament. Then out of the silver haze, a shadow moved. It darkened over black priest and drum. It shrouded them and withdrew and where it had been was neither black priest nor summoner. Man and drum, all had gone. 
battle fury still in his veins, Kenton looked about him. The black deck was strewn with Klanath's men, men crushed and broken under Sigurd's mace, men from whom his own sword had let out the life, men in twisted, grotesque heaps, men, but not many, who still writhed and groaned. He turned to Shireen's deck, her women, white-faced, clustered at the cabin door, staring at him, and on the very verge of the barrier between the two decks stood Shireen. Proudly she faced him, but with misty eyes on whose long lashes tears still trembled. Diadem of shining crescent was gone. Gone, too, that aura of the goddess which even when Ishtar was afar lingered like a splendor in this her living shrine. Why, she was but a woman after all. Nay, only a girl. A girl all human. Exquisite. He was lifted high on the shoulders of Gigi and the Persian. Hail, cried Gigi. Hail, master of the ship. Master of the ship, shouted the Persian. Gods of Persia, what a fight. Master of the ship, repeated Gigi, then softly. But Klanath lives. Master of the ship. Put me down, he ordered. And when they had set him on his feet, he strode from Klanath's deck to Shireen's, stood over her. Master of the ship, he laughed, and master of you, Shireen. Not yet, she answered steadily. Not yet, unless I choose. He gripped her slender wrists, drew her to his breast. End of chapter 16「Chapter Seventeen of the Ship of Ishtar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Marie Christian. The Ship of Ishtar by Abraham Merritt. Master of Sharain. There came a shout from Gigi, a cry of warning echoed by the Persian. He saw Sharain's face pale, her lips grow white. Out of the black cabin strode Sigurd the Viking, and in his arms was that dark statue of cloudy evil that had stood in Klaneth's sinister shrine. Stop, cried Gigi, and sprang toward him. But the Viking had reached the rail. Before the Ninevite could reach him, he had lifted the idol and cast it over into the waves. The last devil gone! shouted Sigurd. But Gigi turned to the Persian, horror on his face, and the Persian shrugged his shoulders, walked to the rail, and looked over it down where the black image had been cast. The ship trembled, trembled as though far beneath its keel a hand had risen and was shaking it. It stopped. Around it the waters darkened. Deep, deep down in those darkened waters began to glow a scarlet cloud. Deep, deep beneath them, the cloud moved and widened as widens the thunderhead. It vortexed into a great crimson storm, cloud blotted with blacknesses. It floated up, ever growing, its scarlets deepening ever more angrily, its black shading ever more menacingly. The lifting cloud swirled. From it shot out strangely ordered rays, horizontal, fan-shaped. From those slant plane luminescences now whirling like a tremendous wheel in the abyss, immense bubbles, black and crimson, began to break. They shot up, growing swiftly in girth as they neared the surface. Within them Kenton glimpsed figures, misty figures, bodies of crouching men clad in armor that glimmered jet and scarlet. Men within the bubbles. Armored men. Men who crouched with heads on knees, clothed all in glittering scales. Warriors in whose hands were misty swords, misty bows, misty javelins. Up rushed the bubble host, myriad after myriad. Now they were close to the sea's surface. Now they broke through. The bubbles burst. Out of their shattered sides the warriors sprang. All in their checkered mail pallid-faced, pupilless eyes half-closed and dead, they leaned out upon the darkened blue of the sea. From crest to crest of waves they vaulted. They ran over the waters as though over a field of withered violets. 
silently they poured down upon the ship. Men of Nergal, wailed Sharain, warriors of the Black One, Ishtar, Ishtar, help us! Phantoms, cried Kenton, and held high his blood-stained sword. Phantoms! And instantly he knew that whatever they were, phantoms they were not. The front rank poised themselves upon the tip of a curling wave as though upon a long land barrow. They thrust down bows no longer misty. To their cheeks they drew the tips of long arrows. Came a twang of strings, a pattering as of hail against the sides of the ship. A dozen shafts quivered alongside of the mast. One fell at his feet. Serpent scaled, black and crimson, its head buried deep within the deck. Ishtar, Lady Ishtar, deliver us from Nergal, wailed Sharain. As though in answer, the ship leaped as if another hand had closed upon its stern and had thrown it forward. From the host still breaking through the bubbles arose a vast shouting. They raced after the now flying ship, halted. Another rain of arrows fell upon it. Ishtar, Lady Ishtar, sobbed Sharain now nothing but a frightened girl. The hovering darkness split. For an instant out of it peered an immense orb circled with garlands of little moons. From it poured silver fire, living, throbbing, jubilant. The pulsing flood struck the sea and melted through it. The shadows closed. The orb was gone. But the moon flames it had poured still dropped down and down. Up to meet them sparkled other great bubbles all rosy, pearl and silver, shimmering with glints and glimmerings of tenderest nacre, gleamings of mother of pearl, cream of roses. In each of them Kenton sensed a form, a body, wondrous, delicate, and delicious. A woman's body, from whose beauty the shining sides of the bubbles drew their glory. Women within the bubbles up rushed the spheres of glamour. They touched the surface of the wan sea. They opened. Out of them flowed hosts of women, unclad save for the tresses black as midnight, silvery as the moon, golden as the wheat and poppy red. They stepped from the shimmering pyxes that had borne them upward. They lifted white arms and brown arms, arms shell pink and arms pale amber beckoning to the rushing sea-born men-at-arms. Their eyes gleamed like little lakes of jewels, sapphire blue, black, and pale sapphires, velvet jet, sunstone yellow, witched amber, eyes gray as sword blades beneath winter moons. Round-hipped and slender-hipped, high-breasted and virginal, they swayed upon their wave crests, beckoning, calling to Nergal's warriors. At their calling, dove sweet, gull plaintive, hawk eager, sweet and poignant, the scaled hosts wavered, halted. The bows that had been drawn dropped, swords splashed, javelins twirled through the deeps. Within their dead eyes a flame sprang forth, a flame of life. They shouted, they sprang forward, to the women, the ship forgotten. Wave crests on which mailed warriors raced met crests on which the wondrous women poised. Into the mailed arms the women were swept. For a breath, tresses brown and black, silver as the moon and golden as the wheat, swirled round male ebon and scarlet. Then warriors and women melted into the foam behind the racing ship, became one with the jeweled and sparkling wake of it a wake that rolled inside as though it were the soul of the amorous seas. Ishtar, mother beloved, prayed the Lady Sharain. To Ishtar, homage. To Ishtar, homage, echoed Kenton, and bent his knee. Rising, he caught her to him. Sharain, he breathed. Her soft arms wreathed his neck. My lord, I pray you forgiveness she sighed. I pray you forgiveness. Yet how could I have known, when first you lay upon the deck and seemed afraid and fled, and then were chained a slave? And still I loved you. 
yet how could I have known how mighty a lord you are? Her fragrance shook him. The softness of her against his breath closed his throat. Charain, he murmured. Charain. His lips sought hers and clung. Mad wine of life raced through his veins. In the sweet flames of her mouth, memory of all save this moment threatened to be burned from him. I give myself to you, she sighed. He remembered. You give nothing, Charain, he answered her. I take. He lifted her in his arms. The Viking came and sat beside the door of the rosy cabin, the black priest's sword in hand. He sat watchful, chanting low some ancient bridal lay. Upon the black deck Gigi and the Persian moved, casting the bodies of the slain into the sea, ending the pain of those not yet dead, casting them then after the others. One dove and then another fluttered down from the balcony of the blossoming trees and strutted about the closed door. The Viking watched them, still chanting low. Quick after the first doves fluttered others, twain upon twain. They cooed and bent inquisitive heads. They billed and murmured. They formed a half ring before the closed door. The white-breasted doves, tender, red-beaked, vermilion-footed, the murmuring, the wooing, the caressing doves. They set their white seal upon the way to Kenton and the woman he had won, the doves of Ishtar, wedding them. And now, their work done, Zubran and Gigi stepped over where the barrier had been, jesting with and wooing the women of Sharain. But unheeding, Sigurd, Trig's son, Sigurd the Viking, sat before that barred door, sword ready for hand, chanting under his breath his ancient lay. And, as unheeding, the doves of Ishtar, silent now, encircled it. End of chapter 17「Chapter 18 of the Ship of Ishtar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This is read by J. L. Walden. The Ship of Ishtar by Abraham Merritt. The Black Priest Strikes. Dear Lord of mine, John Kinton, whispered Shireen. I think that even you do not know how greatly I love you. They sat within the rosy cabin, her head upon his breast, and it was a new John Kenton who looked down upon the lovely face upturned to his. All that had been modern had fallen from him. He had gained in height, and brown as his face was the broad chest bared by open tunic. His blue eyes were clear and fearless filled with a laughing recklessness, touched, too, with half-fierce ruthlessness. Above the elbow of his left arm was a wide bracelet of thin gold, graven with symbols Shireen had cut there. Upon his feet were sandals that Shireen had embellished with woven Babylonian charms to keep his feet upon a path of love that led to her and her alone. How long had it been since that battle with the black priest, he wondered, as he drew her closer to him. Eternities, it seemed. And, but yesterday, how long? He could not know, in that timeless world where eternities and yesterdays were as one, and whether yester moment or eternities ago, he had ceased to care. On and on they had sailed, and ever as they slipped through the azure seas, memory of that other life of his had dwindled and sunk beneath the horizon of consciousness, as the land sinks behind the watcher on an outward-bound ship. He thought of it, when at all, with a numbing fear that he might be thrust back into it again, that old life of his. Away from the ship, away from Shireen, never to return. On and on they had sailed, the black cabin, swept clean of evil, housed now the Viking, 
Gigi, and the Persian. Sigurd, or Gigi, handled the two great oars that, fastened to each side of the stern, steered the ship. Sometimes, in fair weather, a maid of Shireins took their place at the rudder bar, and the Viking had found an anvil in the hold under the black cabin had made a forge and on it hammered out swords. One he had made for Gigi, full nine feet long, that the dwarf-legged giant handled like a wand. Better, though, Gigi liked the immense mace that Sigurd had also made for him, long as the sword, with huge bronze ball studded with nails at its end. Zubran clung to a scimitar, but the Viking labored at his forge, beating out lighter brands for Shireen's warrior maids. He made them shields and taught them to use both sword and shield as they had been used on his dragons in the old Viking days. Part fruit of that instruction, swordplay with Sigurd, wrestling with Gigi, fencing with his own blade against the scimitar of Zubran, was Kenton now. All this Gigi had encouraged. No safety while Claneth lives, he would croak. Make the ship strong! We have done with Klaneth, Kenton had said, a little boastfully. Not so, Gigi had answered. He will come with many men. Sooner or later, the Black Priest will come, Wolf. There had been recent confirmation of this. Soon after his battle, Kenton had taken one of the Blacks, a Nubian, and set him in Zackle's seat. But this had made them short one slave at the oars. They had met a ship, hailed it, and demanded an oarsman. Its captain had given them one, fearfully, quickly, and had sped away. He did not know that Claneth was no longer here, chuckled Gigi. But not long ago, they had met another ship. Its captain would not halt when hailed, and they had been forced to pursue and to fight. It was a small vessel, easily overhauled and easily captured. And that same captain had told them, sullenly, that Claneth was at Emaktila, high priest of a temple of Nergal there, and one of the council of the house of Nergal and the temple of the seven zones. It was, he said, the greatest of all temples. And more, the black priest was high in favor with one he called the Sultan of the Two Deaths, the ruler, so they gathered, of Emaktila by consent of the priests who were its actual lords. Claneth, said the captain, had sent forth word that the ship of Ishtar was no longer to be feared, that it held no longer either Nergal or Ishtar, but only men and women. It was to be sunk when met, but its men and women were to be saved, especially the red-haired woman Shireen, her lover, and a man with long, fair hair who had been a slave. For them, he offered a reward. You and you, he said, pointing to Kenton and Sigurd. And had my boat been but a little bigger and my men more, I would have claimed that reward, he had ended bluntly. They took what they wanted from him and let him go. But as the ship drew away, he shouted to them to take what joy of life they could at once, since Claneth, in a great ship, and with many men, was even now searching for them, and their shift was apt to be short. Ho, ho, grunted Gigi, and ho, oh, ho, Claneth searches for us, does he? Well, I warned you he would, Wolf. What now? Make for one of the isles, pick our vantage ground, and let him come, answered Kenton. We can build a fort, raise defenses. Better chance we would have against him then than on the ship of Ishtar. If it be true that he pursues us in a great vessel with many soldiers. They had found Kenton's word good, and now they were sailing towards such an isle. Sigurd at the helm. Gigi and the Persian, and the women of Shireen on watch, alert. Yea, dear lord of me, even you do not know how greatly I love you, whispered Shireen again, eyes soft and worshipping, arms fettering his neck, pressing him half-savagely to her breast. 
His lips clung to hers. Even in the sweet fire of their touch, he marveled, blind to his own renaissance, at this changed terrain. Love's changeling since that time he had carried her within his bower, disdaining her as gift, taking her by right of his two strong arms. Swift memories shook him, of Shireen, conquered, of some unearthly wonder that had flamed over the shrine he had thought untenanted, and with fingers of pure fire weaving his soul with hers in threads of flaming ecstasies. Shireen, times past, a vase for Ishtar, and now so human. Tell me, Lord of me, how much you love me, she murmured languorously. There came a shout from Sigurd. Waken the slaves! Drop oars! Storm comes! Imperceptibly, the cabin had darkened. He heard the shrilling of the overseer's whistle, a shouting and patter of feet. He unclasped Shireen's arms, gave her one kiss that answered her questioning better than words, passed out upon the deck. Swiftly, the sky blackened. There was a splintering flash of the prismatic lightning, a clashing of cymbal thunder. A wind arose and roared. Down came the sail. Before the blast, held steady by the hands of Sigurd, the ship flew. Then fell the rain. Through it scudded the ship, hemmed in by blackness, which, when the lightnings fell, were threaded by myriads of multicolored serpents of glass, rain steaming like slender serpents of glass from sky to sea and glistening under the lightning flares. A tremendous gust of wind swept down upon the ship, careening her far over. It buffeted at Shrain's door, tore it open. Kenton staggered over to Gigi, shouting to the women to leave their watch, go inside. He watched them stumble in. Zebron and I will watch, he cried in Gigi's ear. Go you and help Sigurd at the helm. But Gigi had not gone a yard before the wind died as quickly as though a gigantic screen had been dropped before it. To the right, he heard Sigurd shout. Look to the right. To the starboard rail the three ran. Within the darkness was a broad, faint disk of luminescence, like a faraway searchlight in a fog. Rapidly, its diameter decreased, growing ever brighter as its size diminished. The disk burst out of the mist. It became a blazing beam that shot over the rushing waves and glared upon the ship. Clinton glimpsed double banks of oars that drove a huge bulk down upon them with prodigious speed. Beneath the light was a gleaming ram, lance-tipped. It jutted out from the prow like the horn of a charging rhinoceros. Clanneth! roared Gigi, and ran shouting to the black cabin, Zubran at his heels. Shireen! shouted Kenton, and raced to her door. The ship veered abruptly, careening until the sea poured over the port rail. Kenton's feet flew from under him. He rolled head over heel to the bulwarks, struck, and lay for an instant stunned. Sigurd's maneuver could not save the ship. The Byrim had changed course, swept down parallel with it to shear off its starboard bank of oars. The Viking had thought to escape the impact, but the attacking vessel's oarsmen were too many, its speed too great for the ship of Ishtar's single banks of seven. Down dipped the Byrim sweeps, checking its rush. It swung broadside on straight against the ship, crushing the starboard oars like sticks. Kenton reeled to his feet, saw Gigi leaping down to him, battle mace in hand. Beside him, Zubran, scimitar shining, and close behind them, the useless tiller abandoned, was Sigurd the Viking, shield under arm, his great sword held high. They were beside him. His giddiness was gone. The Viking thrust him a shield. He drew his own sword. To Shireen, he gasped. Forward they ran. Before they could reach her door, defend it, 
a score of soldiers, chain-mailed and armed with great short swords, had poured down the side of the barim and closed the way to the cabin, and behind them poured other scores. Out whirled Gigi's giant mace, striking them down, blue blade of Nabu, scimitar of Zubran, brand of Sigurd, rose and fell, struck and thrust, in a breath were dripping red. Yet, not a step could they advance, for every soldier they slew, another took his place, and still the Barim reigned men. An arrow whistled, stood quivering in Sigurd's shield. Another flew, and hung from Zebron's shoulder. Came the bellowing of Klaneth, No arrows! Take the black-haired dog and yellow hair alive! Slay the others, if you must, with swords! Now the fighting men from the Byrim were all around them. Back to back in hollow square, the four fought. Upon the deck, the mail-clad men fell. Steadily growing mounds of dead around them, they fought on. There was a sword gash across Gigi's hairy chest, from which blood ran in little trickling streams. The Viking was bleeding from a dozen cuts, but Zebran, save for the arrow wound, was untouched. He fought silently, but Sigurd chanted and howled as he struck, and Gigi laughed as his giant mace crushed bone and sinew. Yet still, the barrier of the Black Priest men held fast between them and Shireen. What of Shireen? His heart leaped. He cast a swift glance up at the balcony. She stood there with three of her warrior maids, swords in hand, battling against soldiers who crept two by two down a narrow bridge of planks that had been dropped from the Barim's deck. But that glance had been no wise one. A sword bit into his unguarded side, paralyzing him. He would have fallen but for the Viking's hand. Steady, blood brother, he heard him say. My shield is before you. Take breath. There came a triumphant shouting from the ship of Klaneth. Out from its deck, two long poles had been thrust. There had been a tugging of ropes, and from their ends a net had fallen, squarely over Shireen and her three women. Vainly, they were struggling within it to cut the meshes. It bound them, fettered them. They beat against it as helplessly as butterflies. And suddenly, the net tightened, was drawn together by cords, Slowly, the poles began to lift, carrying the net's burden upward to the deck of the attacking ship. Ho, oh, Shireen, mocked Klaneth. Ho, oh, vessel of Ishtar, welcome to my ship. God, groaned Kenton. Strength renewed and doubled by his fury and despair, he charged. Before his berserk onslaught, the warriors gave way. Again, he rushed. Something whirled through the air, struck him upon the temple. He fell. The men of Klaneth swarmed upon him, clutching at his hands, his feet smothering him. They were hurled from him. The dwarf legs of Gigi stood astride of him, his mace whistling, men dropping under its stroke. Dizzily, he raised his head, saw Sigurd guarding him at right, Zubran at left and rear. He looked upward. The net that held the struggling women was being dropped upon the Byrim's deck. Again he heard the bellow of Klaneth. Welcome, sweet Shireen! Welcome! He staggered up, broke the Viking's grip, staggered forward toward her. Seize him! came the howl of the black priest. His weight in gold to the men who bring him to me alive! And now there was a ring of Klaneth's men around him, sweeping him away. Between him and the three who had fought beside him, eddied another stream of warriors, falling, smitten by mace and sword and scimitar. But their places taken by others, others wedging in, widening steadily the distance between Kenton and his comrades. He ceased to struggle. After all, this was what he wanted. This was best. He would be with Shireen, could find some plan to defeat again the Black Priest. Hold him up, roared Klaneth. Let the drab of Ishtar see him. 
He was lifted high in the hands of his captors. He heard a wail from Shireen. A dizziness seized him. It was as though he had been caught in some vortex and been sucked away. Away! He had a vision of Sigurd, the Persian, and Gigi staring at him, their faces incredulous, bloody masks. And they had stopped fighting. There were other faces, scores of them, staring at him with that same incredulity, though now it seemed shaded with terror. Now they were all staring at him as though over the edge of a prodigious funnel through which he had begun to drop. And now the clutching hands had melted away from him. The faces were gone. There was a wild whirling. Down, down through the vortex he was drawn with appalling speed. He threw out his arms, striving to stop his flight. Gigi, he called. Sigurd, Sabron, help me! Again, he heard the howling of vast winds. They changed into a trumpet note. The trumpeting changed. It became some familiar sound, some sound known in another life of his, ages and ages agone. What was it? Louder it grew, rasping, peremptory. The shriek of an auto horn. Shuddering, heartsick, he opened his eyes, looked upon his own room. There lay the shining jeweled ship, the ship of toys. And there was a knocking at the door, agitated, frantic, the murmuring of frightened voices. Then the voice of Jevons, faltering, panic-stricken. Master John! Master John! End of chapter 18「Chapter 19 of The Ship of Ishtar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Josh J. Barker. In the Ship of Ishtar by Abraham Merritt. Down the Rope of Sound. Kenton fought back his faintness, reached out a trembling hand, and snapped on the electrics. Master John! Master John! The old servant's voice was now sharp with terror. He rattled the doorknob, beat against the panels. Kenton steadied himself against the table, forced himself to speak. Why, Je Jevons! He strove to lighten the dragon words, inject some naturalness into them. What's the matter? He heard a little gasp of relief, another murmuring from the servants, and then Jevons spoke again. I was passing and heard you cry out, sir. A dreadful cry. Are you ill? Fiercely, Kenton strove against a racking weakness, managed to laugh. Ha! <laughs> Why, no, I fell asleep, had a nightmare and woke up yelling. Don't worry. Go to bed. Oh, it, it was that? The relief in Jevon's voice was greater, but the doubt was not altogether gone. He did not withdraw, stood there, hesitating. There was a mist before Kenton's eyes, a thin veil of crimson. His knees bent suddenly. Barely he saved himself from falling. He stumbled to the couch and sank upon it. A panic impulse urged him to cry out to Jevons to bring help, to break down the door. Fast upon it came the inexplicable warning that he must not do this thing, that he must fight his battle out alone if he were to tread the ship's deck again. Go, Jevons, he cried harshly. Hell, man! Didn't I tell you I wasn't to be disturbed tonight? Get away! Too late he realised that never before he had spoken so to his old servant who loved him. He knew, like a son. Had he betrayed himself? Crystallised Jevon's vague suspicions into the certainty that within that room something was wrong, indeed. Fear spurred his tongue. I'm all right! He forced laughter into the words. Of course I'm all right. And I didn't mean to speak so nastily. Forgive me. Damn that mist in front of his eyes. What was it? He passed a hand over them, brought it away, wet with blood. He stared at it, stupidly. Oh, that's all right, sir. There was no more doubt, nothing but affection in the voice. But hearing you cry. God, would the man never go? His eyes travelled from his hand of his arm. Crimson it was, red with blood to the shoulder. The fingers dripped. Only a devilish nightmare, he interrupted quietly. I won't sleep again until I'm done and go to bed. So run along. 
Then, good night, Master John. Good night, he answered. Swaying dizzily, he sat until the footsteps of Jevons and the Evers had died away. Then he tried to rise. His weakness was too great. He slid from the couch to his knees, crawled across the floor to a low cabinet, fumbled at its doors, and drew down a bottle of whiskey. He raised it to his lips and drank deep. The fiery stuff raced through him, gave him strength. He arose. A sickening pang stabbed his side. He raised his hand to clutch the agony, covered it and felt trickle through his fingers a slow, warm stream. He remembered. A sword had bitten him there. The sword of one of Clenef's men. Flashed before him pictures. The arrow quivering in the Viking shield. The mace of Gigi. The staring warriors. The great net dropping over Shireen and her woman. The wondering, incredulous, terror-filled faces. Then, this. Again, he lifted the bottle. Halfway to his mouth, he stopped. Every muscle rigid, every nerve taut. Confronting him was a shape. A man splashed red from head to foot. He saw a strong, fierce face from which glared eyes filled with murderous menace. Long, tangled elf locks of black writhed round it down to the crimson-stained shoulders. From hair edge to ear down across the forehead was a wound from which blood dripped. Bare to the waist was this man, and from the nipple of the left breast to mid-side ran a red, wide mouth slash, opened the ribs. Gory, menacing, dreadful in its red lacquer of life, a living phantom from some pirate deck of death, it glared at him. Stop. There was something familiar about the face, the eyes. His gaze was caught by a shimmer of gold on the right arm, above the elbow. It was a bracelet, and he knew that bracelet. It was twin to which it circled his own left arm, the bridal gift of Shireen. Who was this man? He could not think clearly. How could he? With numbness in his brain, the red mists before his eyes, the weakness that was creeping stealthily back upon him. Sudden rage swept through him. He swung the bottle to hurl straight at the wild, fierce face. The left hand of the figure swung up clutching a similar bottle. What he saw was himself. It was he, John Kenton, reflected in the long mirror on the wall. This ensanguined, fearfully wounded, raging shape was himself. A clock chimed nine. As though the slow strokes had been an exorcism, a change came over Kenton. His mind cleared, purpose and will clicked back into place. He took another deep drink of the liquor and without another look in the mirror, without a glance toward the jeweled ship, he walked to the door. Hand on the key he paused, considering. No, that would not do. He could not risk going out into the hallway. Jevons might still be hovering near, or some of the other servants might see him, and if he had not known himself, what would be the effect of seeing him on them? He could not go where water was to cleanse his hurts, wash away the blood. He must do what was here. He turned back to the cabinet, stripping the table of its cloths as he passed. His foot struck something on the floor. The blade of Naboo lay there, no longer blue, but stained as he was from tip of blade to hilt. For the moment, he left it lie. He poured spirits upon the cloth, made shift to cleanse himself with them. From another cabinet, he drew out his emergency medical kit. There was a lint there, and bandages, and iodine. Stiff-lipped with the torture of its touch, he poured the latter into the great wound in his side, daubed it into the cut across his forehead. He made compresses of the lint and wound the linen tapes round brow and chest. The blood flow stopped. The flaming agony of the iodine diminished. He stepped again to the mirror and scanned himself. The clock struck the half hour. Half past nine. What had it been when he had clutched the golden chains of the ship? had summoned the ship and been lifted by those chains out of the room and into the mysterious world in which it sailed. Just eight o'clock. Only an hour and a half ago. Yet during that time, in that other and timeless world, he had been slave and conqueror, had fought great battles, had won both ship and the woman who had mocked him, had become what now he was. And all this in less than two short hours. He walked over to the ship, picking up the sword as he went. He wiped the hilt clean of blood, 
the blade he did not touch. He drained the bottle before he dared to drop his eyes. He looked first on Charain's cabin. There were gaps in the little blossoming trees. The door was down, flung broken on the deck. The casements of the window were shattered. Upon the roof's edge a row of doves perched. Heads a-droop, mourning. From the oar ports, four sweeps instead of seven dipped on each side, and in the pits were no longer the eight and twenty rowers. Only ten were left, two to each of the stroke oars, one each to the others. On the starboard side of the hull were gashes and deep dents, the marks of the Bayarim's combing of the ship of Ishtar now sailing somewhere on that unknown sea of that unknown world from which he had fallen. And at the tiller bar a mannequin stood, a toy steering the toy ship, a toy man, long-haired, fair-haired. At his feet sat two other toys, one with shining hairless head and ape-like arms, the other red-bearded, agate-eyed, a shining scimitar across his knees. These toys, Sigurd, whose blood brotherhood had been sealed by the red runes on his own back, red runes now healed into white ones, Gigi, the subtle one and silencer of the summoner. Zubran, who had fought back to back with him against Clenef's hordes. These three toys? No toys, these. Not at least upon that real ship of which this upon which he gazed was shadow, symbol. What? Longing shook him. Heart ache. Such homesickness as some human soul might feel marooned upon alien star on outskirts of space. Gigi, he groaned. Sigurd, Zubran, bring me back to you. He bent over the three, touching them with tender fingers, breathing on them as though to give them warmth of life. Long he paused over Gigi. Instinctively he felt that in the Ninevite more than the others dwelt power to help. Sigurd was strong, the Persian subtle, but in the dwarf-legged giant ran tide of earth gods in earth-shouting youth, archaic, filled with unknown power long lost to man. He concentrated all his will upon that toy, which in that other world was Gigi. Gigi living, breathing, longing he knew for his return, even as he agonised with that same desire. Gigi, he whispered, his face close and again and again. Gigi, hear me, Gigi. Did the toy move? Breaking his passion of concentration came a cry. Newsboy shouting some foolish happening of importance on this foolish world on which he was cast away. It broke the threads, shattered the fragile links that he had felt forming between himself and the mannequin. Cursing, he straightened. His sight dimmed. He fell. Effort had told upon him. The treacherous weakness crept back. He dragged himself to the cabinet, knocked the head off a second bottle, let half it pour down his throat. The sudden whipped blood sang in his ears. Strength flowed through him. He snapped off the lights. A ray from the street came through the heavy curtains, outlining the three toy figures. Once more, Kenton gathered himself for a mighty effort of will. Gigi, it is I, the wolf, calling you. Gigi, answer me. Gigi. The mannequin stirred, its body trembled, its head raised. Far, far away, thin and cold as tip of frost lance upon glass, ghostly and unreal. Coming from immeasurable distances, he heard Gigi's voice. Wolf, I hear you, Wolf. Where are you? His mind clung to that thread of sound as though it were a line flung to him over vast abysses. Wolf, come to us. The voice was stronger. Gigi, Gigi, help me to you. The two voices that far flung, thin, cold one and his own, met and clung and knit. They stretched over that gulf that lay between where he stood and the unknown dimension in which sailed the ship. Now the little figure no longer squatted. It was upright. It was larger. Louder rang Gigi's voice. Wolf, come to us. We hear you. Come to us. Then as though it chanted words of power, Shireen, Shireen, Shireen. Under the lash of the loved name, his will now streamed fiercely. Gigi, Gigi, keep calling. Now he was no longer conscious of his room. He saw the ship far, far beneath him. He was but a point of life floating high above it, yearning to it and calling, 
calling to Gigi to help him. The strand of sound that linked them strained and shook like a cobweb thread, but it held and ever drew him down. And now the ship was growing. It was misty, nebulous, but steadily it grew, and steadily Kenton dropped down that rope of sound to meet it. Strengthening, the two voices came other sounds weaving themselves within their threads. The chanting of Sigurd, the calling of Zubran, the thrumming of the fingers under the wind on the harpstring of the ship's stays, the murmuring litany of the breaking waves telling their beads of foam. Even more real grew the ship. Striking through its substance came the wavering image of his room. It seemed to struggle against the ship, to strive to cover it, but the ship beat it back crying out to him with the voices of his comrades and the voices of wind and sea in one. Wolf, we feel you near. Come to us, Wolf. Shurain, Shurain, Shurain. The phantom outlines leaped into being. They enclosed him. The arms of Gigi reached out to him, gripped him, plucked him out of space. And as they gripped, he heard a chaotic whirling, a roaring as of another world spinning from under him and lashed by mighty winds. He stood again upon the ship. He was clasped tight to Gigi's hairy chest. Sigurd's hands were on his shoulders. Zubran was clasping and patting Kenton's own hands, clutching Gigi's back, singing his joy, strange, intricate Persian curses. Wolf, roared Gigi, tears filling the furrows of his wrinkled face. Where did you go? In the name of all the gods, where have you been? Never mind, sobbed Kenton. Never mind where I've been. Gigi, I'm back. Oh, thank God, I'm back. I'm back. End of chapter 19. Read by Josh J. Barker. Bristol. 15th of October, 2022. Chapter 20 of The Ship of Ishtar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ship of Ishtar by Abraham Merritt How the Ship Was Manned Faintness conquered him. The wounds and the effort of will had sapped his strength to its limit. When he came back to consciousness, he was on the divan in Shireen's raped cabin. His bandages had been replaced, his wounds redressed. The three men and four of Shireen's maids were looking down upon him. There was no reproach on any of their faces, only curiosity, tempered with obvious awe. It must be a strange place to which you go, Wolf, Gigi said at last. For see, the slash across my chest is healed. Sigurd's cuts too. Yet your wounds are as fresh as though made but a moment ago. Kenton looked and saw that it was so. The slash across Gigi's breast was not only a red scar. Also, it was a strange way to leave us, blood brother, rumbled the Viking. By the fire of Osmund, swore the Persian. It was a very good way, a good thing for us that he left us as he did. Cyrus the king taught us that it was a good general who knew how to retreat to save his troops. And that retreat of yours was a masterly one, comrade. Without it, we would not be here now to welcome you. It was no retreat. I could not help but go, whispered Kenton. Well, the Persian shook a dubious head. Whatever it was, it saved us. One instant there, you were lifted on the paws of the black priest's dogs. Another instant, you had faded into a shadow. And then, lo, even the shadow was gone. How those dogs who held you shrieked and ran, laughed Zubran. And the dogs who were biting at us ran too. Back to their kennels on the byreem they ran, for all clannets cursing. They had great fear, comrade, and so in fact for a moment did I. Then down went their oars and away sped the ship with clannets cursing still sounding, even after they had gotten safely out of sight of us. Shireen groaned Kenton. What did they do to her? Where had they taken her? To Emectilla, on Sorcerer's Isle, I think, answered Gigi. Fear not for her, Wolf. The Black Priest wants you both. To torture her without your eyes looking on, 
or to slay you without hers beholding your agonies would be no revenge for Claneth. No, until he lays hands on you, your reign is safe enough. Not comfortable, perhaps, nor happy, but assuredly safe enough, confirmed the Persian. Three of her maids they took with her in the nets, said Sigurd. Three they slew. These four they left when you vanished. They took Sadalu, my little vessel of joy, mourned Gigi, and for that Clemeth shall also pay when reckoning comes. Half the slaves were killed when the Byreme crashed against us, went on the Viking, or was crushed in ribs, broke backs, others died later. The black skin we put in Sackle's place is a man. He fought those who dropped into the pit and slew his share. But eight oars have we now, instead of twice seven. The black skin sits at one of them, unchained. When we take new slaves, he shall be overseer again and honored. And I remember now, it was Gigi dropping back to his first thought, that when I dragged you up the side of Clannis' cabin that day, you fought his priest. You still bled from the bites of Shireen's girls. Yet with us there had been time and time again for them to have healed. And here you are once more with old wounds fresh. It must be a strange place indeed that you go to Wolf. Is there no time there? It is your own world, he answered, the world from whence all of you came. And as they stared at him, he leaped up from the divan. We must sail to this Emcatilla. At once, find Shireen, free her. How soon, Gigi, how soon? He felt the wound in his side open, fell back, his spurt of strength exhausted. Not till your wounds are healed, said Gigi, and began to unfasten the reddening bandages. And we must make the ship strong again before we take that journey. We must have new slaves for the oars. Now lie quiet, Wolf, until you heal. Claneth will do Shireen no harm as long as there is hope of taking you. I, Gigi, tell you this, so set your heart at ease. And now began for Kenton a most impatient time of waiting, to be chained here by his wounds when, despite Gigi's assurances, the black priest might be wreaking his ultimate vengeance upon Shireen. It was not to be borne. Fever set in. His wounds had been more serious than he had known. Gigi nursed him. The fever passed, and as he grew stronger, he told them of that lost world of theirs. What had passed there during those centuries, they had sailed on the timeless ship. Of its machinery and its wars, its laws and its customs. And none now goes Viking, you Sigurd. Clearly, then, I see that there is no place for me there. Best for Sigurd, Trig's son to end his days where he is. The Persian nodded. And no place for me, he echoed, for a man of taste such as I. It seems no world at all to live in. And I like not your way of waging wars, nor could I learn to like it. I, who seem to be a soldier of an old, old school indeed. Even Gigi was doubtful. I do not think I would like it, he said. The custom seems so different. And I know this wolf that you are willing to risk chains and deaths to get out of that world and lose no time getting back to this. The new gods seem so stupid, argued Zubran. They do nothing. By the nine hells, the gods of this place are stupid enough. Still, they do something. Although perhaps it is better to do nothing than to do the same stupid things over and over, he ruminated. I will make me your steading on one of these islands, said Sigurd. After we had carried away Kenton's woman and slain the black priest, I will take me a strong wife and breed many younglings. I will teach them to build ships. Then we shall go viking as I did of old. Skull, skull to the dragons slipping through Rhine's bath, with the red ravens on their sails and the black ones flying overhead, shouted Sigurd. Say, blood brother, he turned to Kenton, when you have your woman back, Will you make steading beside mine? With Zubran taking wives and he and Gigi, if he not be too old, breeding young, and with those who will join us by Odin, 
but we shall all be great jarls in this world. That is not to my liking, replied the Persian promptly. For one thing, it takes too long to rear strong sons to fight for us. No, after we have finished our business with Clanet, I will go back to Amtakilla, where there are plenty of men already made. It will be strange if I find there are no discontented ones, men who can be stirred to revolt. If there be not enough of them, well, discontent is the easiest thing in the world to breed, much easier than sons, Sigurd. Also, I am a great soldier. Cyrus the king himself told me so. With my army of discontented men, I shall take this nest of priests and rule Emtakela, myself. After that, beware how you raid my ships, Sigurd. Thus they talked among themselves, telling Kenton things of their own lives as strange to him as his own tales must have been to them. Steadily, swiftly his wounds healed until they were at last only red welts, and strength flowed back into his veins. Now, for many sleeps, while he grew well, they had lain hidden within a landlocked cove of one of the Golden Isles. Its rock-jawed mouth had been barely wide enough for them to enter. Safe enough, this place seemed, from pursuit or prying eyes. Nevertheless, they had drawn the ship close against a high bank, whose waterside dropped straight down to the deep bottom. The oars had been taken in. The branches of the feathery trees drooped over the craft, covered it. Came a time when Kenton, awakening, felt full tide of health. He walked back to the rudder bar with Sigurd, Gigi, and the Persian, were stretched out talking. He paused for the hundredth time beside the strange compass that was the helmsman's guide in this world, where there was neither sun nor moon nor stars, no east or west, north or south. Set within the top of a wooden standee was a silver bowl covered with a sheet of clear crystal. Around the lip of this bowl were inlaid sixteen symbols, cuneiform, scarlet. Attached to a needle rising vertically from the bowl's bottom were two slender pointers, serpent-shaped, blue. The larger, he knew, pointed always toward Enkidella, that land to which, were Gigi right, Shireen had been carried by the black priest. The smaller pointed toward the nearest land. For the hundredth time, he wondered, what mysterious current stirred them in this poleless world? What magnetic flow from the scattered isles pulled the little one? What constant flow from Ancatilla kept the big one steady, steadier far than compass needles of earth pointed to the north? And as he looked, it seemed to him that the little blue needle spun in its scarlet pool and lay parallel with the greater one, both pointing to the Isle of Sorcerers. An omen, he cried. Look, Sigurd, Gigi, Sivran, look. They bent over the compass, but in the instant between his call and their response, the smaller needle had shifted again, again pointed to the isle where they lay moored. An omen, they asked, puzzled. What omen? Both the needles pointed to Ancatilla, he told them, to Shireen. She is in danger. It was an omen, a summons. We must go. Quick, Gigi, Sigurd, cast loose. We sail for Ancatilla. They looked at him doubtfully, down at the compass once more, at each other covertly. I saw it, I tell you, Kenton repeated. It was no illusion. I am well. Shireen is in peril. We must go. Shh, Gigi held up a warning hand, listened intently, parted the curtain of the leaves and peered out. A ship, he whispered, drawing back his head, and coming in. Bid the maids get arrows and javelins. Arm, all of you. Quiet now, and speed. They could hear the dip of oars, voices, the low tapping of a hammer, beating the stroke for the rowers. The maids of Shireen silently ranged themselves along the port rail near the bow. Bows standing, arrows and strings, beside them their stabbing javelins, their swords too, their shields at feet. The four men crouched, peeping out through the trees. What was coming? Questing ship of Clanet that had nosed them out? 
hunters searching the seas for them spurred on by the black grease promises of a reward. Through the narrow entrance to the hidden harbor drifted a galley, twice the length of the ship. It was single-tiered, fifteen oars to the side and double-banked. Two men to each sweep. There were a dozen or more men standing on the bow deck. How many others not visible, there was no knowing. The galley crept in. It nosed along the shore. When less than two hundred feet away from the hidden watchers, grapnels were thrown over the side and the boat made fast. Good water here and all we need, they heard one say. Juju put his arms around the three, drew them close to him. Wolf, he whispered, now do I believe in your omen. For lo, close upon its heels follows another and a better one, a summons indeed. There are the slaves we must have for our vacant oars, and gold too, I'll warrant, that we shall want when we reach Emkintilla. Slaves and gold, yes, muttered Kenton. Then sardonically, as half a dozen more men came up from below and joined the group on the bow, only remains to find the way to take them, Gigi. Nay, but that will be easy, whispered Zubran. They suspect nothing, and men surprised are already half beaten. I have a plan. We four will creep along the bank until we are just opposite their bow. When we have been away for as long as Allah there, he motioned to one of the warrior maids. Can count two hundred. The maids shall pour their arrows into that group, shooting fast as they can, but taking careful aim and bringing down as many as they can. Then we will leap aboard and upon those left. But when the maids hear a shout, they must shoot no longer at the bow, lest we be struck. Thereafter, let them keep any others from joining those forward. Is it a good plan? I'll warrant we shall have their ship in less time than it has taken me to tell it. A qualm shook Kenton. I like not this killing of men in cold blood, he said. Now by the gods came the voice, evidently of the captain of the galley. Would that cursed ship of Ishtar had been here? Had it been, well, I think none of us would need go faring out of Ankatiller again. Gods, if we might only have crept up on her here, and won Clannis rewards. Kenton's compunction fled, here with the hunters, and delivered into the hands of the hunted. Right, Zubran, he whispered fiercely, beckon Sila to us and tell her the plan. And when that had been done, he led them over the side of the ship into the covert. There was a ledge that helped them in their going, and it seemed to Kenton, watching hungrily the craft that, one, might mean Shireen, that the maid's arrows would never fly. At last they came, buzzing like bees and swarming among the cluster of men on the strange ship, and the maids were aiming straight. Other near score fully half were down, spitted, before they broke for shelter, crying crazily. Kenton shouted and leaped upon the deck, cutting with his sword while the vase of Gigi threatened in the blade of Sigurd. The scimitar of Zubran took toll. Beaten ere they could raise a hand, those left alive knelt and cried for mercy. A little band running to their aid from the stern met arrow storm from the maids, threw down their arms, raised hands of submission. They herded their captives together, disarmed them, and thrust them into the forward cabin. They locked them in, first making sure there were no weapons there and no way for them to escape. They took the keys to the rower's chains. The Viking went down into the pit, picked out nineteen of the sturdiest slaves, loosed and drove them two by two over to the ship. He manacled them to its empty oars. Much gold they found, too and other things that might prove useful in Emcatilla. Clothes of seamen in the fashion of the place, long robes to cover them and make them less open to detection. Arose then the question of what was to be done with their prize, and the men aboard her. Gigi was for putting them all to the sword. The Persian thought that it would be best to bring back the slaves, leave the ship where she was, and after killing all those on the captive galley, put forth to Amcatilla on her. There was much in his plan to be commended. The ship of Ishtar was a marked vessel. There was no mistaking her. 
This other ship would arouse no suspicion in the minds of those who saw it sailing, and once landed at Amcatilla, and what lay before them done, they could sail back on it and recover the ship. But Kenton would not have it, and the upshot was that the captain was called out for questioning, and told that if he answered truthfully, his life and those of the others would be spared. There was little he could tell them, but that little was enough to quicken Kenton's heart, bring new dread to it also. Yes, there had been a woman brought to Amcatilla by Claneth, the priest of Nergal. He had won her in a fight, Claneth had said, a sea battle in which many men had been slain. He had not said where or with whom this battle had taken place, and his soldiers had been warned to be silent. But it began to be whispered that the woman was the woman of the ship of Ishtar. The priestesses of Ishtar had claimed her, but Claneth, who had great power, had resisted them, and as a compromise, the council of priests had made her priestess of the god Bel, and placed her in Bel's house on top of the temple of the seven zones. I know that temple in the house of Bel on top of it, Sigurd had nodded, and why its priestess must live there, he had whispered, looking with pitying eyes at Kenton. This woman appeared now and then, heavily veiled, attending certain ceremonies to the god Bell. The captain went on, but she seemed to be a woman in a dream. Her memory had been taken from her, or so it was whispered. Beyond that he knew nothing, except that Claneth had doubled his reward for three of them. He pointed to Gigi, Sigurd, and the Persian, and had trebled it for him. He pointed to Kenton. And yes, now he remembered the name of this new priestess, it was Shireen. When they were done with him, they unloosed the remaining slaves and sent them ashore. They hailed the ship, and the Nubian brought her over. They watched the captain and his men pass over the side of the galley and disappear among the trees. Plenty of water and food, grumbled Gigi. They fare far better at our hands than we would have fared at theirs. They hitched the captured galley to the ship, slowly pulled it out of the harbor, through the rock-lipped mouth, and after they had gone a mile or so, Sigur dropped into it, did a few things with an axe, and climbing back cut it loose. Rapidly the galley filled and sank. Now, cried Kenton, and took the rudder bar, steering the ship straight to where the long blue serpent pointed, pointed to Ancatilla and to Shireen. End of chapter 20Chapter 21 of The Ship of Ishtar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Ship of Ishtar by Abraham Merritt. The Isle of Sorcerers. Luck clung to them. The silver mist hung close about the ship shrouding her so that she sailed ever within a circle, not more than double her length. Ever the mist hid her. Kenton, sleeping little, drove the slaves at the oars to the point of exhaustion. There is a great storm brewing, warm Sigurd. Pray, Odin, that it may hold back to we are well within Emcatilla, answered Kenton. If we but had a horse, I would sacrifice it to the All-Father, mourned Sigurd. Then he would hold that storm till our needs called it. Speak low, lest the seahorses trample us, warned Kenton, half laughing, half serious. He had questioned the Viking about that interruption of his, when the captain of the captured galley had said that Shireen was priestess of Bell's house. The Viking had been subtly evasive. She will be safe there, even from Claneth so long as she takes no other lover than the god, Sigurd had said. No other lover than the god, Kenton had roared, hand dropping to sword and glaring at Sigurd. She will have no lover but me, god or man, Sigurd. What do you mean? Take hand from sword, blood brother, Sigurd had replied. I meant not to offend you, only, he hesitated, gods are gods. And there was something in that galley captain's talk about your woman 
walking in dream. Memory withdrawn from her was then not. If that be so, blood brother, you were in those memories she has lost. Kenton winced. He had not forgotten. Insistently, the same thought had gnawed at him since their journey's beginning. Was, perhaps, prime reason for his desperate haste. Another thought, that also since then, had comforted him, prompted his tongue. Nurgal once tried to part a man and a woman who loved, he said, even as Shireen and I. He could not. I do not think Nurgal's priest can succeed where his infernal master failed. Not well-reasoned, comrade. It was Zubran, who had come quietly upon them. The gods are strong. Therefore, they have no reason for subtlety or cunning. They smite, and all is done. It is not artistic, I admit, but it is unanswerable. But man, who is not the strength of the gods, must resort to cunning and subtlety. That is why man will do worse things than the gods. Out of his weakness, he is forced to it. The gods should not be blamed, except for making man weak. Therefore, Planet is more to be feared by you than Nergal, his master. He cannot drive me out of Shireen's heart, Kempton cried. He cannot. The Viking bent his head down to the compass. You may be right, he muttered. Supran may be right. All I know is that while your woman is faithful to the god Bell, no man can harm her. Vague as he might be on that one point, the Viking was direct and full of meat upon others, of vital importance to them all. The Norseman had been observant while slave to the priests of Nergal. He knew the city thoroughly and the Temple of the Seven Zones intimately. Best of all, he knew a way of entering into Killa by another road than that of its harbor. This was indeed all important, since it was not within the pounds of possibility that they could enter that harbor without instant recognition. In fact, it had never been thought of. Their loose plan had been to find some lonely secret place, hide the ship, and go overland to the city. And it turned out that Sigurd knew exactly such a place. It was not far from Ancatilla, itself as the crow flies, yet a long sail for galleys coming out of the harbor. Look, comrade, Sigurd scratched with point of sword, a rude map on the planks of the deck. Here lies the city. It is at the end of a fjord. The mountains rise on each side of it and stretch in two long spits far out to sea. But here, he pointed to a spot in the coastline close to the crotch where a left-hand mountain barrier shot out from the coast is a bay with narrow entrance from the sea. It is used by the priests of Nergal for a certain secret sacrifice. Between it and the city, a hidden way runs through the hills. That path brings you out close to the great temple. I have traveled the hidden way and have stood on the shores of that bay. I went there with other slaves, bearing priests and litters and things of the sacrifice. While it would take two good sleeps for a ship to make that journey from Mkatilla, it is by that way only half so far as a strong man could walk in my own land between the dawn and noon of a winter day. Also, there are many places there where the ship can be hidden. Few galleys pass by, and none lives near, which was why the priest of Nergal picked it. Also, I know well the Temple of the Seven Zones, since long it was my home, went on Sigurd. Its height is twenty times the ship's mast. Kenton swiftly estimated that would make the temple four hundred feet a respectable height indeed. Its core, said the Viking, is made up of the sanctuaries of the gods and the goddess Ishtar, one upon each other. Around this core are the quarters of the priests and priestesses and lesser shrines. These secret sanctuaries are seven, the last being the House of Bell. At the base of the temple is a vast court with altars and other shrines where the people come to worship. Its entrances are strongly guarded. Even we four could not enter there. But around the temple, which is shaped thus, he scratched the outline of a truncated cone. A stairway runs thus. He drew a spiral from base to top of cone. 
At intervals along that stairway are sentinels. There is a garrison where it begins. Is this all clear? It is clear, said Gigi, that we would need an army to take it. Not so, the Viking said, unruffled. Remember how we took the galley, although they outnumbered us? This is my plan. We will take the ship into that secret harbor. If priests are there, we must do what we can, slay or flee. But if the Norns decree that no priests be there, we will hide the ship and leave the slaves in care of the black skin. Then the four of us, dressed as seamen in the clothes, and the long cloaks we took from the galley, will take the hidden way and go into the city. When we are there, we will separate, having first selected some meeting place. Separately, we will study that stairway up the Seven Zones Temple, meet and make a plan to get past that garrison that is at its foot. For, as to that stairway, I have another plan. It is high-walled up to a man's chest. If we can pass without arousing the guards at its base, we can creep up under shadow of that wall, slaying the sentinels as we go, until we reach the house of Bell. But not in fair weather could we do this, he added. There must be darkness or storm that they see us not from the streets. And that is why I pray to Odin, blood brother, even as you, that this brewing tempest may not boil until we have reached the city and looked upon that stairway. For in that storm that is surely coming, we could do as I have planned and swiftly. Let Odin, all father, hold it off to our need. But in this plan I see no chance of slaying Klaineth, growls Zubran. We creep in, we creep up, we creep out again with Shireen, if we can. And that is all. By Ormuds, my knees are too tender for creeping. Also my scimitar thirsts for drink of the black priest's blood. No safety while Klaineth lives, croaked Gigi, playing upon his old tune. I have no thought of Klaineth now, rumbled the Viking. First comes Kenton's woman. She'll swore Sigurd to be to him. My sword as his sword. His fortune Sigurd's fortune. His bane Sigurd's bane. And his desire mine to help him gain it. Brothers by the blood runes. He gets his woman. After that, we take up the black priest. Tears were in Kenton's eyes as he gripped the Norseman's hands. And Gigi grinned and slapped Sigurd's back. I am shamed, said Zubran. You are right, of course, Sigurd. I should have remembered. Yet, in truth, I would feel easy if we could kill Klaneth on our way to her. For I agree with Gigi. While he lives, no safety for your blood brother or for any of us. However, the Lady Shireen first, of course. The Viking had been peering down into the compass. He looked again intently and drew back pointing to it. Both the blue serpents and the scarlet bath were parallel. Their heads turned to one point. We head straight to M. Contilla, said Sigurd. But are we within the jaws of that fjord or out of them? Wherever we are, we must be close. He swung the rudder of oars to port. The ship veered. The larger needle slipped a quarter of the space to the right between the red symbols on the bowl edge. The smaller held steady. That proves nothing, grunted the Viking, except that we are no longer driving straight to the city. But we may be close upon the mounts. Check the oarsmen. Bid the overseer drive slowly. Slower went the ship and slower, feeling a way through the mists. And suddenly they darkened before them. Something grew out of them slowly, slowly. It lay revealed as a low shore rising sharply and melting into deeper shadows behind. The turquoise waves ran gently to it, caressing its rocks. Sigurd swore a great oath of thankfulness. We were on the other side of the mounts, he said. Now somewhere close is that secret bay of which I told you. Bid the overseer drive the ship along as we are. He swung the rudder sharply to starboard. The ship turned, slowly followed the shore. Soon in front of them loomed a high ridge of rock. This they skirted, circled its end, and still sculling silently came at last 
to another narrow strait into which the Viking steered. A place for hiding, he said. Send the ship into that cluster of trees ahead. Nay, there is water there. The trees rise out of it. Once within them, the ship can be seen neither from shore nor sea. They drifted into the grove. Long, densely laid branches covered them. The bow muzzled the shore. Now lash it to the tree trunks, whispered Sigurd. Go softly. Priests may be about. We will look for them later, when we are on our way. We leave the ship in charge of the women. The black skin stays behind. Let them all lie close till we return. Let the slaves sleep. And if we do not return, he shrugged Brony's shoulders. There would be better chance for you to return if you cut off that long hair of yours. And your beards occurred, said the Persian, and added, better chance for us also. Wait, cried the Viking, outraged. Cut my hair. Why, even when I was slave, they left that untouched. Wise counsel, said Kenton. And Zubran, that flaming beard of yours and your red hair, better for you and us too, if you left them behind, or changed their color. By Ormwoods, no, exclaimed the Persian, as outraged as Sigurd. The Viking laughed. The fowler sets the net and is caught with the bird. Nevertheless, it was good counsel. Better hair off face and head than head off shoulders. And better change color of beard and hair, I suppose, than change this world for another I know nothing of, agreed the Persian grudgingly. The maids brought shears. Laughing, they snipped his locks to nape of neck, trimmed the long beard into short spade shape. Amazing was the transformation of Sigurd, Trig's son, brought about by that shearing. The maids looked on him, admiration in their eyes. There is one that Clannis will not know if he sees him, grunted Gigi. But you must pay your price, Sigurd. See how the maids look at you, and they are all of them dark girls. Beware, Sigurd, or hide from them until your hair grows long again. Now the Persian put himself in the women's hands. They dabbled at beard and head, with cloth dipped in a bowl of some black liquid. The red faded, then darkened into brown. Not so great was the difference between him and the old Zubran, as there was between the new and old Sigurd. But Kenton and Gigi nodded approvingly. At least the red that made him as conspicuous as the Norseman's long hair was gone. Remain Kenton and Gigi. Little could be done for either of them. There was no change in Gigi's frog slit of a mouth, or the twinkling beady eyes, the bald pate, the immense shoulders. Take out your earrings, Gigi, bad Kenton. Take off that bracelet on your arm, replied Gigi. Shireen's gift never exclaimed Kenton, as outraged as had been at first the Norseman and the Persian. My earrings were put there by one who loved me as much as she does you. For the first time since Kenton had known Gigi, there was anger in his voice. The Persian laughed softly. It broke the tension. Kenton grinned at the drummer somewhat guiltily. Gigi grinned back. Well, he said, it seems that we must all make our sacrifices. Sigurd of his hair, Zubran his red, and you and I. He began to unscrew the earrings. No, Gigi, Kenton stayed his hands. He could not bring himself to break that golden band upon which Shireen had graven the symbols of her love. Leave them be. Rings and bracelet, both can be hidden. I do not know, Gigi paused doubtfully. It seems to me to be better. That idea of sacrifice, it grows stronger. There's little sense in what you said, said Kenton stubbornly. No, mused Gigi. Yet many men must have seen that bracelet of yours, that time you fought the black priest men and lost your reign. Clanneth must have seen it. Something whispers to me that token is more perilous than mine. Well, nothing whispers to me, said Kenton abruptly. He led the way into what had been Clanneth's cabin, and began stripping to clothe himself in the sailor's gear they had taken from the captured galley. He slipped on a loose shirt of finely tanned thin leather, 
whose long sleeves fastened around his wrists. You see, he said to Gigi, the bracelet is hidden. Next came loose hose of the same material drawn tight by a girdle around the waist. He drew on high lace buskins. Over the shirt he fastened a sleeveless tunic of mail. On his head he placed a conical metal covered cap, from whose padded sides dropped shoulder-deep folds of heavy oiled silk. The others dressed with him in similar garments. Only the Persian would not leave off his own linked mail. He knew its strength, he said, and the others were new to him. That was an old friend, often tried and always faithful, he said. He would not cast it off for new ones whose loyalty was still untried. But over it he drew one of the shirts, and over that a tunic from the galley. And Gigi, after he had set the cap upon his head, drew close the folds of silk so that they hid his ears and their jet pendants. Also he fastened around his neck another long fold of silk, binding the others fast and hiding his mouth. And when they had covered themselves with the long cloaks, they scanned each other with lightened hearts. The Viking and the Persian were true changelings. Little fear of recognition there. Changed enough by his new garb, it seemed to them, was Kenton. The cloak hid Juju's stumpy legs, and the cloths around his face, the close fitting conical cap altered it curiously into one not easily recognizable. It is good, murmured the Viking. It is very good, echoed Kenton. They belted themselves and thrust into the belts both their own swords and short ones of Sigurd's forging. Only Gigi would take neither that nine-foot blade the Norseman had made for him, nor the great mace. The latter was too well known, the other too cumbersome for their journey. Impossible, like the mace, to hide. He took two swords of average length. Last he picked up a long, thin piece of rope, swiftly spliced to it a small grappling hook. He coiled the rope around his waist, hanging the grapple to his belt. Lead, Sigurd, said Canton. One by one, they dropped over the ship's bow, waded through shallow water, and stood upon the shore, while Sigurd cast about for his bearings. The mists had grown thicker. The golden leaves, the panicles of crimson and yellow blooms, were etched against them, as though upon some ancient Chinese screen. In the mists, Sigurd moved, shadowy. The trees were motionless. The whole air was motionless, as though it were waiting and fearful. Come, the Viking joined them. I have found the way. Silently they followed him through the mists, under the silver shadows of the trees. End of chapter 21Chapter 22 of The Ship of Ishtar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ashley Greeley. The Ship of Ishtar by Abraham Merritt. The Bracelet Betrays. Chapter 22 That was a hidden way, in truth. How Sigurd followed it in the glimmering fog. By what signs led, Kinton could not tell, but the Viking walked along unhesitant. Close behind him waddled Gigi, and from time to time he saw Sigurd point here and there as though he were explaining the way. Soon he was sure of this, for frequently the Ninevite would pause as though to have instructions repeated. What they whispered he could not hear. Six feet behind them strode the Persian, with Kinton the same distance behind him. Between high rocks covered with the golden ferns, the narrow road ran, and through thickets where the still air was languorous with the scent of myriads of strange blossoms, through dense clumps of slender trunks, which were like bamboo stems, all lacquered scarlet, and through groves where trees grew primly in park-like precision, and under which the tarnished silver shadows were thick. Their steps made no sound on the soft moss. They had long lost the murmur of the sea. Sound of any kind around them, there was none. At the skirt of one of these ordered groves, the Viking paused. 
This is the place of Nurgle's sacrifice, he whispered. I go to see if any Nurgle's black dogs are about. Wait for me here. He melted into the mists. They waited, silent. For each felt that something evil, some hideous malignity, lay sleeping within those trees, and if they spoke or moved, it would awaken, reach out, draw them to it. That wood was saturated with evil. And out of it, as though the sleeping evil breathed, pulsed the sickly sweet and charnel odor that had hung in Claneth's cabin. Silently as he had gone, Sigurd returned. No black robes there, he said softly. Yet something of their dark god dwells in that grove always. Eager am I to pass this place. Go softly and quickly. Speak not to me again, Gigi, until I bid you. Softly, quickly they went, skirting that place of evil with cold sweat on Kenton's brow and hands. At last, Sigurd paused, exhaled a vast sigh of relief. I like not that grove, he said, and you would like it even less than you did if you knew what Nurgle's priests do therein. Even you, Zubrin, would lose some of that weariness of which so often you complain. Good, replied the Persian blandly. Viking, I thank you. Now, when I am lord of Amictala, I will save some of Nurgle's priests, that they may come here and perform before me. Thor, shield us! The Viking made the sign of the hammer. Talk not like that, Zubrin. Not here. Quick! He led them with increased speed. Soon, Gigi and he were whispering as before, and now the way began to climb steeply. On they went, and higher and higher. They passed through a long and deep ravine in which the glimmering, misty light was hardly strong enough for them to pick their way over the boulders that strewed it. They passed out of it between two huge monoliths and halted. For abruptly the silence that had enveloped them was broken. Before them was nothing but the wall of the mists, but from them and far, far below came a murmuring, a humming as of a great city, came to the creaking of masts, the rattle of gear, the splashing of oars, and now and then a shouting, darting up like a kite from the vague clamor. The harbor, whispered Sigurd, and pointed downward to the right. We are high above it. Amoctala lies beneath us, close. And there, blood brother, he pointed again downward and a little to the left, there is the temple of the seven zones. Kenton followed the pointing finger. A mighty mass loomed darkly in the silvery haze, its nebulous outlines cone-shaped, its top flattened. His heart quickened. On Sigurd he bade, trembling. Down they went, and ever down. Again the way was hidden by trees and rocks, but as they went through what must have been open spaces, the murmuring of the city came to them ever louder and louder, and ever the great bulk of the temple grew plainer climbing higher and higher into the heavens as they descended. And ever the mists hid the city from them. Abruptly they came to a high stone wall. Here Sigurd swiftly turned and led them into a grove of trees, thick, heavily shadowed. Through the trees they slipped, following the Viking, who now went on with even greater caution than he had shown at the place of sacrifice. At last he peered out from behind an enormous trunk, beckoned them, they clustered about him. Beyond the trees was a deep-rutted, broad roadway. A road into the city, he said. A free road on which we can walk without fear. They clambered down a high bank and took that road, walking now side by side. Soon the trees gave way to fields, cultivated as far as the mists would let them see. Fields filled with high plants whose leaves were shaped like those of the corn, but saffron yellow instead of green and instead of ears, long panicles of gleaming white grains, rows of bushes on whose branches shone berries green as emeralds, strange fruits, tree-stemmed vines from which fell curious star-shaped gourds. They saw houses, two-storied invariably, block-like with smaller cubes for wings, like those a child makes with its nursery blocks. They were painted startlingly, both in colors and patterns, Facades dripped with alternate vertical yard-wide bands of blue and yellow, facades of dull blue, 
through which darted scarlet zigzags like the conventionalized lightning bolts, broad horizontal bands of crimson barred with stripes of green. The road narrowed, became a thoroughfare paved with blocks that felt beneath the feet like volcanic rock, tufa. The painted houses became thicker. Men and women passed them, brown-faced and black, clad alike in one sleeveless white garment, cut short just below the knees. On the right wrist of each of these was a bronze ring from which fell a half-dozen links of chain. They carried burdens, jugs, baskets of the odd fruits and gourds, loaves of bread colored ruddy brown, flat cakes a foot across. They glanced at the four curiously as they passed. Slaves, said Sigurd. Now the painted houses stood solidly, side by side. These were galleried, and on the galleries were flowering trees and plants like those upon the rosy cabin of the ship. From some of them women leaned and called out to them as they went by. They passed out of the street into a roaring thoroughfare thronged with people, and here Kenton halted in sheer amazement. Wonder and surprise he had thought gone with that old self of his. But at this sight they flamed up anew. At the far end of the thoroughfare loomed the huge bulk of the temple. Its sides were lined with shops. At their doors stood men crying out their wares. Banners fell from them, on which in woven silk ran the cuneiform letters that told their goods. Past him walked Assyrians, men of Nineveh and of Babylon with curled heads and ringleted beards, hook-nosed, fierce-eyed Phoenicians, slow-eyed, muslin-skirted Egyptians, Ethiopians with great gold circlets in their ears, almond-lidded, smiling yellow men. Soldiers in cuirasses of linked mail, archers with quivers on back and bows in hand stood by him, priests in robes of black and crimson and blue. Stood in front of him for an instant a ruddy-skinned, smooth-muscled warrior who carried upon one shoulder the double-bladed axe of ancient Crete. Over his other shoulder lay the white arm of a sandaled woman in oddly modern pleated and patterned skirt, snake girdled and with high white breast peeping from her opened, and his oddly modern blouse. A Minoan and his mate he knew the pair to be, two who had perhaps watched the youths and maid who were Athens's tribute to the Minotaur go through the door of the labyrinth to the lair where the monstrous man-bull awaited them. And there, when a cuirassed Roman— gripping a wicked short sword of bronze that might have, and probably did, help cut out the paths the first Caesar trod. Behind him, a giant gall with twisted locks and eyes as coldly blue as Tigger's own. Up and down along the center of the thoroughfare rode men and women in litters borne on the shoulders of slaves. His eyes followed a Grecian girl, long-limbed and lithe, with hair as yellow as the ripened wheat. They followed, too, a hot-eyed Carthaginian girl, lovely enough to be a bride of Baal, who leaned over the side of her litter and smiled at him. "'I'm hungry and I thirst,' grunted Sigurd. "'Why do we stand here? Let us be going.' And suddenly Kenton realized that this pageant of past ages could be no strange thing to them who were also of that past. He nodded assent. They swung into the crowd and stopped at last before a place wherein men sat eating and drinking. "'Better for us to enter two by two, said Gigi. "'Claneth seeks four men, and we are four strangers. "'Wolf, you go in first with Sigurd. "'Zubrin and I will follow, but speak not to us when we enter.' "'The shopkeeper set food before them, and high beakers of red wine. "'He was garrulous. "'He asked them when they had made harbor, if their voyage had been a good one. "'It is a good time not to be at sea,' he said. "'Storm comes, and a great one.' I pray to Nabu, dispenser of waters, that he hold it until Bell's worship is ended. I close my shop later to see that new priestess of Bell's they talk so much about. Kenton's face had been bent over, his cap veils hiding it. But at this he raised it and stared full into the man's face. And the shopkeeper blanched, faltered, stared back at him with wide eyes. Had he been recognized? His hand sought stealthily his sword. Pardon, gasped the shopkeeper. I know you not. Then abruptly he peered closer, straightened and laughed. By Bell, I thought you were another. Gods, how you look like him. He hurried away. Kenton looked after him, puzzled. Was his departure a ruse? Had he really recognized him as the man Claneth sought? 
It could not be. His fright had been too real. His relief too sincere. Who was it, then, that Kenton looked like to bring forth this fright and relief? They finished their food quickly, paid from the gold they had taken from the galley, passed out into the street. Almost at once, Gigi and the Persian joined them. To the temple, ordered Kenton. Two by two, they sauntered down the street, not hurrying, like men just in from a long voyage. But as they went, Kenton, with an ever-growing puzzlement and apprehension, saw now one and now another glance at him, pause as though in wonder, and then, averting eyes, go swiftly by. The others saw it, too. "'Draw the cap-cloths about your face,' said Gigi uneasily. "'I like not the way they stare. And yet, if they thought they knew you, would they not set the soldiers on you? But they do not.' They go by as though afraid. Briefly, he told him and Zubrin of the shopkeeper and what he had said. That is bad. Gigi shook his head. It draws attention to us. Now who can it be you so resemble that those who look at you grow frightened? Well, hide your face as best you can. And this Kenton did, keeping his head bent as he walked. Nevertheless, folks still turned to stare at him. The street entered a broad park. People were strolling over its sward, sitting on benches of stone, gigantic roots of trees whose trunks were thick as the sequoia and whose branches were lost in the slowly thickening mists. And when they had gone a little way, Sigurd turned off the highway into this park. Blood brother, he said, Gigi is right. They stare at you too much. Now it comes to me that better for you and for us will it be if you go no further. Better hiding place for you than this, I know none. Therefore, sit you here upon this bench. Bow your head as though asleep or drunken. There are few here, and there will be fewer the temple court fills. The mists hide you from those who pass along the street. Here you should be safe. The three of us will go into the temple and study that stairway. Then we will return to you, and we will all take counsel. He knew the Viking was right. Steadily, at the turned heads and whispering, his unease had grown. And yet, it was hard to remain here, not to see for himself that place where Shireen lay captive, leave to others the chance of finding way to her. And yet, Sigurd was right. Courage, brother, said Sigurd gently as they left him. Odin has held off the storm for us. Odin will help us get your woman. Now for a time, a long, long time, it seemed to him, he sat upon that bench with face covered by hands. Stronger and stronger grew that desire to see for himself Shireen's prison, study its weaknesses. After all, his comrades were not as interested as he, their eyes not as sharpened by love and pity. He might succeed where they would fail, his sharpened eyes see what theirs would miss. And at last, the desire mastered him. He arose from the bench, made his way back to the thronged street. But when it was a few steps away, he turned and went along through the park, paralleling it, but not going out on it. And in a short while he came to the end of the park and stood, half-hidden, looking out. Directly before him, not fifty yards away, rose the immense bulk of the Temple of the Seven Zones. It blocked his vision like a colossal barrier. How great its base must be, he could not tell. He estimated that it must cover ten or more acres. It was conical, smooth built of some material whose character he could not even guess. The great stairway coiled round it like a serpent, and now he saw why it was called the Temple of the Seven Zones. For a hundred feet up from its base, it shone like burnished silver. There a circular terrace bit into the cone. Above that terrace, for another hundred feet, the cone was covered with some metal of red-gold color, rich orange came another terrace, and above that facade of jet black, dull and dead. Again the terrace. Above them the mists hid the walls, but he thought that through them he could see a glint of flaming scarlet, and over it a blue shadow. His eyes followed the girdling stairway. He stepped forward that he might see a little better. Broad steps led up from its base to a wide platform on which stood many men in armor. That, he thought, was the garrison which they must either trick or overcome before they could climb these steps. 
His heart sank as he counted the soldiers that guarded it. He looked beyond them and stood, thoughts racing. The rise of the stairway from the platform of the guards was gradual. About a thousand feet away, the park came close to the side of the temple. There was a clump of high trees whose branches almost touched the stairway at that point. Gigi's rope and grapple! Ah, wise was the Ninevite, anticipating some such chance, he thought. Kenton was the lightest of the four. He could climb those trees, drop to the stairway, or, if that was not possible, cast the grapple over the wall of it, swing in, and climb up the rope and over. Then he could drop that rope for the three to swarm it. It could be done. And if in such storm as Sigurd prophesied, with certainty of giving no alarm to the garrison below. Exultation swept him. Some sixth sense woke him from it. Whispered warning. He started, saw that the space between him and the temple was empty of people, saw an officer of the garrison standing at the base of the steps, watching him. Swiftly, Kenton turned, swiftly skirted the street until he was back to where he had first gone from his bench, found that bench, and seated himself on it as he had been before, bent over, face in hands. He could not see that same officer beckon another, speak quickly to him, then run across the deserted stretch and enter the wooded park close behind him. Nor did he see that officer stealing along a hundred paces in the rear, keeping him in sight until he had reached the bench. But as he sat there, he felt someone drop down beside him. "'What is the matter, sailor?' came a voice, roughly kind. "'If you are sick, why not go home?' Kenton spoke huskily keeping his face covered. "'Too much of a mock to low wine,' he answered. "'Leave me be. It will pass.' "'Ho!' laughed the other, and gripped his arm about the elbow. "'Look up! Better see calm before the tempest breaks.' "'No, no,' said Kenton thickly. "'Never mind the tempest. Water will help me.' The hand dropped from his arm. For a space, whoever it was beside him was silent. Then he arose. Right, sailor, he said heartily. Stay here. Stretch out on the bench and sleep a little. The gods be with you. And with you, muttered Kenton. He heard the footsteps of that brief companionship retreating. Cautiously, he turned his head, looked in their direction. There were several figures walking there among the trees. One was an old man in a long blue cloak, another an officer dressed like those he had seen on the great stairway, a sailor, a hurrying citizen. Which of them had sat beside him? He wondered idly for a moment. Then his mind filled again with plannings to reach Charain. Abruptly, another thought came. The man who had sat beside him had gripped his arm, gripped it where Charain's bracelet bound. And that officer, the soldier from the garrison, was it he? Had he followed him? He sat bolt upright, clapped his right hand on the sleeve of the leather shirt under which was the bracelet. His hand touched the bracelet. The sleeve had been slit by a knife to reveal it. It had been the officer. He had seen and followed him. He had felt the bracelet and cut the sleeve to see if it were that golden circlet which Gigi had said would betray him more swiftly than the earrings would Gigi. That a sacrifice was demanded of all four, he had not made that sacrifice. And the bracelet had betrayed him. The soldier... He had gone to bring help, of course. That was why he had counseled him to stay there, to sleep a while. Almost he laughed at the irony of that last. He leapt to his feet, to run. Before he could take a step, there was a rustling behind him, a trampling. A heavy cloth was thrown over his head like a bag. Hands clutched his throat. Other hands wound strand after strand of rope around his arms, pinioning them to his sides. Take that cloth off his face, but keep your hands around his throat, said a cold, dead voice. His head was freed. He looked straight into the dead eyes of Clanith. Then from the double ring of soldiers around him came a gasp of amazement, a movement of terror. The officer stepped forward, stared at him incredulously. Mother of the gods, he groaned, and knelt at Kenton's feet. Lord, I did not know. He leaped up, set knife to his bonds. Stop, Clan the spoke. It is the man. Look again. Trembling, the officer studied Kenton's face, lifted the cat veils, swore. Gods, he exclaimed, but I thought it was... And it is not, 
interposed Claneth smoothly. His eyes gloated over Kenton. He reached down into his belt, drew from it the sword of Naboo. Hold. The officer quietly took it from him. This man is my prisoner until I deliver him to the sultan. Until then, I keep his sword. The phosphorescence in the pupils of the black priest glowed. He goes straight to Nurgle's house, he rumbled. Best beware, Captain, how you cross Claneth. Cross or no cross, replied the officer. I am the sultan's man. His orders I obey. And you know as well as I do that he has commanded all prisoners to be brought before him first, no matter what even high priests say. Besides, he added slyly, there is that matter of the reward. Best to get this capture a matter of record. The sultan is a just man. The black priest stood silent, fingering his cruel mouth. The officer laughed. March, he snapped, to the temple. If this man escapes, all your lives for it. In a triple ring of the soldiers walked Kenton. On one side of him strode the officer. On the other, the black priest, evil gloating gaze never leaving him. Claneth licking his merciless lips and with hellfire bright in his eyes. Thus they passed through the wooded park, out into the wandering street, and at last through a high archway, and were swallowed up within a gateway of the temple. End of chapter 22、Chapter、23 of the Ship of Ishtar Read by Dodi The Ship of Ishtar by Abraham Merritt The Despair of Kenton Dark it was within the Temple of the Seven Zones. Darker still was the corridor into which they wheeled after they had left the gateway behind them. And as they marched on, darker and ever darker it became. Now Kenton could no longer see the pair who flanked him, nor the triple ring of armored men that girded them. He wondered how they could find their way through this lightless place. And the sound of the triple ring's marching feet, why had that grown so faint, so faint? There was no longer sound of marching feet, no longer sound of any kind. Nothing but soft, blind, silent darkness. Wait! Far, far away, piercing the dark silence, he heard the shrieking of winds, mighty winds roaring out of the farthest corners of space. Closer they came. They clamored and circled about him. And now he too was circling, swinging in wide arcs through the blackness, falling. Panic realization shook him. He strained at his bonds, trying to break them, to stretch out hands, clutch something, someone, to stay his headlong flight. Flight from Shireen's world into his own. Not back, he wailed. Not that. Gigi, Sigurd, help me. Ishtar, Nabu, hold me. The mouths of the winds closed. The sickening flight came abruptly to an end. Had they heard, answered? Gasping, He slowly opened eyes, opened them, and felt cold fingers of despair close round his heart. Again, he was within his own room. A clock began to strike. One, two. His numbed mind counted the strokes. Eleven, eleven o'clock. Then only an hour had gone by since he had last stood here, his life blood running out of his wounds. Why, That blood was not yet dry upon the rugs. And here he stood, the sword bites from which that blood had wrung long healed, old scars. A glance only he gave himself in the long mirror. One glance at the haggard white face, the despairing eyes that were his own, the thongs that lashed his arms to sides. He looked down on the jeweled ship. The oars were in. The peacock's sail was furled. He saw the slaves in the galley pit, toys. Toys crouching, flung lengthwise on the benches, asleep. The overseer, a toy of jet, leaned forward, chin cupped in hands. At the door of Shireen's cabin, a girl looked forth, head raised, her eyes of tiny blue gems scanning an unseen sky. Toys upon a toy ship, a ship of toys! 
and still the only key to a world that held for him all realities. He knelt, sobbing. Ishtar, great mother, take me back. Nabu, lord of wisdom, show me the way, lead me. He stopped, the cold fingers round his heart clutching tighter. What if he did get back upon the ship? How could that help him? Never, he knew, could he retrace that hidden path along which the Viking had led them. And if by any miracle he might, still it would not help. Long before he could reach the city, long before he could search out the others, the dice would have been cast, the issue decided. And if he did not leave the ship and they returned, found him lurking there, what would they think of him? That he had abandoned them, had fled like a craven, had left them to bear the burden of rescue of the woman he loved. How could they think else? But no, no, they would not return. They would not leave the city, would not return to the ship without him. Not Gigi, not Sigurd, nor Zubran, not Shireen. There they would stay, searching for him. And not long could be that search before they were taken. Marked men and women as they were. That thought was even harder to bear. And yet, if he did not get back to that unknown world, all, all was lost to him, everything, all sweetness of life, all reason for living. Shireen, lost to him forever. He groaned in agony of despair, of shame, of longing. A wild hope swept him. Whatever power it was that sent him swinging like a pendulum between these two worlds, could not that power set him otherwhere than on the ship of Ishtar? Aye! But what of that mysterious factor of time? The time that there rushed so much more swiftly than here. The time that in a few hours had changed him from scholarly weakling to the steel-thewed, steel-nerved man he was. Swifter, far swifter that time flowed, and yet flowing, it left untouched, unchanged each living thing. Could not the powers that ruled this world hold back that world's time at their will, turn it back? Upon the mercy of those powers he would throw himself entirely without reserves. Kenton leaned forward until his forehead touched the side of the shining ship. Ishtar, goddess, mother, he prayed, Nabu, holy ones, I ask no freedom. I ask no strength from you. I ask but one thing, to set me back. Not to the ship, but from whence I came. Give me again to Clanith. Set me among his men, even as I was. And if that means torment, if that means death, I am content. Set me there as I was, bound and helpless, and whatever may happen, whatever torment may fall to me, still will I worship and give praise to you. Ishtar, Nabu, praise to you until my last breath. Grant me this, Nabu, Ishtar. Under Kenton's feet the floor rocked. Darkness fell within the room, shutting out all sight both of room and ship, a darkness such as that through which he had fallen, out of the temple of the seven zones. Within that same soft, blind, silent darkness he felt himself whirled round and round, like stone on string's end. The whirling ceased, he shot out through the blackness like the stone released, shot out, was encompassed by roaring mighty winds. The blackness grayed. He hovered between two worlds. Beneath him he saw the ship of Ishtar, looked down upon it at one and the same time from incredible heights and from close above. No, groaned Kenton, not the ship. Mother Ishtar, Lord of Wisdom, not the ship. Shireen, my soul for hers. Set me within the temple, Ishtar, Ishtar! Inexorably, misty outlines of hull and mast contracted into solidity. Now he was poised close above the mast, was falling gently down it, hovered over the deck. Something like a vast, white, radiant wing flashed out of the cavern of Shireen. It caught him, cradled him, and folded him. The ship vanished from his sight. He had sense of flight swift as lightning stroke, felt jarring fall. Up, slave! He heard Clannis snarl. The black priest's toe was in his ribs. Gently, priest, came the voice of the officer who had trapped him. He was drawn by the soldier's hand to his feet. As one awakening from a dream, Kenton stared about him. 
He was in a broad, well-lighted passageway, the triple ring of soldiers circling him, waiting for a command to go on. All was as it had been before the blind darkness had stolen down upon him, whirled him back to his world. Ishtar! Nabu! They had answered him! They had granted his prayer! Kenton threw back his head, laughed. On, he cried, and laughing still, took up the march. To torment? To death? What did it matter? The burden of his despair had been lifted. Come what might, now he need feel no shame. On to torment and death. What did it matter? End of chapter. Chapter 24 of The Ship of Ishtar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Ashley Greeley. The Ship of Ishtar by Abraham Merritt. The King of the Two Deaths. Chapter 24. The Lord of Amakdala, King of the Two Deaths, sat legs crooked on a high divan. He was very like old King Cole of the nursery rhyme, even to that monarch's rubicund jollity, his apple-round, pippin-red cheeks. Merriment shone in his somewhat watery blue eyes. He wore one loose robe of scarlet. His long, white beard, stained here and there with drops of red and purple and yellow wine, wagged roguishly. The judgment chamber of the Lord of Amactala was some hundred feet square, his divan rested on a platform five feet high that stretched from side to side like a stage. The checkered floor raised in a sharp concave curve to build it. The curved front was cut through by a broad flight of low wide steps ascending from the lower floor and ending about five feet from the divan of the king. Two and ten archers in belted kirtles of silver and scarlet stood on the lowest step, shoulder to shoulder, bows at stand, arrows at strings, ready on the instant to be raised to ears and loosed. Four and twenty archers knelt at their feet. Six and thirty shafts of death were leveled at Kenton, black priest and the captain. Out from each side of the steps and along the curved wall to where it met the sides of the chamber, another file of bowmen stretched, scarlet and silver, shoulder to shoulder, arrows alert. The twinkling eyes of the king could see the backs of their heads ranged over the edge of his stage-like footlights. Along the other three walls, shoulder to shoulder, arrows at strings, eyes fixed on the lord of Amactala, ran an unbroken silver and scarlet frieze of archers. They stood silent, tense as automatons, tightly wound and waiting for touch upon some hidden spring. The chamber was windowless. Pale blue tapestries covered all its walls. A hundred lamps lighted it with still yellow flames. Twice a tall man's height away from the king's left hand, a veiled shape stood, motionless as the bowman. Even through its thick veils came subtle hints of beauty. At the same distance from the king's right hand, another veiled shape stood. Nor could its veils check hint of horror seeping forth from what they covered. One shape set the pulses leaping. One shape checked them. On the floor at the king's feet crouched a giant Chinese with a curved and crimson sword. Close to each of the divan girls stood, fair and young and naked to their waists. Six to this side, six to that. They held ewers filled with wine. At their feet were great bowls of wine, red and purple and yellow, in larger bowls of snow. At the right hand of the King of the Two Deaths knelt a girl with a golden cup on outstretched palms. At his left hand another knelt, a golden flagon on her palms. And the King to drink used equally well his left hand and his right, raising cup or flagon, setting them to his lips, putting them back, whereupon at once they were refilled. The King of the Two Deaths was quite drunk. Through many passages the captain and the black priest had hurried Kenton to this place. And now the king drank deep, set down his cup, and clapped his hands. "'The lord of Amactala judges,' intoned the Chinese, sonorously. "'He judges. 
whispered the bowmen ranged along the walls. Kenton, Black Priest, and Captain stepped forward until their breasts touched the foremost arrow points. The king leaned, merry eyes twinkling on Kenton. "'What jest is this, Claneth? he cried in a high, thin treble. "'Or have the houses of the gods Bell and god Nurgle declared war upon each other?' "'They are not at war, Lord,' answered Claneth. This is the slave for whom I have offered great reward, and whom I now claim since I have taken, since I have taken, mighty one, interrupted the captain, kneeling as he spoke, and so have earned Claneth's reward, O oh just one. You lie, Claneth, chuckled the king. If you are not at war, why have you trussed up the high priest of Bell like a chicken? So, high priest of Bell was he for whom Kenton had been mistaken? So that was why the people in the street had stared at him? Why the soldiers had murmured and the captain been at first afraid? And Shireen was priestess of Bel, prisoner of Bel's priests. How could he turn this to his advantage? Look again, Lord, said Claneth. I do not lie. The watery eyes peered closer at Kenton. <laughs> no, laughed the king. He is not the high priest. He is what the high priest would be were he as much a man. Well... All this has made me thirsty. He raised the flagon. Before he had half lifted it to his lips, he paused and looked into it. Half full, giggled the king, only half full. He looked from the flagon to the girl who stood closest to the kneeling girl at left. His merry round face beamed on her. Insect, chuckled the king, you forgot to fill my flagon. He raised a finger. Whing! A bowstring sang along the left wall. An arrow shrilled. It struck the trembling girl in the shoulder on the right side. She swayed, eyes closed. Bad! The king cried merrily and again held up a finger. Twang! From the frieze along the right wall, another bowstring sang. An arrow whistled across the room. The shaft cleft the heart of the first archer. Before his body touched the floor, the same bow sang once more. A second shaft leaped into sight deep within the left side of the wounded girl. Good, laughed the king, and wiped away a merry tear. Our lord has granted death, chanted the Chinese. Praise him. Praise him, echoed the bowmen and the cup maidens. But Kenton, mad with swift rage at that heartless killing, leaped forward. Instantly the bowstrings of the six-and-thirty archers before him were drawn taut. Arrow shafts touched ears. Black priest and captain caught him, threw him down. Not so easily do you die, Claneth rumbled and set heavy foot on his throat. The Chinese drew a small hammer and struck the blade of his sword. It rang like a bell. Two slaves came out on the dais and carried the dead girl away. Another girl took her place. The slaves dragged off the dead archer. Another slipped through the curtains and stood where he had stood. "'Let him up!' crowed the king, cheerily, and drained his filled flagon. "'Lord, he is my slave!' All the black priest's will could not keep the arrogant impatience out of his voice. "'He is my slave to do with as I will. He has been brought before you in obedience to your general command. You have seen him.' Now I claim my right to take him to his place of punishment. Oh, ho! <laughs> the king set down his cup, beamed at Claneth jovially. Oh, ho! So you won't let him up? And you will take him away? Oh, ho! <laughs> Toenail of a rotting flea, he shrilled, body rocking. Am I lord of Amatula, or am I not? Answer me. From all around the king's chamber came the sigh of tight-drawn bowstrings. Every arrow of the silver and scarlet frieze of bowmen was pointed at the black priest's great body. The captain threw himself down beside Kenton. Gods, muttered that soldier, hell take you in the reward. Why did I ever see you? Came the black priest's voice, strangled between rage and fear. Lord of Amagdala, you are. He knelt. The king waved his hand. The bowstrings dropped loose. Stand up, cried the king. The three arose. The lord of Amactala shook a finger at Kenton. 
Why were you so angered, he chuckled, by my boon of death to those two? Man, how many times, think you, will you beseech death to come and pray for my swift archers before Claneth is done with you? It was wanton slaughter, said Kenton, eyes steady on the watery ones. My cup must be kept filled, laughed the king. The girl knew the penalty. She broke my law. She was slain. I am just. The Lord is just, chanted the Chinese. He is just, echoed the archers and the cup maidens. The bowman made her suffer when I meant painless death for her. Therefore he was slain, said the king. I am merciful. Our Lord is merciful, chanted the Chinese. He is merciful, echoed the bowman and the cup maidens. Death, the king's face wrinkled jovially. Why, man, death is the first of boons. It is the one thing that the gods cannot cheat man out of. It is the one thing that is stronger than the fickleness of the gods. The gods give and the gods take away. But one thing they cannot take away, death. It is the only thing that is man's own. Above the gods, heedless of the gods, stronger than the gods, since even gods in their due time must die. Ah, sighed the king, and for a fleeting instant all King Cole's jocundity was gone, and in its place the face of a very weary, a sad, a very wise, and three-fourths drunken old man. Ah, there was a poet in Caldia when I dwelt there, a man who knew death and how to write of it. Maldrina his name. None here know him. And then, softly, as though he were quoting the words, "'Tis better be dead than alive,' he said, "'but best is never to be.'" Kenton listened, interest in this strange personality banishing his loathing. He knew Maldrina of ancient Ur, had run across that very poem from which the king had quoted while going through some of the inscribed clay tablets recovered by Halprecht in the sands of Nineveh. Back in that old life, half-forgotten, he had translated for his own amusement, even turned the lines into verse of his own tongue. And involuntarily he spoke the beginning of the last macabresque stanza. Life is a game, he said, its end we know not, nor care, and we yawn ere we come to its end. What? the king cried. You know Maldrina? You? Old King Cole again, he shook with laughter. Go on, he ordered. Kenton felt the bulk of Claneth beside him tremble with wrath, impatience. And Kenton laughed, too, meeting the twinkling eyes with eyes as merry. And as the king of the two deaths beat time with cup and flagon, he finished Maldrina's verse with its curious jigging lilt entangled in slow measure of March funeral. Yet it pleases to play with the snare, to skirt the pit and the peril dare, and lightly the gains to spend, there's a door that has opened, he said, a space where ye may tread. But the things ye have seen and the things ye have done, what are these things when the race is run and ye pause at the farthest door? As though they never had been, he said, utterly pass as the pulse of the dead. Then tread on lightly with nothing to mourn. Shall he who has nothing fear for the score? Ah, better be dead than alive, he said, but best is ne'er to be born. Long sat the king in silence. At last he stirred, raised his flagon, and beckoned one of the maidens. He drinks with me, he said, pointing to Kenton. The archers parted. Let the cup maiden pass. She stood before Kenton, held the flagon to his lips. He drank deep, lifted head, and bowed thanks to the lord of Amactala. Claneth, said the king, no man who knows Maldrina of Ur is a slave. Lord, answered the black priest, and plainly he was uneasy, yet this man belongs to me. The king sat silent, drinking now from cup and now from flagon, eyes now on Kenton, now on Claneth. Come here, he ordered at last, and pointed with one finger at Kenton, with another at the side of the Chinese. Lord, said Claneth, more uneasily yet stubbornly, my slave stays beside me. Does he? laughed the king. Ulcer on a gnat's belly. Does he? Or does he come to me as I command? All around the chamber the bowstring sighed. Lord, said Claneth with bowed head, he goes to you. 
As he passed him, Kenton heard the black priest's teeth grate, heard him pant as done a man after a long race. And Kenton, laughing, stepped through the open space of archers, stood before the king. "'Man who knows Maldrina,' chuckled the king, "'you wonder how I, alone, have greater power than these priests and all their gods. "'Well, it is because in all Amactala I am the one man who has neither gods nor superstitions. "'I am the one man who knows there are only three realities. "'Wine, which up to a certain point makes man see more clearly than the gods. "'Power, which being combined with man's cunning makes him superior to the gods. "'Death.' which no god can abolish, and which I deal at will. Wine, power, death, chanted the Chinese. These priests have many gods, each of them jealous of all the others. Ho, ho, laughed the king. I have no gods. Therefore, I am just to all. The just judge must be without prejudice, without belief. Our lord is without prejudice, chanted the Chinese. He has no beliefs intoned the bowman. I am on the side of the scales, said the king. On the other side are many gods and priests. There are only three things that I am sure are real. Wine, power, death. Those who try to outweigh me have beliefs many times three. Therefore, I outweigh them. If there were but one god, one belief opposite me, lo, I would be outweighed. Yea, three to one. That is paradox. Also, it is truth. The lord of Amakdala speaks truth, whispered the bowman. Better three straight arrows in your quiver than three score crooked ones. And if there should arise one man in Amakdala with but one arrow, and that arrow straighter than my three, that man would soon rule in my place, beamed the king. Archers, hear ye the lord, chanted the Chinese. And so, the king said briskly, since all the gods and all the priests were jealous of each other, they made me, who give not a curse for any god or priest, lord of Amakdala, to keep peace among them and hold them back from destroying each other. And this, since I now have ten bowmen to every one of theirs, and twenty swordsmen to each swordsman of the priests, I do very well. Ho, ho, laughed the king. That is power. Our lord has power, cried the Chinese. And having power, I can get drunk at will, chuckled the king. Our lord is drunken, whispered the archers, all around the chamber. Drunk or sober, I am king of the two deaths, tittered the ruler of Amactala. The two deaths, whispered the archers, nodding to each other. To you, man who knows Maldrina, I unveil them, said the king, grinning at Kenton. Bowmen at sides and back, bend your heads, shouted the Chinese. The heads of the archers along three sides of the living frieze dropped immediately upon their breasts. The veil slowly fell from the shape upon the left hand of the king. There, looking at Kenton with deep eyes, in which were tenderness of the mother, shyness of the maid, passion of the beloved mistress, stood a woman. Her naked body was flawless. In it harmonies of mother, maid, and mistress flowed in one compelling chord. From her breathed all spring tides that ever caressed earth. She was the doorway to enchanted worlds, the symbol of everything that life could offer both of beauty and of joy. She was all the sweetness of life, its promises, its ecstasies, its lure, and its reason. Looking on her, Kenton knew that life was something to be held fast, that it was dear and filled with wonders, exquisite, not to be let go, and that death was very dreadful. He had no desire toward that woman's shape, but she fanned a roaring flame desire for life in full continuance. In her hand, she held a strangely shaped instrument, long with sharp fangs and rows of tearing claws. She is not entirely human. I invented her, said the king, complacently, for I, too, was once a great sorcerer, before I learned that only in simplicity lay truth strength. Strength, intoned the Chinese. To her, chuckled the king, I give only those whom I greatly dislike. She kills them slowly. Looking upon her, they cling to life. Fiercely, terribly, they cling to it. Each moment of life that she draws from them with those claws and teeth is an eternity through which they battle against death. Slowly she draws them out of life, 
wailing, clinging to it, turning stubborn faces from death. And now, look! The veils fell from the shape in his right hand. There crouched a black dwarf, misshapen, warped, hideous. He stared at Kenton out of dull eyes that held every sorrow and sadness and disillusionment of life, held all life's uselessness, its weariness, its empty labor. And looking at him, Kenton forgot that other shape, knew that life was dreadful, not to be born, and that death was the one good thing man had. In one hand, the dwarf held a slender sword, rapier-thin, needle-pointed, he had increasing desire to hurl himself upon that sword, die upon it. To him, laughed the king, I give those who have greatly pleased me. Swift is their death, and a sweet cup to their lips. Him also I made. You there, the king pointed to the captain who had trapped Kenton. None too pleased am I with you for taking this man who knows Maldrina, even if he be clan this slave. Go up before my left hand death. Face bloodless white, the captain marched to the steps. Rigid he marched through the archers, marched without pause until he stood before the death. The Chinese struck his sword. Two slaves entered, heads bent low, carrying a lattice of metal. They stripped the captain of his armor, strapped him naked to the grate. The woman shape leaned over him, tenderness, love, all life's promise in her deep eyes, her wondrous face. She thrust the fanged instrument against his breast so lovingly. From his lips came a shrieking, anguish, despairing, prayers and curses, the wailing of the newly damned. Still the woman shape leaned over him, smiling, tender, her eyes brooding upon his. Let be, giggled the king. She lifted the thing of torment from the soldier's breast, bent to her veils and threw them over her again. The slaves unbound the captain, dressed his shaking body, Sobbing, tears streaming, he staggered back, sank on knees at the black priest's side. "'I am displeased,' said the king merrily. "'Yet you did your duty. Therefore, live for a while, since that is your desire. I am just.' "'Just is the Lord,' echoed the chamber. "'You,' he pointed to the archer who had slain Cup Maiden and fellow bowman, "'I am much pleased with you. You shall have your reward. Come to my right hand death.' Slowly at first the archer stepped forward. Faster he moved as the dull eyes of the dwarf met his and clung to them. Faster and faster he raced up the steps, hurling the archers aside, and leaped upon the slender sword. "'I am generous,' said the king. "'Our lord is generous,' intoned the Chinese. "'Generous,' whispered the bowman. "'I am thirsty,' laughed the king. He drank deep from left hand and right." His head nodded. He swayed a bit, quite drunkenly. My command! He opened and closed one twinkling eye after the other. Hear me, Claneth. I am sleepy. I will sleep. When I awaken, bring this man who knows Maldrina to me again. Let no harm come to him before then. It is my command. Also, he shall have a guard of bowmen. Take him away. Keep him safe. It is my command. He reached for his cup. It dropped from his lax hand. By my deaths, he whimpered, if I could but hold more wine. He sank down upon the divan. The king of the two deaths snored. Our lord sleeps, chanted the Chinese softly. He sleeps, whispered the bowmen and cup maidens. The Chinese arose, bent over the king. He raised him on his shoulders like a child. The two and ten archers upon the lowest step turned, marched up, and circled the two. The four and twenty turned, marched up, and circled them. The bowmen beside the curved wall swung round, and six abreast marched up the steps. The living frieze of scarlet and silver swung six by six out from their walls and followed them. The double ring within which were sleeping king and the Chinese stepped forward, passed through the curtains at the rear. After them strode the bowmen. Six fell out of the ranks, ranged themselves beside Kenton. The cup maidens picked up ewers and bowls. They tripped through the curtains. Upon the stage were now only the two deaths, veiled, silent, motionless. The bowmen pointed to the lower floor. Kenton walked down the steps. 
black priest on one side of him, white-faced captain on the other, three archers marching before them, three after them, he passed out of the judgment chamber of the king. End of chapter 24「Chapter twenty five of the Ship of Ishtar. This is a LibreVox recording. All LibreVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibreVox.org. The Ship of Ishtar by Abraham Merritt. The Blue Priest. They took Kent into a narrow, windowless room. Its heavy door was solid bronze. Around its sides ran stone benches. In its centre was another bench shaped like a sarcophagus. The bowman sat him on it, tied his ankles with leathern thongs threw cloaks on its top and pressed him down upon them. They seated themselves two by two on three sides of the room, eyes fixed on black priest and captain, bows ready. The captain tapped the black priest on the shoulder. My reward? he asked. When do I get it? When the slave's in my hands and not before, answered Clarneth savagely. If you had been wiser, you would have had it by now. Yes, much good it would be doing me with an arrow through my heart, or, he shuddered, wailing even now at the feet of the king's death. The black priest looked at Kenton evilly, bent over him. Put no hope in the king's favour, he muttered. It was as drunken as thou was speaking. When he awakens he will have forgotten. Give you to me without question. No hope there, you dog. No, sneered Kenton, meeting the dead malignant eyes steadily. Yet twice have I beaten you, you black swine. But not a third time, spat Clarneth. When the king awakens, I will have not only you, but that temple drab you love. Ho! rumbled the black priest as Kenton winced. That touches you, does it? Yes, I will have you both, and together you shall die, slowly, ah, so slowly, watching each other's agonies, side by side, side by side, until slowly, slowly my torturers have destroyed the last of your bodies, nay, the last of your spirits. Never before has man or woman died as you two shall. You cannot harm Shirane, answered Kenton. Carrion eater, whose filthy mouth drips lies. She is Bell's priestess and safe from you. Ho, grunted Clarneth, then bent, whispering close in Kenton's ear so softly that no one but him could hear. Listen, here is a sweet thought to carry you while I am away. Only if the priestess is faithful to the god is she beyond my reach. Now listen, listen, before the king awakes your Charonet will have taken another lover. Yeah, devilish mockery was in the whisper. Your love shall lie in arms of earthly lover, and he will not be you. Kenton writhed helplessly, striving to break his bonds, tear at the evil face. Sweet Shirane, whispered Clarneth, leering, holy vase of joy, and mine to break as I will, before the king awakes. He stepped back to the soldier who had taken Kenton. I go to await the king's awakening, he said. Come. Not I, answered the soldier hastily. By the gods I prefer this company. Also, if I lose sight of this man, priest, I might forever lose sight of the reward you owe me for him. Give me a sword ordered Clarneth, reaching toward the blade of Naboo, which the officer had retained. The sword goes with the man, answered the officer, setting it behind him. That is true, the bowmen nodded to each other. Priest, you cannot have the sword. Clarneth snarled, his hands flew out to clutch. Six bows bent, six arrows pointed at his heart. Without word, with hell stamped deep on his brow, the black priest strode out of the cell. An archer arose, dropping into place a bar, sealing the door. A silence fell. The soldier brooded. Now and then he shivered as though cold, and Kenton knew he was thinking of that death who with smiling, tender eyes had pressed teeth of torture in his breast. The six bowmen watched him unwinkingly, and at last Kenton closed his own eyes, fighting to keep back the terror of Clarneth's last threat against his beloved, fighting against despair. What evil plot had the black priest set going against her, what trap had he laid, to make him so sure that soon he would have her in his hands, to break? Where was Gigi and Sigurd and Zubrin? Did they know he was taken? A great loneliness swept over him. How long his eyes were closed, or whether he had slept, he never could tell. But he heard as though from infinite distances away a still, passionless voice. Arise, it bade him. He opened his lids, lifted his head. A priest stood beside him, a priest whose long blue robes covered him from head to foot. Nothing could he see of that priest's face. Suddenly he knew that his arms and ankles were free. He sat up. Ropes and thongs lay on the floor. On the stone benches the bowmen leaned one against the other asleep. The officer was asleep. The bar on the door was still in place. Then how had the blue priest entered? He got upon his feet, tried to look beneath the hood. The priest pointed to his sword, the sword of Naboo lying across the sleeping soldier's knees. He took it. The priest pointed to the bar that held the door. Kenton lifted it and swung the door open. 
The blue priest glided through the doorway, Kenton close behind. Again the priest pointed to the door, and now he saw that on the outer side was a similar bar, fastening the cell from without. Softly Kenton dropped it into place. The blue priest nodded, beckoned. Quickly he drifted along the corridor for a hundred paces or so, and then pressed against what, to Kenton's sight, was black wall. A panel opened. Through it went the priest, with Kenton following. How they stood in a long corridor, dimly lighted, but how lighted he could not tell, since no lamps nor other lights were there. Along it they went, in a great curve. It came to Kenton that this hidden passage followed the huge arc of the temple, that it must run close behind the temple's outer wall. Now a massive bronze door closed the way. The blue priest seemed only to touch it, yet it swung open, closed behind them. Kenton stood in a crypt, some ten feet square. At one end was the massive door through which he had come, at the other was a similar one. At his left was a ten-foot slab of smooth, pallid stone. And now the blue priest spoke, if indeed it were he speaking, since the passionless, still voice Kenton heard seemed like that which had bidden him rise to come from infinite distance. The mind of the woman you love sleeps, it said. Remember that. She is a woman walking in dream, moving among dreams that other minds have made for her. Evil creeps upon her. It is not well to let that evil conquer, since should it, an ancient feud will surely blaze afresh, consuming ere it ends. It may well be, both gods and men, greater far is the issue here than the lives of this woman and of you. Yet that issue rests on you, on your wisdom, your strength, your courage. Now when your wisdom tells you it is the time, open that farther door. Your way lies through it, and remember... Her mind sleeps. You must awaken it before the evil leaps upon her. Something tinkled on the floor. At Kenton's feet lay a little wedge-shaped key. He stooped to pick it up. As he raised his head, he saw the blue priest beside the far door. Father, he said, and humbly, Father, strength I have and courage. Were there enough of wisdom? Ah, that I do not know. But my heart is filled with thankfulness to you who have so helped me. May I not know whom to thank? He bent his head. There was silence. Then... Nabu, sighed the faraway voice. Nabu, god of wisdom. He had freed him, counselled him. Kenton raised his head, bent knee. The blue priest seemed but a wisp of wind-drawn smoke that, even as he looked, faded through the great bronze door and vanished. End of chapter 25, read by Inkel. Chapter 26 of The Ship of Ishtar this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by J. L. Walden. The Ship of Ishtar by Abraham Merritt. Before the Altar of Bell. Now Kenton heard the murmur of many voices, muffled, vague. He slipped from door to door listening. They were not within the passage. They seemed to seep through the slab of pallid, smooth stone. He placed an ear against it. The voices came to him more distinctly, but still he could distinguish no words. The stone must be exceeding thin here, he thought, that he could hear it all. He saw at his right a little shining lever. He drew it down. A three-foot-wide, misty disk of light began to glow within the stone. It seemed to eat through the stone. It flashed out dazzlingly. Where the disk had been was a circular opening, a window. Silhouetted against it were the heads of a woman and two men. Their voices came now as clearly to his ears as though they stood beside him. Over them came the wave-like murmur of a multitude, he drew back, fearing to be seen. The little lever snapped back into place. The window faded. With its fading, the voices muted. He stared again at the smooth, pale wall. Slowly, he drew down the lever, once more watched the apparent burning out of the solid stone, saw the three heads reappear. He ran his free hand over the visible wall to the edge of the circle. Higher he lifted it, into the disk itself, and ever he touched cold stone. Even that which was to his eyes an opening was to the questing fingers stone. He touched the whispering heads and touched stone. Now he understood. This was some device of the sorcerers, the priest, a device to give them a peeping place, a listening post within the crypt. Some knowledge of the properties of life these priests must have 
not yet learned by the science of Kenton's own world. Control of a varying vibration that made the rock transparent from within, but not from without. Whatever the secret, the stone was made as porous to the aerial waves of sound as to the etheric waves of light. Keeping his grip upon the handle, he peered out between the heads and over the shoulders of those so close to and still so unconscious of him. The mist had lifted. They had become dense lurid clouds pressing down almost upon the top of the zoned temple. In front of him was a huge court paved with immense octagons of black and white marble. Trooping down upon this court like a forest of fairy, halting in a wide semicircle around it, were hosts of slender pillars, elfin shafts all gleaming red and black, whose tapering tops were crowned with carven, lace-tipped fronds glistening like gigantic ferns wet with dew of diamonds and sapphires. Upon the black and scarlet columns shone mysterious symbolings in gold and azure and emerald and vermilion and silver. In halted myriads, these pillars reached up toward the sullen, smoldering sky. Hardly a hundred feet away was a golden altar, guarded by crouching cherubs, man-headed, eagle-winged, lion-bodied, carven from some midnight metal. They watched at each corner of the altar with cruel, bearded faces set between paws and as alert as though alive. From the tripod on the altar, a single slender crimson flame lifted, lance-tipped and motionless. In a vast crescent, a dozen yards in the van of the column stood a double ring of bowmen and spearmen. They held back a multitude, men and women and children, pouring out of the ordered grove of pillars and milling against the soldiers like wind-driven leaves against a wall. Score upon score, they fluttered and whispered behind the double ring. Score upon score of men and women and children plucked from their own times and set down in this unknown, timeless world. The new priestess, they say she is very beautiful? One of the men in front of Kenton had spoken. He was thin, white-faced, a Phrygian cap over his lank hair. The woman was of a bold and blown comeliness, black-tressed, black-eyed. The man at her right was an Assyrian, bearded, wolf-visaged. She is a princess, they say, the woman spoke. They say she was a princess in Babylon. Has she been here long? asked the Phrygian. I have just returned from a voyage. It was another princess when last I was here, he added half apologetically. Long, the woman laughed. What is long or short in this place without time? This land where none dies unless slain. Princess in Babylon, echoed the Assyrian, wolf face softening, homesickness in his voice. Oh, to be back in Babylon. The priest of Bel loves her, so they say. The woman broke the silence. The priestess? whispered the Phrygian. The woman nodded. But that is forbidden. It is death. The woman laughed again. Hush! It was the Assyrian, cautioning. And the Lady Narada, the holy dancer, loves the priest. The woman went on, unheeding. And so, as always, one must be to Nergal. Hush! whispered the Assyrian. Will it be the dancer? asked the Phrygian. My little bed with the ivory feet that it will not, laughed the woman. The Assyrian's hand closed over her mouth. There was a rumbling ruffle of drums, the sweet piping of a flute. He sought the sounds. His gaze rested on half a score of temple girls. Five crouched beside little tambours upon whose heads rested their rosy thumbs. Two held to red lips pierced reeds. Three bent over harps. 
Within their circle lay what at first seemed to him a mound of shimmering spider webs spun all of threads of jet, in which swarms of golden butterflies were snared. The mound quivered, lifted. The sable silken strands had meshed a woman, a woman so lovely that for a heartbeat Kenton forgot Shireen. Dark she was, with the velvety darkness of the midsummer night. Her eyes were pools of midnight skies, in which shone no stars. Her hair was mist of tempest, snared in nets of sullen gold. Sullen indeed was that gold, and in all of her something sullen that menaced the more because of its sweetness. There is a woman. The bold eyes turned to the Assyrian. She'll have what she wants, my bet on it. There came a voice from beside her, wistful, dreamy, worshipping. Ah, yes, but the new priestess, she is no woman. She is Ishtar. Kenton craned his neck, looking for the speaker. He saw a youth, hardly more than nineteen, saffron-robed and slight. His eyes and face were those of a beautiful, dreaming child. He is half mad the dark woman whispered. Ever since the new priestess came, he haunts this place. We are going to have a storm. The sky is like a bowl of brass, muttered the Phrygian. The air is frightened. The Assyrian answered, They say Bel comes to his house in the storms. Perhaps the priestess will not be alone tonight. The woman laughed slyly. Kenton felt swift desire to take her throat in his hands. There came a low clashing of thunder. Perhaps that is he rising, said the woman demurely. There was a little throbbing of the harp strings, a complaining from the tambours. A dancing girl sang softly. Born was Nala for delight, never danced their feet so white. Every heart on which she trod, dying on her heel its god, sweet her kisses day or night, born was Nala for delight. The brooding eyes of the butterfly woman they had named Narada flashed angrily. Be quiet, Wanton, he heard her whisper. There was a ripple of laughter among the girls. The two with the pipes trilled them softly. The drums murmured, but she who had sung sat silent over her harp with downcast eyes. The Phrygian asked, Is this priestess then really so beautiful? The Assyrian said, I do not know. No man has ever seen her unveiled. The youth whispered, When she walks, I tremble. I tremble like the little blue lake of the temple when the breeze walks on it. Only my eyes live and something grips my throat. Peace, a brown-eyed girl with kindly face and babe in arms spoke. Not so loud, or what you will feel at your throat will be an arrow. She is no woman. She is Ishtar, Ishtar, cried the youth. The soldiers nearby turned. Through them strode a grizzled officer, short sword in hand. Before his approach, the others drew back. Only the youth stood motionless. Right and left, the sword carrier peered beneath bushy brows. Ere he could fix gaze on the youth, a man in sailor's cap and tunic of mail had walked between the two, gripped the youth's wrist, held him hidden behind him. Kenton caught a glimpse of agate eyes, black beard. His heart leaped. It was Zubran! Zubran! But would he pass on? Could Kenton make him hear if he called? If his body could not be seen from without, could his voice penetrate the stone? Zubran! The sword-bearer scanned the silent group uncertainly. The Persian saluted him gravely. Silence here! grunted the officer at last and passed back among his men. The Persian grinned, pushed the youth from him, 
stared at the dark woman with eyes bolder than her own. He jostled the friggin' from his place, laid a hand upon the woman's arm. I was listening, he said. Who is this priestess? I am newly come to this land and nothing I know of its ways. Yet by Ormuzd, he swore and thrust his arm around the woman's shoulders. It was worth the journey to meet you. Who is this priestess that you say is so beautiful? She is the keeper of Bell's house. The woman nestled close to him. They say her name is Shireen. But what does she there? asked Zebron. Now if it were you, I could understand without asking. And why does she come here? The priestess lives in Bell's house upon the top of the temple, the Assyrian spoke. She comes here to worship at his altar. When her worship is done, she returns. For beauty, such as you say is here, remarked Zebron, her world seems small indeed. Why, if she is so beautiful, is she content to dwell in so small a world? She is the gods, answered the Assyrian. She is the keeper of his house. If the god entered, he might be hungry. There must be food for him in his house, and a woman to serve it, or he might be. And so there must be a woman there, interrupted the bold-eyed wench, smiling up at him slyly. A fair woman. Therefore, the priest dwells within his house. We have something like that in my country, the Persian drew her closer. But there, the priestesses seldom wait alone. The priests see to that. Ho, ho! God, would the Persian ever come close to the wall, so close that Kenton might call to him? And yet, if he did, would not those others hear him also? And then... Have any of these priestesses who... Wait. Zubran's voice purred. Have any of these waiting priestesses ever, uh, entertained the god? The youth spoke. They say the doves speak to her. The doves of Ishtar. They say she is more beautiful than Ishtar. Who? Asked the Persian. The Lady Shireen sighed the youth. Shireen. The name of his beloved pulsed through Kenton like little leaping flames. Fool, whispered the Assyrian. Fool, be still. Will you bring bad luck on us? No woman can be as beautiful as Ishtar. No woman can be more beautiful than Ishtar, sighed the youth. Therefore, she is Ishtar the Phrygian said. He is mad! But the Persian stretched out his right arm, drew the youth to him. Have any of these priestesses ever beheld the god? He repeated. Wait, murmured the woman. I will ask Naradoc, the archer. He comes sometimes to my house. He knows. He has seen many priestesses. She held the Persian's arm fast about her girdle, leaned forward, Naradoc, come to me. An archer turned, whispered to the men on each side of him, slipped from between them. They closed up behind him, grinning. Naradoc, asked the woman, tell us, have any of the priestesses ever beheld the god? The archer hesitated uneasily. I uh, do not know. Slowly, he answered at last. They tell many tales, yet... Are they but tales? When first I came here, there was a priestess in Bell's house. She was like the crescent moon of our old world. Many men desired her. Ho, oh, archer, rumbled the Persian. But did she hold the god? Naradoc said, I do not know. They said so. They said that she had been withered by his fires. The wife of the charioteer of the priest of Nineb told me that her face was very old when they took away her body. She was a date tree that had withered before it had borne fruit, she said. If I were a priestess and so beautiful, I would not wait for the god. The woman's eyes clung to Zebron. I 
would have a man. Yeah, I would have many men. There was another who followed, said the archer. She said the god had come to her, but she was mad, and being mad, the priest of Nergal took her. Give me men, I say, whispered the woman. Said Naradoc, the archer musing. One there was who threw herself from the temple. One there was who vanished. One there was... The Persian interrupted. It seems that those priestesses who wait for Bell are not fortunate, said the woman with intense conviction. Give me men. There was a nearer clashing of thunder above Kenton in the lurid, ever darkening sky. The clouds began a slow churning. There will be a great storm, muttered the Phrygian. The girl the Lady Narada had rebuked thrummed again her harp strings, sang half maliciously, half defiantly. Every harp that sought a nest flew straight away to Nala's breast. Born was Nala for delight. She checked her song. From afar came the faint sound of chanting, the tread of marching feet. Bowmen and spearsmen raise bows and spears and salute. Behind them, the milling multitudes dropped to their knees. The Persian drew close to the wall, and as his was the only head in the circular window whose pane was stone, Zubran called Kenton softly. The Persian did not stir. Zubran! shouted Kenton. The Persian turned startled face to the wall, then leaned against it, cloak tight around his face. Wolf? There was relief and joy in Zebron's usually weary voice. Are you safe? Where are you? Behind the wall, shouted Kenton. Whisper, I can hear you. I can barely hear you, whispered the Persian. Are you hurt in chains? I am safe, cried Kenton. But Gigi, Sigurd, searching for you, the Persian said. Our hearts have been well nigh broken. Soon we meet. Listen, shouted Kenton. There is a clump of trees close to the stairway above the garrison. We know, answered Zebron. It is from them we make the steps and scale the temple. But you, I will be in the house of Bell, cried Kenton. Soon as the storm breaks, go there. If I'm not there, take Shireen, carry her back to the ship. I will follow. We will not go without you whispered Zebron. Go, quick, do as I say. Find Gigi, Sigurd, shouted Kenton. I cannot go now. Patience, wolf. There is time, answered Zebron. I hear a voice speaking through the stone. It was the Assyrian, kneeling. Zebron dropped from Kenton's sight. The chanting had grown louder. The marching feet were close. Then from some hidden entrance of the temple, there swept out into the open space a company of archers and a company of swordsmen. Behind them paced as many shaven yellow-robed priests, swinging smoking golden censers and chanting as they walked. The soldiers formed a wide arc before the altar. The priests were silent upon a somber cord. They threw themselves flat on the ground. Into the great court strode a single figure, tall as Kenton himself. A robe of shining gold covered him, and a fold of this he held on raised left arm, completely covering his face. The priest of Bell, whispered the kneeling woman. There was a movement among the temple girls. The Lady Narada had half risen. Kenton watched her, forgetting to breathe. Never had there been such yearning, such bittersweet desire, as that in her midnight eyes as the priest of Bell passed her, unheeding. Her long and slender fingers fiercely gripped the cobwebs that meshed her. Their webs were lifted by the swelling breast of her, shuddered with the sighs that shook her. The priest of Bell reached the golden altar. He dropped the arm that held the shrouding fold, and then, prepared though he had been, Kenton's stiff fingers almost loosed the shining lever. He looked he thought, as in a mirror into his own face. End of chapter 26